can't believe that I'm saying this fourth symposium dedicated to Shklovsky and uh, his books, uh, fourth and probably last on Shklovsky, we will we'll need to talk between our sessions about the future of this enterprise, where we want to go with it, if we want to go at all. Uh, some of you have been uh, at this uh, workshops, we may say, several times, some of you here for the first time, and we will sincerely greet our first time comers and hope that you will like what we are doing here. Uh, and thank you for our graduate students for, for and postdoctoral uh, fellows coming to be our audience. I hope that more people will, will get up later and join us uh, as the time passes. Uh, so um, let me just, just say very, very shortly about the format, right? So the format is uh, simple. We are giving one hour per presentation. Uh, and we hope that you won't use this entire hour for your uh, monological speech, that you will leave at least half an hour for the discussion, because, because discussion is what matters here. I want to ask your permission to record these sessions, uh, not for any kind of public distribution, just for the archive, um, through Zoom and through, through this machine that, that, that stands in, in, in front of you. So don't block it. Because, uh, <laughs> so, so move it a little bit so that it won't oh, be blocked. It's my tea. T -t -t is not is not an issue. Uh, <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> no, it, it works from, from the top. Um, so it's called the so, owl. It's so the, the newest addition to the to the technological development of the Harman Institute. Um, and of course, uh, it's all happening thanks to mm -hmm. the efforts of the Harman Institute and uh, its wonderful staff that that provided us with everything. Um, and uh, that's that's basically it, right? Uh, you, you know that that if we leave to to, to the evening. Uh, we'll have the dinner in the restaurant nearby, uh, and uh, I we will be very very strict with schedule because our as you can see our schedule is very tight. Uh, the restaurant will wait, but it won't wait indefinitely. So, and generally speaking, we need we need to 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 move on a good pace. Uh, there will be lunch. Uh, apparently, the lunch will be catered from the Russian restaurant in Queens, Chiburechne. So, so yeah, I, I, I personally personally did a test drive. It's good. Uh, so let's let's look forward to, to presentations and to our discussions. Just a few um, lines. Um, uh, when Mark and I uh, were trying to figure out like what to do, how to do this this session. Um, when was it? Like so, it was last spring, I think it was, or maybe early summer. So we thought like, well, we need kind of to uh, bring in um, a bit of a kind of fresh blood, sort of younger blood, sort of kind of <laughs> young ideas and uh, people uh, whom we don't know as well in this context. So we created this list. Um, it was fifteen people together. And then, um, well, like three weeks ago, we started doing the schedule, and we realized that like that's too many. Actually, <laughs> we just can't fit like all. Like, given the schedule that we have, like, sort of one hour per, per person, we just can't schedule um, everybody. So we decided to drop ourselves. So sort of, like, let's to, consider it as self sacrifice. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So like we can, yeah, sort of, we are victimizing ourselves. Um, <clears throat> but um, as as before, I think uh, I, I just want to emphasize it once again. But the main idea is not kind of sort of to tell us once again that Shklovsky is dead and sort of well, let's move on. So we, we know this line, right? So <laughs> rather the point is like, can we make it useful? So is there something that is still relevant? It could be made relevant. Is there anything that can, can be put in productive dialogue with contemporary sort of theoretical, conceptual, historical, sociolo sociological, or aesthetic um, uh, concerns or um, debates going on in our field? So that's the main kind of reason I think we're doing it. And um, again, like we were going back and forth like which book to pick, as always, right? And so uh, ended up uh, doing Chichiva. Partly we thought that we haven't really had anything on street level literary theory. And we thought it would be interesting, so we just came to come back 
to um, your hearing just to see that things won't, it won't make sense. Well, um, um, yeah, and partly it's like one of his like latest works uh, where he basically puts himself in the right conversation with all the scholars that he has benefited from and uh, influenced. So yeah, I guess that's it. So let's start. And our first speaker is Julia Weinburg, University of Illinois at Chicago. And uh, shall I read the, 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 the title? Sure. So, I don't know. Uh, it's uh, long. The title <laughs> is <laughs> Granny's Talk, Old Age Styles, Klovsky's Retrofuturism, and the Contemporaneity of the Absolute. It's one. Um, well, I want to thank, first of all, our organizers for organizing this fabulous workshop and for inviting me to it. You're up to here. <laughs> I love being here and I love You've this You've been work. organizing one of the workshops also. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, okay. You go. Okay. And so I'm going to start with uh, with the frivolous and hopefully we'll end with some with the poignant. So. Um, okay. У меня была бабушка, она носила маленькую бархатную шапочку. Я была изгнана, мне было тогда семь лет, что такие шапочки характеризуют структуру бабушек. Позднее я узнал, что бабушка носила шапочку своей молодости. Такие шапочки тогда назывались тока. Каждый человек задерживается в своем развитии на каком-то этапе, перестает следовать общему течению времени. Может быть, мое отношение к новым течениям литературы подобно отношению Венгерова ко мне или отношению моей бабушки к фасонам шляп. Ношу шляпу и маховую шапку, но мои молодые товарищи ходят без, без, ходят без шапок. Но я рассматриваю себя не только как дедушку, но и как существо, которое мыслит не столько о своем возрасте, сколько о своем времени. I find many things curious in this quote, not least um, is the type of cat, the tooth that we're dealing with here. But I would like to start with the very last assertion that Flosky is pondering his time. Which time in this scenario, properly speaking, is his? The now time of writing or the time of his youth? Perhaps I'm so intrigued by this quote because I also had a grandmother. And my grandmother was a handmaker. She just died two years ago. She lived a long and full life. Just like most new trends and advances, the saddest of which she found to be the virtual obsolescence of cats. Reflecting upon the old age in uh, Titivash, Klosky takes upon himself a task to cast doubt on the whole idea of obsolescence, to ponder the usefulness and contemporaneity of the old for the work of the future. And I'll show you just briefly the whole history of two cats, how they see. It's basically a cat with a narrow brim, a no brim, its popularity sort of left and wings through the ages. It, keeps coming back. Um, but anyway, so um, yes, so Shklovsky takes upon himself a task to cast doubt on the whole idea of obsolescence, to ponder the usefulness and contemporaneity of the old for the work of the future. And that is why the quote above is purposefully ambiguous about the exact period that my time encompasses. In this book, Shklovsky makes a case for thinking that both temporalities, the time of his youth filled with cats, and the time of his old age, cat bless, are both his, and he existing in both of them brings them together. Through him, they co they cohabitate, живут рядом is a common word in, in this book, and influence one another. Shklovsky here self-reflects on his dogged devotion to outdated fashions and literary theories of his youth, making a claim that such devotion is not only unavoidable, Каждый человек задерживается в своем развитии на каком-то этапе, but also valuable. In his introduction to Edward Said's unfinished, posthumously published book on late style music and literature against the grain, Michael Wood encapsulates the gist of Said's argument with the following pricing. Stopping is not ending. There are many instances in Shklovsky's book where he picks up on the moments of halting and stopping of phenomena that remained in the past, unwritten, left out, left behind, and he continues their virtual trajectory into the future of his now. Kanchaitsa Starost, Shklovsky writes as early as the second page. Starost prashla, he repeats at midpoint in the book. And as if in agreement with Wood and Said, Shklovsky concludes, Kansani Budu. 
I think of this presentation, my presentation, as a continuation of the previous talk I gave on Shklovsky here at Columbia on his book, Zhili Bribe. I suggested then that Shklovsky had developed a theory of error. I argued that Shklovsky's understanding of history is idiosyncratic, departs drastically from the politically correct doctrine of causal determinism. That error for him is a chance event which becomes lawful and necessary in hindsight. Recollection doesn't correct these errors, rather it assimilates them into a new narrative, a historical unfolding of artistic truth. Errors, therefore, are always anachronistic. They're moments of the future, breaking through the texture of the present because only the future will show their necessity. In Titivash, Klovsky is still interested in anachronisms, but now they are ghosts of the past rather than time travelers from the future. Shklovsky zooms in here on a different type of contingency. Mm -hmm. If errors examined in Gili Bili a chance events that took place, that occurred, Tsitsivao bounds in a different type of chance occurrence, the one that failed to happen. As I will demonstrate, Shklovsky argues that the old is worthwhile to consider precisely because it contains within itself sprouts of events that occurred, as well as traces of that which failed to materialize. And that which has failed to occur might, might just contain within itself seeds of unexplored future possibilities, again, due to the principle of randomness. So let's at first state the axiomatic. In this book, Old Shklovsky doesn't tire repeating that the old is not to be dismissed, that the old only appears obsolete, while in fact it is contemporaneous. According to Agamben, contemporaneous is that which belongs to the age, to the time, through disjunction. Accepting this definition, we can argue that the old in Shklovsky's book is contemporaneous. Um, in Zastavka, Shklovsky rehabilitates the most obsolete cliche of poetry. By the way, I didn't do this, you know, I did all, all of the stuff uh, that you can see, the, these, the fancy PowerPoints, it, they were suggested by the by the PowerPoint itself, and I just went with it because I'm old. To make, okay. it, contemporary. Huh? To make it contemporary. To make it contemporary, that is right. <laughs> so in Zestav, Kashklovsky rehabilitates the most obsolete cliche of poetry, Nightingales. Im se ravno, što ani estropan v stihach, ani ne znaju, što ani opravrgnuti, celavi ishe v puti. Great pigeons are just a metaphor. <laughs> Shklovsky is less interested in birds and more and worn out titans. Zitana is nasilis. In friends who pass, prashla molodis prashli druzia. Shklovsky consistently applies the idea of being worn out prey, like the old cat, as a metaphor for both becoming passe and passing away. Eichenbaum had a friend who bula prasholi should false, natural besides sketchy. Eichenbaum tried to defend the genre, help the friend, but his lecture falls on deaf ears and he dies, he was here to believe Shklovsky extends this metaphor of his sharpness to the whole generation, to his cohort. And yet what Shklovsky is interested in here is precisely the remainder and its role. Right, he's there, he gives us this, right? And minavite is a curious word, right? Because according to one of the dictionaries, I found minavite is both praiti akonchitsa, but also praiti prayechitsa, right? Move on, right? So, um, so in a way, it could both mean being left behind in the past and being moved into the future, getting ahead. And this only seems like a paradox, right? In order to explain this paradox, let us look at various different functions that Shklovsky finds for the old. Okay. According to Shklovsky, the old is instrumental. From the arsenal of the old, a human being selects tools of expression and cognition. The old is also used as a stupeny. What's important here is the inflection. The old is being used not as something to push away, but rather as something against which one uses to take off, against one, one takes off, right? Like a springboard. 
Here, the old is a peculiar foothold that offers support and pushes forward. The idea of the old as a fulcrum is also supported by Shklovsky's retelling of Alesha's story about the beetle who fell in love with a caterpillar. And when it turned into a butterfly, he was distraught, wanted to kill it, then recognized the butterfly had the same eyes, the old eyes. Glaza Stalis writes Shklovsky. The eyes connoting as they do the eternal essence remain unchanged. The old is that cohesive stabilizing element which literally in the story saves the butterfly from destruction. The physical incorporation of the old and the new in the story of the butterfly and the beetle also explains another metaphor Shklovsky uses to explain the vital importance of the old. Настоящее преодолевает прошлое, съедает прошлое как хлеб. Достоевский считал себя новым реалистом, уничтожавшим старое представление, но в то же время им питающимся. Поэтика Аристотеля не умерла, а осталась хлебом. The old functions as a source of nourishment, which gets metabolized into energy. This transformation brings us to the last two functions of the old. The old can serve as a kind of optical device, a color filter that enhances vision, defamiliarizes perception. Right, старая бросает на новое цветную часто ироническую цветень. And finally, the function that is particularly important to me here is the the, the old acts as an echo. Shklovsky poetically states about himself: "Иду как живой человек и как эхо прошлого." Speaking about the past, Shklovsky says: "Вчерашний день существует, звучит, но это эхо должно быть учтено при записи нового звука." So. What makes this echo so important when one attempts to record new sounds? Because an echo of the past is like an echo in a well, right? It's like an echo on a mountain slope. By, one, by, by this echo, one can assess distance ahead. Echo предсказывает нам строение дна, которое мы не можем достичь, и те годы, которые находятся перед нами. So why, why would one need to turn to the past to assess what one should do in the future? Shouldn't the present suffice for that? And here where contingency as a historical principle comes in. I believe Shklovsky intends to argue that failures of the past might in fact be viable alternatives, successes for the future, precisely because the historical course is not determined. And in the greatest possible maneuver to make the statement, although obliquely and indirectly, Shklovsky summons the highest authority, Vladimir Ilyich Lenin. <laughs> Shklovsky does it through the most acrobatic feat of understatement. Speaking of Eichenbaum's article without naming it, we'll name it here, of Zgliadov Lenin on the historical meaning of Tolstoy, Shklovsky writes, Professor объяснил, Professor meaning Eichenbaum, объяснил значение выражения Tolstoy. Учение Tolstoy, безусловно, утопично и по своему содержанию реакционно, самом точном и глубоком значении этого слова. Instead of providing the expectant reader with Eichenbaum's eye-opening interpretation, Shklovsky pivots. He tells us instead about Eichenbaum's discovery that Lenin uses the exact same words to describe theories of Proudhon and Sismondi, and then Shklovsky jump cuts to something Lenin said about Proudhon. But if we go to the source, to the source, however, we discover that according to Eichenbaum, Lenin had much interest in Tolstoy's combination of utopianism, orientation towards the future, and reaction orientation towards the past. Eichenbaum explains that in Lenin's quote, utopian doesn't mean impractical or idealistic, but rather refers to the alternative strand of socialism. Речь идет об утопическом социализме, о том, что учение Толстого представляет собой разновидность этого движения общественной мысли. Eichenbaum also comments on Lenin's use of the word reactionary. В самом точном, то есть филологическом словарном значении латинская приставка «ре» означает опять обратно назад, и реакция в этом смысле – ход или движение назад, но вовсе не в качестве непременного противодействия движению вперед. So, as I understand it, Eichenbaum believes Lenin to be saying that there are theories which organically belong to the past, but can, they can nevertheless facilitate rather than impede movement to the future. And here Eichenbaum quotes Lenin. Но отсюда вовсе не следует ни того, чтобы это учение не было социалистическим, ни того, чтобы в нем не было критических элементов, способных доставлять ценный материал для просвещения передовых классов. Lenin then perceived also, like Shklovsky, that a flawed failed socialist idea can continue to provide, доставлять, не доставить, valuable material for a successful victorious brand of socialism. 
right? Шкловский himself would aphoristically put it this way. Побежденные иногда помогают победителям. And then almost like echoing Eichenbaum's thoughts on Lenin, Lenin's understanding of Tolstoy, Shklovsky writes about Tiniana that he увлекался Державином, Пепельбекером, понимал значение в искусстве отвергнутого и как будто неосуществленного. Now you will say that Tolstoy is not Pepelbecker, but, but here they are phenomena of the same order. Those who were left behind and whose visions and ideas, at least to an extent, did not fully materialize. And as I already stated earlier, this book abounds, abounds in various aesthetic phenomena that for a variety of reasons remained unfinished and persisted in their unfinishedness. Let's begin with Stinyanov, who passed away. And this English expression, by the way, passed away, translates Shklovsky's idiosyncratic prashol very well. So Tinyanov, who passed away very early at the age of 49, and whose work, Astalis Nizavirshonny, Tema Beskanechna Trudna, A Zhizn Kanchalis, and his friend and misfortune to Hilbecker, who passed by differently. The body of text under the name Kuhilbecker is akin to Eugene Onegin, which, according to Шклопский, река, берега которой описаны, но она не исследована до конца. Герои его места в мире не поняты. As well as with a human being in Updike's novel, человек в этом американском романе остается непознанным, как бы не уместившимся в странице. In addition to this premature death, premature oblivion, misrecognition, or reduction of complexity, there are also instances of accidentally unrecorded phenomena. For example, the fairy tale about the beetle and the butterfly. Юрий Алеша рассказывал незаписанную сказку, я сейчас запишу, чтобы не пропало. Шкловский recalls and records and repeats this allegory of disappearance and reappearance in a new guise, the trans through the, his own recording, right? The transformation of the oral tale into the written one mimicries the caterpillar's metamorphosis. Yet another type of incompleteness examined in Titiva is the one where the writer purposefully excludes, chooses not to say something. For example, Shklovsky discusses Verisayev's notes to self, which were published posthumously, and which intrigued Jakobsen precisely as Shklovsky said, because unmeant to be published, they were like testimony of an impartial witness. The theme of the chapter on Verisayev, Jakobsen, and Pushkin is the afterlife of excerpts that were excised from final drafts but refused to disappear. Shklovsky sounds a note of disapproval about publishing Verisayev's notes to self without the author's permission because they were unfinished mm -hmm. and contained in Shklovsky's opinion some hasty conclusions and inaccuracies. But what is furious, the publishers of Verisayev's unfinished text did to him a similar disservice that according to Shklovsky, Verisayev in his notes to self had done to Pushkin. Verisayev не указав на сокращение начала, привел кусок, не попавший в печатный текст графа Нулина. Вересаев сильно подрезал цитату из Пушкина и тем самым, <coughs> excuse me, изменил ее смысл. Вересаев then recovers the discarded text, but does it selectively, right? Omitting those elements which he has no use of. Shklovsky recovers the whole quotation, including the parts omitted by Verisayev, to demonstrate that the meaning of the quote in its entirety was different from the one that Verisayev gave it. And then he clarifies why Pushkin had chosen to excise it in the first place. So without going into the details of what was excluded, then included, which in itself contained the materials previously excluded, but which was included and completely misinterpreted, <laughs> reinterpreted, we are to understand that discarded alternatives not only refuse to disappear, but that they continue to exert influence. Shklovsky himself, while admitting that some things be are better left than said, in fact, says them, almost as a form of paralipsis, right? When you say something, but actually like pretending that you don't say it, right? I'm not going to tell you that I told you so, right? That, so it, almost as a form of paralysis, Shklovsky tells us that Pushkin agreed with more who destroyed Byron's notebooks, or when he retrieves the line which Mayakovsky deletes from his poem to seeing and because it would be tack tackless. In other instances, whatever was left unsaid was not only telling, but in fact is essential. In Shklovsky's interpretation of Pushkin, for example, it is more often that not what Pushkin doesn't say that is most important. 
arguing with Jakobsen's treatment of Pushkin's Yavas Lubil as the poem that plays just with, that just plays with grammar, Shklovsky proposes his own interpretation of the poem, and he reads it as an example of as an example of litot, litota, right? Litot, he says, is an erachite smekchenia vrajenia. If you stand to the mirzai, to be nipugat sasieda, to aziable, to eto litota. Quoting the ancient Greek, I don't know, Demer Demetrius, who is that? Theoretician of rhetoric? I don't know. But anyway, quoting Demetrius, Shklovsky says, nidaskazene proizvodet bolye silne fishetlenia. And Shklovsky himself, of course, uses litotes all the time in complete expressions for a variety of aesthetic, political, and ethical reasons. And sometimes it is that which is most important that remains unsaid, as, for example, in the discussion um, of Eichenbaum's treatment of Lenin's attitude towards Tolstoy. But other times, it is that which remains unsaid that is truest to life, right? Like extra literary reality. Speaking about zoo letters, not about love, admitting that they were indeed about love, Shklovsky writes, um, perhaps this episode remained unmentioned because, as Demetrius said, Lily Tote, the understatement acts upon us through the very power of suggestion. But ultimately, Titiva demonstrates that all artworks are by necessity incomplete because themes are unending. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Um, uh, conflicts do not disappear. Life, right? <laughs> and, and ultimately, life is continuous. Right? He says in War and Peace, which is one of the longest novels in, in uh, history. So basically, the reason why, right, things do not, you know, have so much that is um, so much that is unfinished in them is because uh, because of what Kuzma Prokop would say, right? But this impossibility to fix it, to encompass anything in total, affords salutary contingency, or what Agamben, and yes, let, let's return to him for a moment, what Agamben calls impotentiality, right? In what we can not do, Agamben sheds new light, on Aristotelian concept of impotentiality. Impotentiality doesn't mean here only absence of potentiality, not being able to do, but also and above all, being able to not do, being able to not exercise one's own potentiality. And then Agamben argues that paradoxically, we live in an age where everyone believes they can do and be anything, exhibiting very little reticence or awareness of what they can do and what they can not do. And people, he says, have been extranged, he laments, they have been exchanged from their impotentiality because for him, impotentiality is a kind of mode of resistance from the relentless pursuit of action and progress that holds so many hostage, right? It is, it is resistance to the tyranny of the historical time. So when Shklovsky registers his inability to follow fashions in his old age, he cannot not wear hats. This becomes a form of impotentiality. He cannot not wear hats, he cannot follow fashion, he can cast a colorful, ironic shade on the new, entering with it in energizing conflict. In its force of negation, Agamben's impotentiality affines with Said's understanding of late style. In late style, Said argues that late in life, great artists develop something like impotentiality, although he doesn't use this word, I'm connecting to a rebellion against the tyranny of modernization, its subordination of everything to the principle of productivity, efficiency, and progress. It is a characteristic, a trait of modernism to question modernity, and therefore the rehabilitation of old age, which both Said and Shklovsky undertake, is characteristic of modernism. Before modernism, old age was always considered the reduction of creative powers, senility. Goethe's treatment of old age's resignation, acceptance of demise, is counteracted by Theodore Adorno's and Georg Simmel, who recognize fragmentation and disjunction, characteristic of modernist form in late art, art done late in life. For Simmel, the recognition of one's imminent demise results in profound artistic statements as one is liberated from everything extraneous and non-essential. So what Said does is he come in his discussion of late style, he combines Simmel's idea of old age as withdrawal from appearance 
from the world and Adorno's idea that Beethoven's late music powerfully reflects and exposes senescence, uh, which hides behind modernity's claim to novelty and improvement. Discussing Adorno's approach to late Beethoven, Said is this here? Yeah, Said writes, Beethoven's late works remain unreconciled, uncoopted by a higher synthesis. They do not fit any scheme and they cannot be reconciled or resolved since their irresolution and unsynthesized, unsynthesized fragmentariness are constitutive, neither ornamental nor symbolic of something else. Beethoven's late compositions are in fact about lost totality and are therefore catastrophic. Whether Shklovsky refuses to follow sartorial fashions or writes litotes or practices rhetorical understatements or examines worn out literary titans and what they can and couldn't do, he attunes himself to impotentiality, also as a form of resistance against false totality, which is totality for him devoid of conflict. However, in contrast to Said and perhaps Adorno, he doesn't wish to give up on the idea of totality altogether. He just decides to redefine totality. He formulates it in juxtaposition to Aristotle's idea of totality. To Aristotle's idea of totality. Shklovsky tells us that Aristotle's idea of wholeness presupposes separateness and finishedness. Shklovsky quotes this idea to disagree with it. Instead, Shklovsky proposes that totality is an, an infinitely continuous system that includes within itself a multitude of other subsystems that are in constant relation with each other. No fabula ni jedinstvena cela i vnutri samo raspadaetsa na svoji celosnosti, katori mogu biti ne toliko raspoloženi v nove baštoje cela, no i mogu biti vidjeleni i sravnjivi sami po sebi. Right, so what, it what we see here is that Shklovsky's totality is not fixed, that it is in perpetual flux, right? It is always a part of some larger whole, and therefore it is both complete and not. And then he expands this idea of totality to think of it not only synchronically, but diachronically, right? Totality is in perpetual state of becoming, it unfolds in time, it is composed of elements that <clears throat> undergo change and development, right? Totality includes the succession of elements, that occur as well as those that exist only in their potentiality. Человека можно изрубить. Человека можно изрубить, но он встает для нового сопротивления. Он встает или встает его сын или его соседи или соседи его народа. Right, and here the law of necessity is understood differently from determinism. Rather, it follows the law of impotentiality. It is precisely because the whole is a discontinuous continuity, because its irresolution is constitutive, and contingency is its principle, unviable alternatives only appear as such, but in, in fact, they might become viable later. So for example, Shklovsky gives an example of Pushkin rewriting of Shakespeare's not very successful play in Pushkin's uh, assessment, right? And considering Shakespeare's lesser masterpiece, Pushkin imagines an alternative. And it is not so much a parody, but rather kind of out exploration of an alternative history that failed to take place, right? So Pushkin de facto supplements or completes provisionally, of course, since nothing ever ends, uh, Shakespeare. And together they co compose one diachronic totality. And here is Pushkin said himself, how he right? Which more that that ladil by what the team choice the answers the don't finish don't those the people who have been said yes also there is this kind of alternative history that takes place. Um, so to conclude, totality then for Shklovsky exists only in time unfolding through continuous replenishment and resuscitation. It encompasses the past with all of its unfulfilled promises, and art exists to recover this potential, right? Reminding us of the most famous line in his artist technique, Shklovsky declares here, Stare Astayotsa Patamushta Kamin Golgavichan. Shklovsky defends this provisional and ever protean totality and his own impotential existence in it, because to quote Lenin, it is both utopian and reactionary in the deepest sense.
<laughs> All right, uh, Sana. Спасибо, спасибо, Юля. Мне очень понравилось мысль в середине и начало и конец о том, какие книги. Там есть Аристотель, который деконструирован. Какие книги пишут старые люди? Они синильные или или они еще или они пытаются кому-то доказать, что это все еще не не старость? Но для меня интересно, что именно вот в этой книге, используя старые, старую статью Шкловского про Октябрь Эйзенштейна, изобретение как ошибки, ошибки как изобретение, он берет изобретения молодых и раскрывает все их ошибки. То есть он полностью переворачивает, переворачивает теорию, потому что в 1965 году Тодор создает тексты формалистов, и тут же выходит в 66-м книге по нарации, не книги, сначала статьи Бримона и Барта в коммуникации, потом а, а, появляется уже Женет, как, а, и он должен реагировать на вот эти новые изобретения, как, а, и, конечно, статья Якобсона в 60-м году, на которую он эти новые изобретения структуралистские представляет как ошибки, возвращаясь к тому, что, что они когда-то вот начинали, и поэтому он переписывает не только структуралистов и не только Якобсона со своим количественным анализом, но он переписывает и всех, всех, пропа, который вышел в 70-м тоже на французском, Бахтина, который набирает, и он должен, он переписывает Эхенбаума, Вместо него пишет Толстого, он переписывает эволюцию Тыняна, он переписывает всех, и молодых, и старых. И это, конечно, довольно... довольно и себя самого. Ну и себя, конечно, самого, но вот переписывая теорию прозы, прозы 29 -го года полностью в какую-то новую струю. И это, конечно, определяет эту книгу в очень странном контексте. В очень странном контексте. И я не знаю, насколько это действительно импотенциалити, как альтернативная история, или уже синилити. Шкловский недобр по отношению ко всем. Вот это самое интересное в этой книге. И вот его постоянные неназванные неназванные вещи и, не наз... и отсутствие отсутствие примечаний, которые все написаны редактором и написаны плохо, потому что там не указывается. Ну, да, ну, масса, масса. Рачили... То есть там масса как бы, таких вот вещей. Но Шкловский, вот, и вот в этом он единственно возвращается к молодому Шкловскому, который писал при этих фабрике. Человек без примечаний. Кажется, Шпет, кажется, к Байрону э, сделал примечание на крокодила, назвав этого крокодила по латыни. И, в принципе, он этим, напоминая нам свою старую цитату, уничтожает все примечания в этой книге. Это скорее комментарий, чем... Yes, I, 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 see what you, I see what you're saying, right? But let, we'll look at, but I'm trying to see it from his perspective, right? And from his perspective, the rewriting is something that actually gives, gives it new life, right? So, and except, and the only new thing that I perceive, right, is that in, in, art, in artist technique, right, the idea was that when you rewrite the, the old but here it's transformed it's actually the old defamiliarizes the new and because he's doing it he's talking about it of course from his point of view right and he's inscribing himself but this old as as having some kind of rebellious attitude towards the new and all and therefore defamiliarizes it in some way to me is an interesting scenario. And rewriting of everything is, is for him precisely what um, gives it life. And errors are there, right, to be, errors are there because that's the, if something is completed, it's dead. 
right? So if you want something to continue and be alive, then it has to be erroneous. <laughs> Но где-то он уничтожает иронию в середине, если я найду эту цитату как-нибудь. Нет, не найду сразу, но он где-то такое, он вдруг уничтожает иронию и уничтожает старого Шкловского вместе с иронией и ироничной жизнью. Да, он доигрывает себя. И когда я продолжаю, что Оксана сказала, So I, I like very much this uh, this idea of uh, error as potentiality, and especially what you said just right now about estrangement through, through the old rather than through the new. Um, but, but how does it correlate with this general theme of this book um, about the uh, coexistence of, of opposite themes, of opposite uh, motifs, or of necessary uh, counterpoint, uh, conflict, whatever? Yeah. So, 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 so does it mean that, that this, this sort of The игривание of the mistakes of the past is the necessary counterpoint to the present. That, that's one question. Another question to, to continue, I'm, I'm just, just continuing what, what Alexander said. So, so okay, he he he's uh, if if this makes sense. So he's he's correlating his his um, past uh, statements of that were declared to be mistakes, uh, right, uh, with with the present. But this is not present. Right, except for Jacobson, basically, and ex except for Abdike, because uh, <laughs> Prop is not and, present. And, Prop and, is 1927. Yeah, Bakhtin. Bakhtin. Uh, Bakhtin. 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 Yeah, Bakhtin is 1963, of course. Um, but that, that, and the chapter of, uh, about Minipay is 1963. But he means entire Bakhtin, and he cannot not know that, that Bakhtin was writing his stuff way before it was published, right? Um, so what is he counterpointing against that, 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 that that's the question no that is a good question but i think for him he says precisely he's not interested in new hats the fact or like the fact right, the lack of them the lack of them right the fact he's not interested in the lack of them so the counterpoint is his dogged hat wearing but right so he's going to that and that's his wearing of his hat sheds some kind of a colorful shadow on the on everybody else who had who doesn't wear hats right mm -hmm. so yes i agree he's not really interested but that's what he says i'm not really interested mm -hmm. in new literary theories see i'm an old i'm an old person but what he wants to say is my disinterest in new literary theories should be taken very seriously because my disinterest actually might be saying that my staying apart is not, it also belongs to the age, mm -hmm. right? Like I claim right for myself to exist as an old, as the old thing. And you should be trying to figure out how me trying to keep on to my old traditions or my old interests could is something that you could still use you know as 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 a moment of defamiliarization mm -hmm. right he basically says this is good i exist there to defamiliarize um mm -hmm. yeah to defamiliarize whatever you are doing that is new and that's and that's my function yeah yeah i, I just mm -hmm. wanted a question i mean about the disinterestedness of closely towards the new literary theory so what about the fact that he constantly uses terms that were fashionable right at that point for instance Madia Mira. Or like structure, like structuralism, and then he um basically I don't know whether to what extent he makes I mean because of course like Majed needed like or like signal right like a kind of a, a kind of a word that like it gets repeated a lot which of course is what what probably you know, like he like he just found it in in uh, he, like he was full of this of the publication there was I mean not not just in, in the Soviet Union but also but also in the West of like this budding semiotics that was taking place and where everything was signed signal. Uh, so I don't know, like, does he mock them? Or... No, that's a great question. I don't think he mocks them necessarily, although he ironizes with right. them, right? So I, th but I think that's precisely if he didn't use those words, that would show that he's not contemporaneous. That would show that he is like how, you know, Said in some ways is showing like it's completely apart, but he wants to be part of totality. He says, I am as the old is part of this of 
you know, старая умирает не сразу, whatever, мертвые умирают не сразу, right? Like I am, I'm still there and perhaps, you know, and I'm still, I'm speaking your language so you can see that I'm contemporaneous, right? But I don't accept your language. So why won't you try to figure out why I don't accept it? Maybe you will, maybe it will defamiliarize something for you in, yeah. Okay, uh, Ilya wanted to say something, right? And and then 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 Kirill. No, no, Kirill. Yeah. Yes. So just uh, building on on something that's been said already by Oksana, uh, is that he does actually he does actually quote Lotman, and he says I'm reading Lotman and I'm thinking all of those things that you said, but we cannot actually say that it's it's not there in the book because it's there, right? Mm -hmm. So and what 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 he says there is that. Oh yes, and I'm thinking we've we've already said all of that and even better. So there is this whole logic that you described there, right? But he's he's definitely engaging with 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 this um, the the new generation, right? Not ignoring them. But my original question was went in sort of in a different direction, and I'm of course thinking about about Benjamin, who is of course an important point uh, starting point for Agamben. Um, and the, the whole kind of idea of memory in the uh, uh, on on the concept of history, which seems uh, uh, resonant with a lot of kind of logics that you delineated. Uh, so my question about the way we reach Klotsky would be: How does the revolution come in, right? Because one of the ways in which we can read this book is that okay, so this is literary theory that that is done in particular ways. Um, uh, uh, in particular logics as opposed to different logic, right? But what I also see in, in what you said is that there is there is actually a question of actual political action, right? And not just individual, but collective. So the, the era of the revolution, and that is something that he represents, right? When we talk about, okay, so he's this old guy, how do I not stay old, right? This is the Eichenbaum question. But his huge legacy that he has is that he took part in it. He is, he comes from the age of the revolution. So he, an old person representing the revolution, which is the foundational paradox here. You people are old. I was in the revolution. That was the 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 the, the youth. So, and then we have the ending, which is Verniti uh, Vigru, which is about the way I understood it was about, okay, let's let's actually get back to collective political agency. Let's back get back to history happening, right? So uh, the question, my question would be, how do we kind of open this literary theory and the individual Shkolsky trying, the individual subject trying to fashion his own place into this questioning of how history works and okay, what's what's next? Yeah. Yeah, I, I agree. Uh, yeah, I agree with that. But right, but but you can think of a revolutionary action in a variety of ways. And you know, Benjamin has the idea of weak messianic power mm -hmm. that has to do precisely with a kind of turning back and and keeping faithful to whatever unrealized, unfulfilled promises of the past are there, right? Like trying to see what what is there behind in the ruins of history and attempt to and attempt to recover it. And I think that that's in a way with this kind of look backward that, that Shklovsky is doing here, he's basically trying to say the same thing, yeah? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and for me, it's interesting to, to ju jump in, sorry. I, I yeah. yeah, 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 absolutely. Yeah. Um, нет, потому что вопрос о революции и где, где революции, где я и где все остальные связан, мне кажется, вот в этой книге с тем, что он себя заново определяет. Он пишет, я не теоретик, я писатель. И вопрос-то, наверное, в том, мы его обсуждаем как теоретика и будем обсуждать тут два дня как теоретика, но он позиционирует себя как писатель. И вопрос в том, кто понимает лучше развитие истории теоретик или писатель, для него решен в этом случае, мне кажется, однозначно, как писатель, который гораздо более подвижен и динамичен в своих возможностях понимать ошибки как изобретения, и изобретения как ошибки, играя с парадоксами. Uh, I, I will give the floor to Ilya. And, 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 and... Uh, for me, the self-definition uh, of the writer uh, is um, partially uh, not uh, uh, should be understood not very directly. Uh, no cover 
because uh, first of all, Polsky uh, from the thirties and uh, was considered in the Soviet Union as a writer. And second, uh, to call himself a writer was a way uh, to uh, avoid uh, the necessity to um, be um, uh, to be faithful to Marxist, uh, Leninist, uh, theolo uh, theological school. Yeah. And in this book, I now I continue. I think that uh, the, the uh, writer uh, can give metaphors, describe historical process uh, in some um, not uh, not such ideological way as uh, theoreticians in the Soviet Union should. Uh, do. And I think that in this book, Slotsky uh, suspends himself uh, somewhere between predictability of history and non predictability. And I think that uh, you described this uh, in your present uh, very interesting, very uh, uh, keen presentation uh, uh, how Slotsky works with ideas of unpredictability. But on the other hand, Slotsky endlessly invents and returns to the uh, uh, description uh, the uh, rules of uh, novelty, rules of uh, art history, rules of cultural history, and he, susp he suspended somewhere between the predictability and unpredictability. And I think that the position of writer in the Soviet Union was much more convenient for this suspension. Yeah. Okay, uh, a second, let's give this word to, to you and we have a few more questions. Yeah. Yes, so um, back to the, to, um, to the conversation about whether he's a writer, I was actually thinking, when I was thinking about him talking about like at the blue court is that boys it, and uh, you know, I am, I'm a writer. To me, it actually somehow, it connected it to Benjamin's idea of storyteller and mm -hmm. taking time. Right. And like when you are writing something, you can take time and create this kind of the forma. And that again allows certain certain you, you um stop this kind of progression of the historical time that with which everyone is moving and kind of see what has been missed along the way. Right. So this kind of that allow that. So what you were saying that if theory is somehow, perhaps when you are a theoretician, it's somehow set, but when you are a writer, it, you know, it allows you to divert and veer, uh, veer off paths. I mean, I, I agree with that point. Regarding the idea of unpredictability and predictability, yes, perhaps, um, <clears throat> You perhaps you're you're right about the about laws, but to me, what has been interesting is to no, to notice all these moments where he's talking about about chance events that are occurring because he's very committed, very interested in randomness, right? And and it's not just in Tsitsipas; he does the same thing in Jili Bili. Um, and you know the, the way he approaches the, the concept of ashipka is to me also through the point of of, of a chance event, right? Of ashipki will happen, you know, but because we could be, and but ashibuchne because he says because he says ashipki are what in really really he when he talks about ashipki he talks about ashipki as something that that um предвидит будущее. Obviously, when you предвидит будущее, you will make a shipki because you cannot предвидит будущее because it's it's completely new. It hasn't happened yet. So there will need to be there will need to be mistakes made, right? Later on in hindsight, they become they become the the law of necessity. So the way he kind of thinks about history as something that becomes lawful post factum. At least that's how I see it, but but only in retrospect it becomes lawful. But 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 at the moment it is always just chance events, and to me that is very different from how we understand dialectical materialism and 
So it's, I'm sorry. Uh, so it's a памятник научная ошибка with a stress on памятник rather than ошибка. Right? <laughs> on the other hand, we can remember the uh, article of Yuri Galilovich Tsiryan about understanding of ошибка in uh, earlier works. Oh, that was such a Okay, we, we, we had Irina and uh, Sergei. Uh, thank you very much, Yulia, for this uh, fantastic Irina reading. Uh, and really, uh, uh, I, would, uh, I would continue this idea of irony and errands, uh, which sound like uh, alike. So uh, to say that uh, probably would be a nice thing to go back to Cicero and his treatise, uh, Desenectathe, about uh, oldness, about old age, which uh, briefly uh, says that uh, old uh, old age is the age of happiness and completeness. Mm -hmm. And so uh, basically when you read Shklovsky uh, like pretending <coughs> his story about being incomplete, not having enough time, being, uh, what was this word by uh, Agamben, impotentiality, mm -hmm. and I immediately remember his anecdote about himself uh, someone telling him that uh, he is impotent and he says, well, you should ask your wife. <laughs> <laughs> That's a story about himself he was telling uh, quite a number of times. Uh, so, I mean, this irony is also about uh, this incompleteness, uh, which he totally disavows. He is completely happy with his, he, he might be unhappy about being old and frail, but in terms of um, intellectual, emotional, moral, and especially in terms of the completeness of historical experience, he is up. And the interesting thing about errands, uh, which was so stupidly uh, translated as delusion, it's not delusion, it's uh, specifically, um, uh, he's ahead of the history of his time uh, in the sense uh, that he's already thinking, or at least, Imagining probabilistically. It's, right, it's probabilistic. all about probability. I guess it's I all probabilistic in the sense of uh, post semiotic complexity. When uh, this uh, idea of random walk, you don't know where it takes you because you don't know if you say R, whether you will be able to say B or A, and it's just a, cho a, cho a choice of two, but it completely disrupts any totality and any uh, uh, continuity, it becomes totally unpredictable only because it's like, what's the probability of meeting a dinosaur? Yeah. 50%. <laughs> <laughs> right? And so in this sense, his irony is somehow it puts him ahead, not only in front of the semiotic theory of his time, which was all about say, I'm completely agree with it. Yeah, it was totally scientific technological theory, which was supposed to make things predictable right. and uh, repeatable, reproducible, uh, and verifiable. So he goes beyond that because he goes into critical theory, because his theoretical thinking starts with criticism and the literary criticism. And this is his Benjaminian uh, kind of genealogy. But then he goes even further than that, because I really wonder, unfortunately, he never read Adorno. I wonder what he would do with Adorno if he, if he ever read negative dialectics, I'm sure, uh, with Adorno's total absence of any aesthetic artistic intuition. And it would be, it would be fantastic reading, <laughs> but unfortunately he never did it. Uh, so, uh, uh, I mean, all of these uh, wonderful uh, interpretations, they all have a mirror image, and you never know. And yeah. that is his game. Yeah, well, this kind of the, random, it's random this, walk. It's the third way, right? Between yeah. and between whatever is the Cicero's resignation, like kind of happiness of being Total in the old and in the past, yes. and then and this kind of yeah. rage of, um, you, and the kind of Adornian, which he hasn't read, but he, yeah. he understands, he this, understands. You know, yeah, the, yeah, this kind of rage against and rage and rebellion again, and the kind of negative against synthesis, against synthesis, against exactly, synthesis. yes, the power, yeah. precisely, yeah. right? Yeah. So there is so, and so he chooses a kind of third so way I mean, yeah, where I mean, he re reads this totality yeah. as as 
unpredictable and in flux and yeah. filled with conflict. So, I mean, in this sense, connection with uh, Benjamin is precisely this, that he takes a step away from theory, theory, theory. He goes into critique, and then he makes another step, even more radical step towards artistic intuition, which tells him the difference between words like современность и синхронность. Yeah. У меня есть современники, это Козьма Крупков, там и кто-то еще. А почему мой Фрос, мой современники, я не понимаю. Он говорит в 24 году, it's, it's, uh, it's an illusion, uh, uh, a chronological illusion. Мы синхронны, мы не умеем современно. All right, I, I want to give the floor to the last question in this session. We will have more sessions to, to ask questions, right? Uh, and enter into uh, Sergei. Yeah, it, 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 it's not really a question. I'm, I'm still kind of trying to um, um, formulate it. It's more of a comment, but I'm... Uh, you talk a bit more about uh, this search or this fixation on error as the way of uh, critical or epistemological engagement, right? So why the error? Because there is an interesting... <clears throat> um, shift that he is making right from uh who is kept to who is Shiba, right and it's not random for him and but you you you, you kind of you emphasize the fact that the basically what he does is to expose the least opportunity yes of sorts, right yeah and i wonder exactly. if that's on the only thing because i i spent like more time probably thinking about uh, his zastavka which is also kind of an interesting word right than about the rest of the book and has this really interesting line um Svitut, which is scrum so what's the mistake? What's the error? So they, we've been thinking about Varabi all the time. So they're thinking about like the, the cloud or the very scrumly Tsutochki. Right. So see what I'm saying? So like it, the where did the error come from? Right. So you say that it's anachronistic. So it's like from um, from uh, I mean the projected from now on into the past. But I guess my question would be where the desire to make an effort. To discover the error and the, the error come from. Mm -hmm. See my point? Mm -hmm. So why this kind of epistemology of you know not even suspicion here, but sort of I know it's there. Yeah, but from his point of view, <laughs> the desire is clear. The desire is because he is the at this point in time, he potentially could be the that absolute that unseen element, that element that stopped or halted, right? And what he's saying to the people who are reading is that you should pay attention to me because well, but then you're, you're basically making him megalomaniac so that's no i am not saying, very... no <laughs> i'm saying that this is how he develops his theory of of the all this is no i'm saying that this is how he supplements his theory of astranenia right it's for him it is to say yeah, to inscribe himself as the old, to ascribe old theories, to ascribe the old as something that that perhaps contains within itself something that needs to. But but there is, I mean, there is a the, there is a personal the the desire is it is personal. It has to be personal. No, he it, the desire has to be personal because it is. It is if somebody is going to talk about memoir. There is there is the aspect of memoir. He is in fact practicing some kind of old age style here, which is the old age style in which he's located between moments where he is apart and moment where he is right, where he on the contrary apart and satisfied with it, or he is pushing himself and his old theories into the present by saying that there is something in them that you haven't yet mm -hmm. that you haven't that that you haven't yet you, noticed. Uh, that, yeah that you have failed to notice and it and it would be the if there is only one law of necessity which is in any theory there is there is something that has been you know that has been unnoticed and now notice it, right? I'm st <laughs> I'm still here. So I think that's the that that's desire. But I think I do think that there is something very personal about this book. And we were talking like earlier with Bradley at the beginning, there's almost something touching in this book. It there is 
there is this kind of sense of demise that is that is like imminent demise that is coming right there. It's the book about old age. I think the the, the mistake that is the melancholy of this book is the mistake that he's still alive and I don't know if that makes it wrong or not. Like this, this I do think that he feels that as a sort of mistake of nature. Yeah, it's a really melancholy note, and I think that the mistake and the sort of like you know uh, uh, like thing that gets him to go back to this. Mm -hmm. I, I know it's a memoiristic and you know sort of psychoanalytical but, reading, but, but it makes him go back to this because because the, the way he ends, he is a Buddha. Mm -hmm. right? right? It's so like clearly to think at this sense of the mistake that you're talking about is not his mistake. <laughs> no, the, the fact that he's the one who's you know so and there will be several more books after that <laughs> but he rewrites but he rewrites a mistake he says and there was no mistake because any mistake is actually not a mistake you know in in this scenario by by the law of probability there will be mistakes well, I, I think he celebrates the fact that he can speak yeah. for for Himbaum and Dianov and appropriate their position and their work he, he is alive he survived them all he survived everybody. Yeah, I didn't think I that way at all. yeah. okay. So uh, I, I'm sorry I have to enforce uh, the schedule. Thank you so much, Yuri. Uh, Emily, Emily is here. Emily was here. I saw her. Please, we, we are not taking the break yet. The break will be after the second presentation. Of course, you can refresh your coffee or whatever you want to refresh. Uh, but thank you, Yuri. And let's see. Yeah. And we have another presentation about hats. Do they need to stay plugged in? Yeah. Okay. 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 We will bring you water. And the help get my kids like for me on the other day. <laughs> Not this one, I thought like Mark was up here. Like, well, like, kids, right? Yeah, it is. So, so it's, yeah, it's completely yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so that will be, yeah, I think they're going to say, yeah, I'm going to say, 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 I'm going to I I think we should, we should please, please, please get back. Otherwise, we'll be out of schedule and nobody will be happy. Yeah. Okay, so I'll continue with this and you will take the, the, the other set, session. Okay, and uh, Emily van Burskirk and another hat in the title, Grandma's Red Hat. Memoir and theory in Okay, thank you. Yeah, when I saw <laughs> Julia's title, I, I thought, um, you know, that, that's funny. And I. The hat panel. Yeah, the hat panel. <laughs> you rightly named it the, the top. Is that how you pronounce it? Um, so, and our your talk was brilliant. And um, our talks will overlap a little bit, though I do pull the, the hat a little more in the direction of, of memoir. Um, and I have to apologize, my, my presentation is kind of unfinished in the sense of half-baked and in, rather than in a sense of, you know, Kansani <laughs> Budjit, but it's still like, needs a little revision. So I, you know, um, thanks in advance for your, your patience for my unedited prose. Um, but before I started with the presentation, I just wanted to read uh, a little passage from um, Titiva that kind of gives us our raison d'etre as a circle. I kind of like it. He says, 
совсем не надо, чтобы тот человек, который занимается академической работой, был бы академически назван. Но он должен быть там, где работают, потому что работать одному очень трудно. Работа, работа – это тоже столкновение мыслей, систем решений. Работа даже великого человека не монологична, она драматургична и нуждается в споре и согласии с временем и, с, и товарищами. So, you know, how, how good that we're finally back together out of our isolation of the past two and a half years. And I think that these, these kinds of dislocations in time and these feelings of being frozen and needing going to go back to some past, you know, really resonate <laughs> with us now. So, um, Grandma's Red Hat memoir and theory in Shklovsky's to give up. Um, Victor Shklovsky's bowstring aims to lend a thickness to time of the several images or metaphors of the visibility of the past in the present or alternately the diachronicity of everyday life. Perhaps the most striking is the hat or toque of the author's grandmother. Until about age seven, Shklovsky writes, he associated this hat with all grandmothers since he had no basis for comparison. He calls the toque part of the structure of grandmothers. Much later, he realized the hat's true significance. It marked the moment at which the old woman had stopped keeping up with her times. The small velvet hat that covered the crown of her head and was tied with wide, wide ribbons under the chin was fashionable in her youth. Her persistence in wearing it into the 20th century symbolized how, quote, each person gets stuck in his development at some stage, stops following the general current of time, and usually fixes this stoppage in his own dress. In Julie Bouilly, Uh, from 1964, a description of the same hat belongs to a fuller portrait of Shklovsky's maternal grandmother, Anna Sevistianova, among his recollections of childhood. There, Shklovsky stays in the realm of autobiography and on the topic of style. Babushka остановилась на этой шляпке. Дальше она пойти не решилась. Так как я не решаюсь найдеть короткие или узкие брюки. He notably postpones for the future the project of dating the hat. Remember, he says he could look at illustrations in old journals, but he's not going to do that yet. Someday he will. <laughs> and admits the impossibility of discovering the actual age of his grandmother, estimating it to be at the end of the 1830s. The autobiographical style is also sensed in the subsequent re recreation of life in the present tense. Babushka snimayev svoyu shlyapku, plaziot na stol. A narrative act of bringing the past to life that connects plot-wise to the miraculous story of his grandmother's death and resurrection. So as we recall, the doctor takes her for dead, and then she gets up to enter the door for him, and after she's been prepared for burial, and proceeds to live six more years until just six months before the revolution. So that was from our last, you know, <laughs> reading a few years ago. Um, in Tisiva, Shklovsky makes no attempt to date his grandma. She serves rather as an example of a phenomenon explaining his own attitude to contemporary literary trends. Quote, maybe my relationship to new currents of literature is similar to Vyankarov's relationship to me or to my grandmother's to the styles of hats. Writing at age 76 in the spring of 1969, Shklovsky does not much engage contemporary theory or literature, instead turning to the past. One might compare him in a certain way to Mademoiselle O from Speak Memory, who serves as an ironic commentary for Nabokov's own nostalgia One is always at home in one's past, which partly explains those pathetic ladies' posthumous love for remote and, to be perfectly frank, rather appalling country, which they never had really known and in which none of them had really been very content. That's from, you know, speak memory. And yet, Shklovsky argues that the past can contain the future and that he, a relic of this past, can still contain elements of what is to come. So, for example, as we just remembered with, with Julius Tag Shklovsky, describes himself as an echo of the past and then notes that echoes like those sonic devices used to tap the depth, test the depth of water can also tell us of the future. In Titiva, Shklovsky rehearses, revises, and critiques formalist theories, as well as works by Victor Krop and Mikhail Bakhtin, ripping them apart to make something new. He contextualizes his theory of estrangement, surrounding it with the social life, geography, and history of its time. As Shklovsky writes, In 1916, there appeared the theory of astranienia. In it, I tried to generalize a way of renewing the perception and portrayal of phenomena. All of it was tied with the time, with pain and inspiration, with astonishment at the world. Tisiva appears as a work of literary scholarship in which memoir serves to estrange and thereby renew theory. It's also a work of revision and development of Shklovsky's own theories. The rhythm of Shklovsky's Tisiva is choppy, as the author pulls from a staggering number of works from Russian and European, but not only 
um, literature, art, and philosophy across the centuries, sometimes briefly, sometimes at greater length. Tolstoy, I think, you know, I didn't really do a mathematical analysis, but seems to, you know, occupy the most space um, to illustrate and support his theories. Sometimes he's careless, uh, as when he misremembers the ending of Tolstoy's childhood, placing a fly on the corpse of the narrator's mother, where there is none. Um, <laughs> the Shkotsky here makes up the beginning, the tutor spotting the fly with the end, or does he engage in a, an act of creative rewriting? Is the, it's, remember, the waxen face itself without a fly that causes a young child to shriek in horror and helps the narrator discover the source of the oppressive smell that had filled the room and become conscious of the death. Um, just as he had composed his epistolary novel, Zoo, by arranging the pieces on the floor, Shklovsky describes writing Sisivar by cutting and pasting. In this image too, one sees a combination of the past, stare trapinki, and the future, nazeus ik trisiec. The idea that one can generate new paths by setting off to walk along a scattered recombination of old ones. Leaves are his other metaphor in the opening, Zastavka. In this book, Shklovsky teaches us that many of the greatest works of literature had no end, Virginia Negin, Dead Souls, etc. Um, and his work defies our wish for an ending, Kansani Budiet. But he also reminds us the, that the absence of beginning, middle, and end does not mean that a work has no unity. Artistic unity, Shklovsky writes, is, quote, in the creation of a certain relationship between the parts. If the parts of Titiva have a unifying principle, it seems to be in the act of revisiting, resituating, or recontextualizing theories that the formulas produced. At first, the reader may be confused and wonder, what are these descriptions of the streets, history, topography of the city of Petersburg, Petrograd, Leningrad doing in this book? But eventually she realizes that they help recreate the atmosphere of Petersburg, Petrograd, Leningrad at the time of Shklovsky's youth. This atmosphere shaped the formalists in their work and breathing life into them, Shklovsky draws on the ever regenerative strength of the near mythical city. Shklovsky speaks about the city, and I think one of the papers will be about this, if I remember correctly, um, as containing past and future. Leningrad, Petersburg is a system of systems, just like a literary work, and in it is, in its very images contains history, the change of forms which meanwhile exist simultaneously. Thus, he writes in architecture, quote, it is clear that the old remains because a rock endures. The old remains coming alive in a new aspect, uh, page 137. I used the, uh, you know, the 1983 edition or whatever, so mine, my page numbers might be different. Um, the city of Petersburg of the revolutionary era has palaces in the center, connected to the past, and factories at the periphery connected to the future. The city changes, but the past is visible. So using evocations of revolutionary Petersburg, Shklovsky travels back in time. In the moment of writing, he's an old man who has survived his friends, who has, quote, almost no one to write letters to, no one to whom to show manuscripts, from page four. But in revolutionary Petersburg, he was both bee and beehive. A writer is not just a bee, quote, you know, but also the hives. In his work is the work of many bees, including the work of the past and the work of the future. The whole world moved. Soviet Union dragged the world beside, behind itself, the world slowly from our point of view and quickly from the point of view of historical chain scale changes. So rather than being out of place with a red hat, so to speak, he was in revolutionary Petrograd like the literary heroes and also the poets he describes in the book as being, quote, born into an epoch of, of a rupture in ways of life, people at the turning points of history in which humanity can sense its change for the, quote, falling apart of time are the steps of history. On page 105. Speaking of the person out of place, as the basis for plot, he writes that the plot is thus, quote, a manner of researching a person, and also that a person attains happiness. Happiness is not peace, but the quality of consciousness. Happy, happy people are kinetic. So here, you know, happy people are young, you know, are the on their kind of romantic quest. Um, and this is the opposite of the grandma and the red hat. So he underlines in his descriptions of a cold and hungry life in Petrograd that he and Akibam and Tinyanov were happy. Pairing the act of rereading and the theory of estrangement is significant. Shklovsky's Titiva argues and demonstrates that if art renews our perceptions of the world around us, literary scholarship exists in order to make the literary work 
especially the classics, be readable. And in Shklovsky's view, Buddy's Eckenbaum had a special talent for this. Shklovsky's theory of dis the dissimilarity of the similar brings attention to the methods of innovation in art and the evolution of literary form. From his view, the art moves changing. It changes its methods, but the past does not disappear. Art simultaneously moves using its old dictionary, assigning new meaning to old structures that seem to be immobile. At the same time, it purposefully changes, not changing for the purpose of change itself, but in order that through the movement of things, through the repositioning, the palpability of their differences becomes man manifest. This is on page seven. Changes in art are, are motivated by the need for distinction. Literary scholarship helps us feel the work of art again as if for the first time, making these dissimilarities, this unevenness, this movement visible. It therefore estranges the classics. So he writes, I think about the fact that literary scholarship, the life of Boris Mikhailovich Eichenbaum, of Yuri Tinyanov, was spent on the analysis of the phenomena of existence, on the removal of the covers of time from old art towards renewing the sensation of the classics. End quote. In Titiva itself, Shklovsky tries to perform the work of resurrecting some of the classics of literary scholarship by relating them to the lives and personalities of their authors. Let's now look at one example, um, that of Paris Mikhailovich Eichenbaum. The chapters devoted to Eichenbaum in Titiva are prominent. They come first in the series of memoir theories. Shklovsky combines memoir with a re-entry into Eichenbaum's work, most of all, the article on Gogol, the work on Lermontov, the multi-volume work on Tolstoy, the last of which was lost during Eichenbaum's evacuation from Leningrad uh, during the blockade. One of Shklovsky's goals is to show how Eichenbaum's life that's seemingly not represented in his scholarship is nevertheless important to it. He says, the life in, of Boris in Eichenbaum of those years seemingly was not reflected in his work. And this is parallel to how Shklovsky says that Tolstoy's life in Sebastopol seemingly did not directly reflect itself in childhood. So Shklovsky must show us how, and I would argue he does so most successfully for the article on Gogol. For in his reminiscences of Eichenbaum, Shklovsky underscores the scholar's early musical training and lifelong attachment to music. He calls Eichenbaum, quote, a musician who had quit the violin but had not lost his love for music. And strangely, Ginsburg has his instrument as the piano. So I don't know who, who is right. <laughs> I would tend to trust uh, Ginsburg, but on the other hand, Shklovsky knew Eichenbaum well, so, so I leave it. That is a research question. <laughs> um, maybe it was both. Eichenbaum's uh, revelation of the sound qualities of Gogol's text, its brilliance and verbal performance, more than a social critique, somehow organically comes out of Eichenbaum's musicality, his own theatricality, his verbal performances that never cease to impress audiences, with the exception of the performance that seems that Shklovsky's accounts would have caused his death. Indeed, so attached was, was the scholar to his work that failed performance to dispel his doom. Um, of course, Shklovsky also connects the article to the atmosphere of Scots in the 1920s, to Zoshinka's and Bobby's stories, you know, which helps him kind of uh, resituate, show the life of how that article reflected Eichenbaum's life. Shklovsky's chapters on Eichenbaum succeed in painting him too as a person out of place, whose dislocation Shklovsky himself helped to cause. So Eichenbaum appears as an already formed philologist at the point of their acquaintance, was also the moment at which Shklovsky quote, ruined his life, which I think he says with false modesty, um, by bringing him into an argument. <clears throat> In these sections, Shklovsky gives a sense of a dying empire and tells how Eichenbaum had to burn books to keep warm, another sign of the transformation of Eichenbaum into a typical literary hero. Eichenbaum, even in his early adulthood, had parts of his life shattered by the cruel age and suffered a kind of dislocation in time. One morning, remember, Shklovsky encountered his friend in a cold, hungry Petrograd, but during the early thaw of spring, Eichenbaum was pulling his daughter in a fur coat wrapped with a scarf, whereby Shklovsky reminds him, Paris, to floor. And Eichenbaum responds, Yanni Zangnesio, da, to floor. This moment is one of a person out of place, suffering already from the trauma of the past. It would seem that the father's overbundling of his daughter suggests a response to the loss of his son. And this is nevertheless uh, when Shklovsky and Eichenbaum were at their happiest. And that's on the same page as that, that anecdote. Um, he shows Eichenbaum's unending labor during the blockade of Leningrad, gives him 
uh, gives more detail than in Julie and Willy, um, gives it more details, right? The words of his speech on the Leningrad radio against the Nazis, you know, talking about Tolstoy and war and peace. In Julie Bully, he gives the text as relying on Makagoninka's recollections, and here he includes an account by Olga Bergolz um, and describes the tragic moment of the loss of manuscript after evacuation across Lake Ladiga. In Julie Bully, Shklovsky precedes the death of Eichenbaum with Shklovsky's own critique of the latter's mistakes in the article on Gogol. Um, Eichenbaum's dismissal of the re rebellious undertones of the story, Kaki's response, sorry, presence as a reproach to the power structures of Petersburg and his return as a ghost to steal the overcoat. It's as if in Julie Bully, Shklovsky buries the article while bailing, burying his friend and then both begs forgiveness and bids for a farewell when he writes Prashaidru, Prashaidru. Um, in Tsitsipa, Shklovsky also takes issue with some of Eichenbaum's scholarship over the overvaluing of the youthful poetry of Lermontov or the failure to see some of the significant differences between Tolstoy and his influences. However, he, he doesn't criticize the Chignel article at all, noticeably, and points to the connection between it and his own work on Don Quixote. Uh, Don Quixote. So um, because there's so much overlap in the narration of Eichenbaum and Eichenbaum's death in the two works, these differences are more striking, proving Shklovsky's theory of the dissimilarity of the similar. For Antitieva, dramatically telling of Eichenbaum's heart attack, he interweaves the work with the life um, and the turn from Shklovsky's own project of self-salvation to his project of saving the work. So I mean, in Julie Bully, self-salvation -sal and in Antitieva, saving the work, um, casts both author and subject Eichenbaum in a more favorable light. So when you're trying to save Eichenbaum's work, you are more, uh, you know, um, generous to him than when you are trying to save your, your life. Um, Lydia Ginsburg included into her uh, 1989, uh, you know, person at a writing table, a short reminiscence of Eichenbaum, and she calls it Problema Provisienia, in which she also points out that the best scholarship includes personal autobiographical significance. For her, it is most of all Eichenbaum's interest in the historical dimensions of behavior, a concern that one finds in his own turn to be totally quick, and in his response when his own students rejected it. So um, I'm gonna quote a little bit at length from Ginsburg. I'm sorry I didn't uh, manage to make a PowerPoint, but maybe some of you have read this and will remember. She's talking about the dispersal of the, you know, boom, 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 seminary um, in Eichenbaum's apartment. Последним толчком к распаду прослужила обсуждение в семинаре Эхенбаумовские теории, теории литературного быта. В теории мы встретились с неодобрением. Борис Михайлович сказал, семинарий проявил полное единодушие. Я в ужасном положении. Но положение могло быть еще ужаснее. Представьте себе, что так лет через пять вы начали бы говорить какие-нибудь там новые смелые вещи, и я бы вас не понимал, ведь это было бы ужасно. К счастью, сегодня все получилось наоборот. Эта реплика была не только искусным, не только искусным полемическим выпадом, в ней таялась занимавшей тогда Айкенбаума концепция исторического и исторического поведения поколений. Поколение, утверждал он, сменяется каждые 10 лет. В жизни личности десятилетия тоже сигнал изменения. So, um, uh, here, you know, Eichenbaum notices that he's actually, in a way, ahead of the next generation, right? Um, and he himself is is interested in the uh, you know the relationship between people in among a single generation, which are kinds of concerns that Shklovsky has in Tsitsiva. However, Shklovsky doesn't mention literature uh, in or even Mojbriminik in Tsitsiva, which I think is a conspicuous kind of absence. Um, and this is how. Uh, um, just a couple more quotes from Ginsburg, that reflection. She says, Творчество есть акт осознания себя в потоке истории, писал Айкенбаум в статье о некрасиве. And a little bit later, историка литературным работам особую динамичность придает их подспудное личное 
значение. Скрытые отношения к жизненным задачам писавшего. У больших научных трудов Борис Михайлович Хакинбама был свой интимный смысл. Проблема исторического поведения личности. So it's rather curious that what Ginsburg finds is the dominant of Eichenbaum's work, the most essential element that connects to his personality, is one that really receives less emphasis in Shklovsky's portrait, even though it very much aligns with Shklovsky's project of unearthing the, the historic behavior of the personality. For what is grandma's hat but an, an example of this very phenomenon? And that's where I'll end. <laughs> Thank you. I'd like the floor for comments and questions, and uh, there's an obvious continuation of uh, your presentation in yeah. Emily's, which, which reflects the art of the composer of the program. Um, <laughs> not me. Uh, but uh, so, so, so we, we, we can continue discussion that, that, that was forcefully interrupted <laughs> an hour ago. Right, okay. And Julie, feel free to yeah. help. Please, <laughs> comments, questions. Okay, so I, I, I'll abuse my my, my position. Um, so if if as you said, and as as Ginsburg writes, um, Eichenbaum's uh, theme is Pavidian uh, uh, um how how would you from 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 this position from this uh, comparison of uh, between Shklovsky and Eichenbaum in many ways, how would you define how what Shklovsky does? What is his theme, at least in this book, and maybe across the world? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's where I need to think about that more. It's a little bit hard to, it's hard to, uh, it's clearly not exactly um, historical uh, behavior, it's something different. right? It's something different. And yet, um, he, he still has this concept of, of generation. Right. Yeah, yeah. And um, like, yeah. One moment that I didn't that I didn't fit into this book is this moment where you know, uh, I mean, not the book. <laughs> Stop. The moment where he, you know, he's with the dying Pinyanov, and and uh, Pinyanov, Pinyanov is kind of losing his capacity for like conscious speech at that mm -hmm. point, and he says, "Give me that yellow wine." And, and none of the nurses know what he's talking about. And then he says, well, because I was the same age, I knew what he was talking about, whatever he calls that one. And then from there, Nyana started to speak again, like more yeah. making sense again. So like that, that ability they have to tap into that, um, that similar you know, point in memory, mm -hmm. you know, is important, but that's, you know, so you have that, but on the one hand, you also have the idea of the um, historical, changeability of you know artistic devices and that evolutionary right mm -hmm. so um but where does that uh i guess the notion of, of behavior is hard to put one's finger on well but maybe it's not behavior it's uh, something different right mm -hmm. so, so, so some points of context words mm -hmm. images right. ideas and then and their circulation uh, right. yeah Right, so then you come back to that idea of Shklovsky as like mechanic and you know the thing in Shklovsky, right? the word, rather than the human being. Like, right, <laughs> like the human beings, right? Right. right. Okay. Um, I don't know. But, but just to go back down to um, Ekenbaum, do you agree with Ginsburg that Ekenbaum's problem was um, the problem of um, or, uh, human behavior mm -hmm. in history? Certainly it was her problem. <laughs> right, I think Baum, I'm not quite sure. I think for him, sort of the main problem was the problem of literature and that's mm -hmm. what he got persistently. Like, in the Luminique is a perfect example there. So, everything that he does, like the whole story, like with the, or whoever, right? So, it's the craft that allows you to present yourself or to shape yourself as a writer. So, I think that's his main problem, right? So, but so do you mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. do you think she's right? I mean, like, she, she's doing in a sense, like, to him, what um, Scholzky does to all of them, right? So we right. write, write in a reposition right. them with the context, mm -hmm. right? So, it makes sense, mm -hmm. right? For you, um, as that a scholar of Ginsburg, right? That's a good point. I mean, I don't know Eichenbaum well enough mm -hmm. to. Figure out who you know who has the bigger blind spot. You know, well, the thing about it's again mm -hmm. it's the same idea, right? So it's a craft that he's very much concerned with. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. So it could be that she, you know, 
they're both mi missing something. Mm -hmm. Like Shkotsky emphasizes more than right. right. Um, and also that he he talks about how Eichenbaum contributed to our sense of the importance of intertextuality, mm -hmm. right? Um, which Ginsburg also doesn't mention. So no, it's a good point. Как Шкловский уничтожает Эхенбаума и, с другой стороны, возвращается к его главной теме, потому что он описывает смерть Эхенбаума, при которой он не присутствовал, но как смерть после неудачной лекции по поводу эстрадного шутника. Ну, <laughs> эта метафора гениальная, потому что она находится, где он уничтожает Эхенбаума дважды, а одновременно подтверждает его позицию. Нужно правильно понять свою модель своего поведения в истории. Ну, он такой, что человек да. не на своем месте, это он... постоянный персонаж. Да, да, да. И э, это, конечно, э, такое двойное, э, двойное утверждение, которое позволяет ему только жанр, в котором он пишет. Иначе бы он должен был как-то определиться. Но он возвращается к этой смерти в жили-были, mm -hmm. и еще где-то он постоянно mm -hmm. этот, эту, эту сцену переехал. Mm -hmm. Да, да, да. Но эта сцена для него вот найденная который вбирает и теорию, и, и уничтожение теории. Mm -hmm. и, и... Mm -hmm. Джессика, да, я вижу. Да, у меня есть вопрос. Это что-то, что я думала о том, что уже из последнего раза, может быть, приглашать ее два разговора вместе. Я был впечатлен, ну, я имею в виду, что много материалов разговоров, не только на хат, но и на репетицию. Я очень люблю, что вы привели эту метафору, что эхо – это как-то спасибо, что мы думали о том, Moving backwards and forwards, you know, and I um, have like these moments that like, I won't replicate everything. But I was wondering about what your thoughts were on how biography and theory are in tension maybe with each other. I mean, as in the bowstring metaphor, how we can move back and forth between these two because it seems like um, through the talk sort of brought out this, you know theme as a kind of intervention in terms of how we think about cultural history, say, on this sort of a theoretical argument um, to his contemporaries. Um, whereas if we read this through the sort of biographical lens, it becomes about Kofi's um, memory, right? So holding two pieces of different pieces of historical time together in this position is like, either this sort of Benjaminian move or this um, kind of what what happens, you know, as a person that looks back and reflects on their life. And so I'm wondering, um, you know, just, you know, thoughts about um, how much it matters if we want to read this book as a theoretical book or a biographical book or both or just um, are these in tension with each other? It's just a matter of choosing your, your lens and you know is the outcome how different is it, right? Is it a question of senility or is it a question of like radical theoretical innovation? I mean <laughs> so um let's have one more question and then we will answer. Uh, it was back to Eichenbaum, but it's not necessary. And, uh, I mean, I was just wondering, speaking about memoir and theor theory, theory and memory, <laughs> that strange and uh, incredibly powerful phrase uh, in Julie Bulle, uh, when he's describing the death of Eichenbaum, and he says something about железные кузнечики, которые стрекочут, по-моему, даже так, побелевшие от снега, от мороза траве. Uh, what that, um, uh, this definition, mm -hmm. uh, it has something theoretical about it because it does have some kind of железный кузнечик, стрекотание, and something about some kind of a landscape of the siege, побелевшая от мороза трава. It's such a strange phrase. Mm -hmm. Do you think there is any point in it or is it just... Uh, an outburst, a poetic outburst. All right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, um, yeah, I remember that phrase, and it's partly, you know, thanks to your presentation, 
then because I think you had talked about it in your yeah. really presentation. Because I still cannot get used to it. It's such yeah. a fantastic phrase. Yeah. Um, well, what was striking to me was when I, re I was rereading Ginsburg's um, essay, she also has the Zelezny Kuznetsky, but it comes from um, a letter, Shkolsky's letter from 1958, where she called Akimba, he called already Akimba Zelezny Kuznetsky. Um, so that was something that Shkolsky had already called Akinbaum to talk about his, you know, in Ginsburg was Suchitanya is Yashispa Stuartis is my brazen of that. You know, so the like the brilliance, the elegance, you know, and Shkolsky talks about his like fine hands and, you know, his kind of beauty yeah. and he didn't even age in a certain way, but also complete you know, um, you know, just like power and firmness and, you know, and Ginsburg order talks about, yeah. yeah, orderliness and how he, you could never win an argument with him. And yeah. so, um, you know, there you ha have Eichenbaum and then you have him, yeah, what, rusting in the snow or not? What was it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So it's worth um, in in the unfitting condition, in the condition where where typically grasshoppers do not survive. Grasshoppers mm. cannot; they do. They, they are not iron. Yeah, mm -hmm. well, the iron, of course. Everything but, is impossible. The, the, yeah, but it's an epitaph, a fantastic epitaph. Yeah, and I'm also wondering if somehow this grasshopper can connect to the cicadas. That yeah. Yeah. of course, yeah. of course. Yeah. So sorry, yeah, it, and. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, Jessica's question is just a really good one. I don't, I haven't resolved it yet, whether their intention, I mean, I, I was trying to kind of, I wanted to find this unity in uh, in this text and, how, and it seemed to me that the memoir is really the thread that holds the theory together. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, to me, and they're kind of the most compelling passages to read are the more the memoiristic ones. So I think it makes a contribution to memoir or you know, and the fact that it it all comes out so differently than in Julie Bully, you know. Uh, when he's he says, you know, Sakra here in Tsitipa he says Sakranyaim Pamyat Arabotia, you know, like we remember the we remember our work, and somehow that generates a, a different kind of autobiography, which is um, I don't know, but at least I can be more um, optimistic. Like, you know, this is this is a book of, you know, of old age, but, you know, I don't know if it's, a, I don't feel like it's a set, it's, it's like defi defiantly happy still, right? <laughs> like we are going to be, even in the, in the very uh, end, he talks about where he, he says there will be no ending. He talks about, uh, you know, so um, he really wants us to be a joyful book, and I think in the in a certain sense he succeeds. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. So I, I I wonder about this this uh, ending as well, right? Um, I mean, it mm -hmm. it has this sense of a little bit protesting too much. I mean, I feel real melancholy in Puskaya to. <laughs> <laughs> if you have to say that at the end of your right. class, right? Like uh, <laughs> things are not going well or yeah. things are not going happily at least. And I, I uh, it made me think of this, um, the, the line that you brought up about happiness being not peace, but sort of kinetic energy, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and this, um, this sort of uh, he doesn't he doesn't let dead dogs lie, right? He he kind of resurrects them by scratching the surface, getting back to their, uh, mm -hmm. you know, uh, uh, ashibki and, and sort of re reviving them in that way. And it seems like the the defiance of uh, the sort of melancholy of the book, I, I just, I do think that the sort of defiant happiness is absolutely there, but mm -hmm. it, it is it is always shot through with the melancholy of, of sort of the unreturnability mm -hmm. um, of, of, of these things that he's kind of trying to revive. And I don't know, I guess I'm, I'm wondering how how for you that kind of plays into this this uh, combination between sort of theory and memoir. So so how much of it is this attempt to sort of revive 
memory and 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 making that into a theory in other words like is 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 he kind of mobilizing memoir as a as a theoretical tool for for kind of rethinking text and and also making this sort of connection between the old and the new i don't know if that, that makes sense but there seems to be some sort of a a, a personal element that is um you know in, injecting uh injecting himself into into the old and and that is kind of uh and and making it new and that that kind of both it, it comes out of the memoiristic parts but it also uh informs i think the theoretical parts as well and i, I just i wonder how you can see those things connected mm -hmm. just, just a second before you answer let's give the floor to Ilya, also who has his hand very, very before um returning to the uh scene of uh about uh, I think um, maybe um, I'm um, too over interpreting, uh, but um, it seems to me that um, uh, 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 repetition of uh, interpretation of Asian Bones this uh, on the uh, concept of Anatoly Bonin-Gurt, let's uh, uh, quote uh, his name uh, of this uh, comic personage. Uh -huh. uh, um, uh, was necessary to quote in order to avoid uh, the um, both uh, discussion and remembrance of uh, comparison of their own behavior in the 1940s, 1950s, because Trotsky was uh, in these decades much more conformist than uh, Ethan Baum. And I think that this is very interesting that um, two memoir chapters in uh, memoir and theoretical chapter or two theoretical chapters in uh, the both uh, about Inanov and about Asian Baum are focused on the figures of the most non-conformist formalists who were most uh, mm, uh, most uh, faithful uh, to the uh, mm, uh, primary classes of formalism. Uh, and I think that uh, it's um, uh, Shklovsky, on the one hand, uh, declared his, uh, uh, that he continued his, uh, the uh, um, uh, action of the early formalism, but on the other hand, he, uh, uh, with this same uh, gesture, he suppresses the uh, memory of his own formalism and uh, conformism, sorry, uh, and his own uh, digression from the uh, way of continuation of these early ideas of formalism. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. That's um, that's an excellent comment. Uh, so, just so I can, can I ask you to elaborate how um, on how that the scene of of that death, of that performance, like how that itself, like what about that scene helps uh, Shkolsky paper over? Because I, I agree, I agree with you entirely. So I want to make sure how I, I understand the relationship between, you know, that scene and the absence of the scenes of all the, you know, Prarabotki of Eichenbaum and Eichenbaum's bravery and all of that, like the absence of the 19, the late 1940s in and early 1950s in um in this text. Did you what was the because I don't know about this, you know, this comic, you know. Very interesting writer and playwright uh, and uh, memories. Uh, yes, memories and uh, uh, yes, memories and uh, uh, destroys him and memory his memory in a much more strong sense than uh, the, uh, the story of uh, uh -huh. Baum about uh, uh -huh. what uh, Alexander says. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So in Shklovsky's own treatment, <laughs> 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 yeah. So so um, yeah, that's a, it's really it's interesting how you know Shklovsky's um, investment here in uh, revisiting precisely the you know the the less conformist of his uh, um, formalist comrades. <laughs> um, so yeah, thank you. And as to um, yeah, Jessica's question. Wait, is am I still? 
If I responded to no, you responded to Desi. No, 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 so it was Bradley. No, it was Bradley. Bradley. Sorry. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't take it. Uh, you know, about whether uh, Shklovsky is mobilizing memoir as a theoretical tool. Um, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a great question. I mean, I, I basically think that in this work, yes, he is doing that. I think that he needs to do that in order to um, make of old theory, new theory, kind of connected to, to Julia's talk, right? Like, um, if he were just picking up, I think, Bauman and Yannick without having known them and without being able to situate them and kind of bring them to life in this way, he, he wouldn't be able to, um, I don't know, to, maybe he wouldn't have the authority to re, rewrite them or re-engage or kind of pick, pick them apart. Something about his personal connection seems to me integral to the to the project, and therefore he plays, you know, he plays that up. It becomes part of the text. It can't just remain outside of it. Well, that's uh, what he does in Stroh. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He's using his his personality as theoretical argument uh -huh. all the way through. That, that, <laughs> that that's his trademark, right? Life into art. Yeah, mm -hmm. life into art. Exactly. Or art into life, rather. Right? Yeah. Yeah, just a quick one. Um, uh, it's for Bradley actually. Um, I'm I'm kind of puzzled um, by your characterization of this as a as a melancholic. Mm -hmm. Do you really think so? Um, I, I I don't because um, I mean there is no fixation on laws. I think like what what uh, uh, Yulia should well. He's very much concerned with minul, like to minul, minul, right? So in other words, like it's past. Like in Zastavka, he has an interesting uh, line: "A sipolesliście." <laughs> <laughs> yeah. right? In other words, like, sorry, there is a clear understanding. These people are gone, and I am dealing with naked trees. And I'm producing this, you know, um, what's the x ray of these trees, right? So, like, there is nothing left except for, you know, sequoia stutter. So, I just don't think like, there is melancholy. And you, again, like, you, and especially you don't find it again, like, in, in um, um, uh, Energia Zablushdenia. He is very much concerned with his own time. And he repeats uh, that book is even less, uh, or even more, I guess, uh, you know, about the stars, star, the Kanchaito stars. And he repeats it all the time. And you do get a sense of he's dying and he's perfectly aware of this, right? So and he doesn't doesn't shy away from kind of saying it. But here, I don't think so. I just don't yeah. see the, yeah. I don't see the, the fixation on loss that melancholy would, 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 would require. I totally agree. He's too aggressive to be melancholic. Yeah. No, he's still very much kinetic. <laughs> he is, but I, it, I mean, the, the the defiance of the kineticism, I think, is 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 uh, point to now and how it leaves a little bit for me. I think for me, the 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 beginning of the Tinyana chapter, where he sort of does this almost cinematic zoom in, right, with this scene setting of of of, of uh, mm -hmm. uh, Petersburg before before the revolution, and then zooms in on on Tinyana, like young Tinyana in the window, and he looks like a Dickensian hero almost there, and that that sort of revival of young Tinyana as a uh, novelistic sort of you know uh, young young hero seems to me um, romanticized in a in a sort of way that that points to you know the revival of loss. I think that 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 to me just just sort of affectively that came through in a lot of parts of the book. But I think one of the things that's really interesting about this, and and it, it connects to um, to Julia's presentation as well, is is you know what are the modes in which he's sort of critical? What are the modes it is in which he's the writer? And and I think memoirist might be the same as writer, but they coincide at times, but not always the same as writer. And I think he's very interested in in randomness theoretically and this sort of kinetic energy. But as as a writer and a memoirist, he's making these sort of um, connections. The the yellow wine is one of them, but also these kind of word individual word connections that that uh, belie the randomness, right? So the randomness, I think, is is a theoretical sort of move on his part, but then the, the the underlying connections that he either makes through memory or through the repetition of certain words from earlier in his career, like Kamin, right? Um, there's also uh, a couple of times when, you know, uh, uh, which to me, like, always plays into the Astrenina thing. Um, so there's these, these sort of moments when, like, as a writer, sort of poetically, he makes connections where he is theoretically constantly sort of pushing even away connections and moving towards the end of this. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Even uh, even in this Zastavka, this uh, theme of humbleness and this skromne, it kind of occurs again and mm -hmm. again. Uh, so he, he holds his stuff mm -hmm. very, very firmly. 
being at the same intellectually, uh, again, probabilistic or something. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But then, uh, I mean, there was a point discussing the whole thing from the point of view of melancholy. Precisely this obsession with uh, endless repetition of the same memory. So we have to prove somehow that he was not a fetishist, right? <laughs> <laughs> can, can we prove it? Uh, <laughs> or it is. <laughs> Kirill, please. Yes, I think, you know, just chiming in on the melancholy debate, which I think is very important here, it also kind of depends on what kind of definition of melancholy you work with, right? Because melancholy doesn't necessarily is not necessarily does not ex necessarily exclude happiness or a willingness to do something with where you are, right? It is like this condition of I'm also thinking like Benjamin in terms. It's like this condition of observing things falling away as they do, friends die as they do, and there is a lot of space spent talking about it. What do we do with that, right? And then there are options here which is, okay, let's do something out of it, which is kind of sort of the, what Traverza calls uh, left-wing melancholia, right? Let's stand up and, and still work with it and not just feel complete resignation and powerlessness. So, but this, what, what matters as melancholia is this observing, observing of things, disintegrating, following history, uh, kind of going in the wrong direction because that's where the whole idea of alternative comes in, right? Because things are, uh, and asynchronicity, because we cannot just identify with the time as a single stream, right? We need to take ourselves out. And this is kind of what we are have been discussing that Shlovsky is doing, right? So in a sense, that's a melancholic gesture. Uh, I, I, I don't agree. I mean, I, I don't want to be <laughs> liberal on this, but um, just, just uh, I say one thing and then it's sort of, for a person who is so dramatically, emphatically and fundamentally concerned with the potentiality of a detail and fragment, to insist that he is melancholic doesn't make sense to me because melancholy, melancholy implies precisely a lack or a disintegration of a framework, holistic framework, right? So you constantly you are constantly facing this kind of inability to integrate things into your already existing context. He tells us, no problem. I can turn any detail into a larger context or a framework or whatever, and I can do the same in the other way around. I can disintegrate any framework into detail to show to take it elsewhere. So for me, sort of that kind of that sensibility, or rather that that kind of um, epistemology, completely precludes him from from getting, being a dead in melancholy. It's just not his repertoire. But to be honest, yes, sure, right, yeah, and maybe I don't know, Gizmog, sure, anyway, right? Which Kosky just don't see. It. Uh, all right, but, uh, but that's not the point. <laughs> please, we, we get heated by 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 the end of the discussion. I don't want don't want to to interrupt it. I want to give the floor to more sure. people. So Jessica, Ilya, and then Lilia. Oh, I just a small and then you. Okay. Sort of tangential <laughs> comment to this discussion, which is that Shlosky compares himself to Dante a number of times, right? As this sort of circling, putting together contradictions and. He also kind of highlights, you know, Dante's sort of pugilistic mm -hmm. <laughs> attitude, but I thought maybe, you know, as a sort of model for what he's doing, mm -hmm. bringing together all these contemporary pieces and circling around in memories also has this kind of, you know, invective <laughs> aspect to it, which is kind of what we're speaking of. Can I just very briefly add to what because my very briefly. Thoughts, very briefly. I just wanted to say, like, but would it be possible, for example, to imagine that he takes something like melancholia or grief, right, about something that passed and transforms it or get into something else that becomes this that becomes a moment of action, right? Because he has like at the moment where, for example, he says. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right, so is wouldn't you say that there is something melancholic about even the phrase It would be if he would say Okay, that okay. would be sort of a perfect example of melancholy. All right, but he still operates. <laughs> okay, but could you say that ironically, then he at least takes something like grief and says that that doesn't, but we are mobilizing grief to do something and else? Precisely because he does this with Sashkodno, for him it's crucial. And uh, remember, in, in so he says, Nas nikto ne može that, 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 that. I, I, his in that sense, right? A need. A uh, perfect example precisely of that, right? So he cannot do anything like sort of he's banned, like he's kind of, you know, oppressed and marginalized. And yet, you want, you know what, like I'll, I'll produce this sort of completely pagination and tell you it's pagination. I won't hide it, right? 
precisely because uh, labor is something that allows him like to be action bound that allows him to pull out of this melancholy. I think that's crucial. And for me, like sort of uh, Poiski Optimism is a very melancholy book entirely, right? He cannot let it go. He's still trying to figure out sort of, what I'm to do when I can't do anything. Right, and but, but later on, I just don't think so, I and mean, not on this particular. But I might be wrong, so try hard to convince me. All right, <laughs> Ilya, please. I think uh, that uh, the root of this confusion is uh, multi multiplicity of meanings of the word melancholia, the very word melancholia, uh, because uh, there are several meanings. For example, Freudian meaning. Uh, on the other hand, common everyday meaning uh, that we are discussing now. Uh, and I think that, uh, that mm, if following the uh, comment of Bradley, uh, the mm, book, uh, the whole thing is melancholic in a very narrow Freudian sense. Uh, you know, Freud, uh, Freud uh, discussed melancholy as impossibility to distinguish uh, uh, between oneself uh, and uh, you know, the uh, object of loss. And I think that. In one half, the both thing is melancholic in this very sense because, of course, he cannot distinguish the self of his narrator uh, from the uh, objects of his loss. Uh, I don't know, the Nyan of uh, uh, Petersburg, uh, Eichenbaum, and so on and so forth. But on the other hand, in the, uh, in the other half of his self, Slotsky endlessly rewrites uh, the Nyan of Petersburg, structuralism, and so on and so forth. This book, you are both right because uh, this book uh, is <laughs> melancholic in Freudian sense, and this is the uh, uh, way of aspiration to overcome this melancholy in the same time. At the same time. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Lily. Please. So almost identically to what I was about to say, which is Freudian melancholia and the fact that that of course. What it what 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 Freud says right is that the objects get take, right, the lost object becomes part of you and then you can't get that's why you can't get over it right that's the difference between mourning and melancholy is that with melancholy you can't get over the thing that that that, that has been lost right so it becomes a part of you and he keeps recycling and repeating and and working and but and but not working through right or maybe working through um, anyways I, that's just the working it is, away it's fine I'll, I'm I'm gonna yeah. keep at it yeah. <laughs> All right, yeah. Emily, please. So yeah, you, you got a number of comments. Yeah. Well, yeah, try I try to react to all of it. Kind of thing, but I really, I like all of these. I like what you said, you said about the, you know, the the framework and the fragment. Mm -hmm. You know, this this productivity the ability of Shkolsky to to um, turn a framework into a fragment or a fragment into a framework, right? Mm -hmm. And um, I think also what um, Lilia just said about uh, this uh, or this question. You know the recycling and repeating and the like the productivity of these of the past for Chbosky on the one hand suggests um, that there isn't this um, uh, economy of melancholy or whatever uh, because he's so uh, he's not like held back by it in any in any sense. But on the other hand, that isn't that doesn't mean that he's worked through it either. Like I don't know if a, if a working through is. Is happening when one is playfully reconstructing. So, um, yeah, I really I'm glad that this discussion, you know, is took off, and I'm not gonna <laughs> I'm not gonna re resolve it. So, thank you all for for all of these, um, you know, for this great discussion. What about Dante? Oh, Dante, yeah. I mean, <laughs> I think that was a great comment as well. Oh, I did want it to end. I wanted to just remind us again about the resurrecting grandma, like and how, <laughs> like Shklovsky is 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 doing that like even though she that scene is in this book like she just won't die right and then she lives six years after her death so there's something to be done with that <laughs> she goes into optimism when, when, when yeah. the camera you see the because uh, uh, bart writes about his mother right and so when in this and at this point it like her you know the photograph like sort of nobody is there like we don't really remember the person but we do remember the costume uh -huh. So it's very, very similar to me. Like that was like I was wondering, like, is he responding to that? Probably not. And Mishkovsky, yeah, but like, yeah, they both have kind of resurrecting pictorial elements of their relatives. Uh -huh. <laughs> in this sense, Bart's text about Mishlea might be interesting. Mm -hmm. His analysis of this uh, madness in Mishlea, uh, who thought that historian existed uh, for the purpose of uh, 
um, swimming over the Lise, like taking back the dead guys, letting them finish here in our world, which they had, and then putting them back. <laughs> <laughs> Rejoining to the proper place. Yes. <laughs> distinct from yeah. Right. So I mean, right. that's, yeah. yeah. Uh, uh -huh. Lila, you want to say? Uh, just a, just a little comment from um, from resurrecting grandma to see the uh, bark um, The other uh, the other text maybe to put in this is is Krakauer's. Yeah. Uh, and he's got this nice essay called "What Does the Grandmother Look Like?" and it's about a photograph of the grandmother. Right. Yeah. 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 So, anyways, yeah. So, yeah. so anyways, just to add a yeah. Yeah. add a third. Yeah. So <laughs> if, if, if if I also can add a little bit about to the discussion about the end. Um, I don't know if, if you notice that and appears before that, a uh, few pages before as a quotation from Tolstoy mm -hmm. and with the word Kanyets in the center of the page, but but the very quotation is extremely self-reflexive. Um, получало для него совсем иное, чем прежде значение. Чем кончится этот новый период его жизни, покажет будущее. Конец. So it's 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 completely the the rewrite of of the past. There is also such a tease. The end is such a tease because Kanyets keeps appearing in the middle. Yeah, and the piece in the in the center of the page. There is also Stern. He grabbed her by and then this is also part of this book. But he cites everything. Okay. But he is directly sort of free writing of the book. All right. Thank you, Emily. Thank you. Dear colleagues, we have a little break until 12. We'll begin at 12 first. And I want to encourage our growing audience to participate in the discussion. Yeah, and um, you know, uh, I'll be monitoring it in the next session. Like, if you have a question, just kind of make sure that um, uh, you have an eye contact with me, and I'll, I'll put you on the list until we have it. Right. So, um, okay. So our next speaker is um, Ilya Kalinin, and the talk is titled "Landschaften in the Future of Germany: The Con and Bradley Perspectives." Да, спасибо, Сергей. Я с вашего разрешения. Во-первых, буду говорить по-русски, во-вторых, умею название. Название, как это часто бывает, возникло раньше самого доклада. Вот. Но оно не сильно изменилось. Просто как-то погрузившись в эти ландшафты, я понял, что касается не только прошедшего времени, но и литературной теории плоского паяза в целом. Так что. Сергей все оказалось более запущенным, чем э, в начале. Значит, э, а закон обратной перспективы остается. Э, и поскольку речь пойдет о перспективе, э, то начну я издалека. Э, у истоков ранней апоязовской теории лежит э, введенное шловским развлечение между узнаванием, э, дающим статичную картину, заданную автоматизированными привычками восприятия, и видением осуществляющим динамический рецептивный сдвиг, позволяющий увидеть конструкцию вещи, обнажить принцип внутреннего соотношения элементов, равно как и ее отношение к окружающему пространству. И трудно заметить, что центральным для школовского и раннего формализма в целом принципом устранения стоит концептуализация оптических понятий. Оптическая рамка, задающая границы апоядзовской рефлексии о литературе и искусстве, диктует и пространственную доминанту в их способе описания. Причем не только композиции литературного произведения, но и принципов литературной эволюции и законов исторического движения в целом. Сдвиг, деформация, теснота стихотворного ряда – понятия, которые задают пространственную метафорику, определяющую анализ поэтического текста. Торможение, замедление, сцепление, нанизывание, перестановка – отклонение, ступень построения, кольцевая композиция – все это оказиональные термины, вводимые Шкловским для описания сюжетного развертывания. И, как легко заметить, они также опираются на отчетливую пространственную метафорику. Когда Тынянов хочет противопоставить содержательную пустоту статичного определения литературы конкретности вводимого им понятия «литературный факт», 
Он вновь прибегает к пространственной метафорике. Цитирую, понятно, какую статью. Тогда как твердое определение литературы дается и делается все труднее, любой современник укажет вам пальцем, что такое литературный факт. Шкловский метафоризирует фундаментальный закон искусства, обращаясь к пространству шахматной доски и ходу коня, который ходит боком, потому что прямая дорога ему запрещена. Цитата. Концептуализация литературной эволюции, даже тогда, когда оперирует временными генеалогическими понятиями отец-сын, дядя-племянник, старшие младшие жанры, тем не менее опирается на пространственную модель описания литературной диахронии, заданную понятиями центр и периферия, или напряжение между соседними рядами, вступающими друг с другом в динамические отношения. То же самое можно сказать и о метафикциональных прозаических текстах формалистов и прежде всего автобиографической трилогии Шкловского. Сентиментальное путешествие представляет собой последовательный перевод движения истории и биографической траектории в термины перемещения в пространстве. ЦО подхватывает этот концептуальный прием, предъявляет историческую ситуацию и биографическую коллизию в образе места, города. Третья фаре, фабрика представляет собой рефлексию о механизмах субъективации, разворачивающуюся вокруг центрального для этой книги образа льна на склище, да, субъекта, производства которого задано взаимодействием с полем, да, пространством социальным. Даже сам принцип работы Шкловского над текстом тоже представляет собой пространственный монтаж, преодолевающий временную линейность текста. Из тетивы, уже цитированный сегодня фрагмент, думаю, пишу, клею, переставляю, да, умею то, что умею. Те, кто работал в архиве Шкловского, тоже прекрасно знают эту, ну, как бы именно пространственную, пространственный принцип работы со временем, да, вот эти, значит, склейки отдельных фрагментов текста друг с другом. Сходную концептуальную деформацию пространственно-временного континуума можно найти и в моем временнике Хенбаума, который противопоставляет абстрактность времени непосредственной конкретности истории, которая также опознается им в пространственных категориях. Цитирую Хенбаума. Напрасно историю смешивают с хронологией. История – реальность. Она как природа, как материя. Она образуется простым фактом смерти и рождения, фактом природы, никакого отношения к времени не имеющим. Хронология и время – абстракция, выдумка, условность, регулирующая семейную жизнь и государственную службу. В здании Петербургского университета я застал ту же борьбу, которая шла в здании 12 коллегий. Ну, имеется в виду значит, в, ну, в Петровские, постпетровские времена. Хотя и профессура, и студенты усиленно носили бороды, да, в отличие от значит, летней давности. Но здесь продолжалась та же старинная борьба двух культур, славяно-русской и романо-германской. Так и назывались два враждующие отделения историко-филологического факультета. Первая культура строилась на церковно-славянском языке и памятниках древнерусской письменности, вторая на провансальских турбадурах, немецких минизингерах и на заветном имени Данте. Конец цитаты. Единство места обеспечивает единство истории, наслаивающей свои темпоральные пласты внутри единого пространственного <coughs> континуума, который работает не как полимпсест, да, где одно замещает другое, а как вот это да, одновременность неодновременная, да, исходство сходное. На этом же принципе построена и значительная часть мемуарных склеек, организующих композицию тетивы. Именно так построена, скажем, часть, посвященная Юрию Тун Тунянову. Голодой, потому что опять про университет, хотя найти можно массу таких примеров, значит, цитирую Титиву. Напомню, университет. Здание стояло фронтоном перед Петропавловской крепостью. С годами стрелка Васильевского острова была застроена, вошла в другую систему. Появились растральные колонны, здание биржи. Доминантой построения системы оказалась биржа. В большом городе разные архитектурные идеи сосуществуют, осознаются в своем противоречии. В самом облике города, в облике города заключена история, смена форм при одновременном их существовании. Конец цитаты. Собственно, что перед нами? Перед нами тыняновская модель описания системности литературной эволюции, чья пространственная доминанта обнажена в пространственной сценографии эволюции города. 
можно найти и еще более отчетливые метафоры, переводящие разговор об истории в пространство на оптические образы. Цитирую эту же главу Протынянова, главка город нашей юности. Да? Широкая, широкая Нева – заглавная строка новой истории. Город дворцов стоит на ладони города завода. Будущее и так. Конец цитаты. Однако речь идет не просто о пространственной конструктивной доминанте в теоретической схеме формализма, как бы переводе времени в термины места, проецировании истории на географию. Речь идет о специфическом представлении о пространстве, способе его репрезентации, формах его познания и представления. Иными словами, речь идет о такой специфической символической форме, как перспектива, и о различиях между несводимыми друг к другу моделями ее реализации, со всеми вытекающими из них эпистемологическими, социальными и даже политическими импликациями. Как известно, прямая перспектива, доминирующая в искусстве и культуре принципов восприятия и познания действительности нового времени, опирается на вполне определенное представление о пространстве. Цитирую Пановского, да, его работу 27 -го года, перспектива как символическая форма, Значит, цитирую. Для того, чтобы обеспечить создание полностью рационального, то есть бесконечного, статичного и гомогенного пространства, центральная перспектива требует наличия двух весьма существенных условий. Первое состоит в том, что мы должны смотреть одним единственным и неподвижным глазом, и второе, что сечение зрительной пирамиды должно считаться адекватной передачей нашего зрительного образа. Но на самом деле оба эти условия – означают совершенно и полное абстрагирование от э, действительности. И как бы дальше обобщая то, что он пишет, да, значит, структура этого бесконечного, статичного и гомогенного чисто математического пространства прямо противоположна пространству психофизиологическому. Точная перспективная конструкция полностью абстрагирована от этой структуры психофизического пространства. Она не только является результатом абстракции, она прямо предназначена осуществлять в изображении пространства однородность и бесконечность, о которых непосредственное переживание пространства ничего не знает. Иными словами, и тут я уже снова перехожу к прямой цитате, она предназначена превратить психофизическое пространство в математическое. Она отрицает таким образом различия между впереди и позади, справа и слева, телами и промежутками между ними, с тем, чтобы привести пространственные части и пространственное содержание к единому квантум континуум. Эта конструкция игнорирует тот факт, что мы смотрим не одним фиксированным, но двумя постоянно подвижными глазами, вследствие чего поле зрения получает сероидальную форму. Конец То есть вот это нейтральное, статичное, гомогенное математическое пространство, предъявляемое прямой центральной перспективой, которая определяет структуру восприятия господствующего, начиная с эпохи Ренессанса, Собственно, полностью совпадает с тем, что Шкловский определяет как автоматизированное восприятие, узнавание, сводящее мир к абстракциям, растворяющее частное в общем и отвлеченном, сингулярное в регулярном, редуцирующее субъекта к фиксированной точке зрения, зрение, направленного на не менее фиксированный и стабильный мир. Напротив, остраняющее видение должно вернуть человеку его, ну, как минимум, бинокулярно. Оно исходит из того, что в движении пребывает и воспринимаемый мир, и воспринимающий его субъект. Вместо статичной точки зрения, этого автоматизированного узнавания, оно задает э, динамичное поле зрения, пространство, в котором субъект взаимодействует с воспринимаемым им миром, обнаруживая при этом как его, так и свою собственную конструкцию. Таким образом, э, в критике автоматизированного восприятия Критики практического языка, экономящего психофизические усилия, можно опознать полемику с доминирующей в рамках нового временной культуры э, и нового временного буржуазного индивида символической формой, заключенной в прямой перспективе. Едва ли не основной сверхзадачей термоавтобиографической трилогии Шкловского является возвращение вот этого непосредственного переживания пространства, обнажение пронизывающих его исторических и социокультурных, политических и биографических разрывов, различий между впереди и позади, справа и слева, телами и промежутками между ними, говоря словами Пановского. 
Оптика Шкловского предполагает деформированную, сфероидальную форму, заданную подвижности его взгляда, отличающегося таким характерным, остраняющим астигматизмом, способностью видеть мир и одновременно различать то, что обычно выступает как слепое пятно любого взгляда, то есть ту самую точку зрения, с которой исходит прямая перспектива. Эту динамичную модель видения сам Шкловский описал следующим образом, в сентиментальном путешествии, довольно известная фраза, когда падаешь камнем, то не нужно думать, когда думаешь, то не нужно падать. Я смешал два ремесла. Я только падающий камень, камень, который падает и может в то же время зажечь фонарь, чтобы наблюдать свой путь. Да, значит, соответственно, возникает и значит, точка зрения, обращенная к окружающему и одновременно обращенная к, на саму себя, на свое собственное движение. Да. В середине 60-х в очередном предисловии к ЦО Кловский дает еще один вариант этого динамического восприятия исторического пространства, в котором движение субъекта накладывается на движение самого зрительного поля, внутри которого он находится. Цитирую. Человек один идет по льду, вокруг него туман, ему кажется, что он идет прямо, ветер разгонит туман, человек видит цель, видит свои следы. Оказывается, льдина плыла и поворачивалась. След запутан в узел, человек заблудился. В этом образе человека, прокладывающего свой путь по движущейся льдине, Шковский дает свое понимание тех трудностей, которые представляет собой навигация в пространстве истории. Характерные для автобиографической и мемуарной рефлексии Шковского мотивы да, ошибки, заблуждения, вины, неудачи являются почти неизбежным выводом из этой пространственной метафоры исторического движения и из того понимания перспективы, которая ее обосновывает. Собственно, именно эта оптика и приводит к постоянному возвращению разговора, к разговору об ошибке, заблуждении, вине, неудаче, случайности, о человеке не на своем месте, о несходстве сходного, как о единственно адекватных топосах описания человеческой субъектности, как о единственном возможном месте встречи фабулы и сюжета, материала и формы, истории и биографии, пространства и времени, теории и прозы. Чувствительность к тому факту, что биографическая траектория пролегает в пространстве, которое само пребывает в движении, позволяет Шкловскому избежать многих иллюзий и претензий мемуарного жанра, постоянно монтируя его с теоретической рефлексией. Найденный в сентиментальном путешествии прием находит место и в тетиве. Меняется лишь соотношение материалов, да, биографических и теоретических, и временная дистанция. При этом сохраняется характерная бинокулярность, одновременно раскалывающая фигуру повествователя и структуру повествования между исторической, так сказать, биографической и теоретической, литературовеческой точками зрения, и собирающая их в общее поле зрения. Если автоматизированное узнавание можно сопоставить с гегемонной э, оптической системой центральной прямой перспективы, то остраняющее видение можно сопоставить с ушедшей на периферию культуры архаической средневековой оптикой обратной иконной перспективы. Таким образом, для моей как бы, собственной оптики чтения э, тетивы именно глава о конвенции, да, в которой Шкловский приводит основные принципы этой символической формы, или особой орфографии, как называет ее Флоренский, является как бы, выдвинутой смысловой деталью, дающей еще один ключ к описанию специфики предложенного русскими формалистами теоретического сдвига. При этом Шкловский ссылается не только на работы э, Лихачева да, в русской э, литературе, написанной примерно в то же самое время, что и его собственная книга, э, «Тетива» я имею в виду, но и на работы, относящиеся к ушедшей Апаязовской эпохе, к которой он постоянно обращается. А таким образом, вновь создается наложение друг на друга различных временных пластов, создающих общее теоретическое пространство. А это, прежде всего, работа Флоренского 19 -го года «Обратная перспектива», а также работа Льва Жегина, художника, теоретика искусства, сына архитектора Франца Шехтеля, проектом которого, кстати, часто обращался Шкловский в поисках архитектурных метафор к своим построениям. В 20-е годы Жегин разработал собственную теорию обратной перспективы, 
Отдельно его статьи стали выходить в 60-е годы в трудах Тарковского университета, собственно, определив интерес Успенского к икодной семиотике. И в том же году, то есть в 70-м году, что и книга Шкловского под редакцией Успенского выходит и книга умершего годом ранее Жегина язык живописного произведения. Описывая принципы иконописной перспективы, Шкловский, по сути, воспроизводит принципы своей собственной поэтики мемуарно-теоретического монтажа. Первое, ну, я цитирую тут Шкловского. А на одной картине могло быть несколько времен и несколько пространств. Картине, ну, как бы иконописно, да? Несколько времен давалось для того, чтобы показать разные моменты такого действия, которое происходит в разное время. Дальше. Еще один момент, который в равной степени коррелирует и с иконописанной перспективой, и с практикой самого Шкловского. Сопоставление предметов, их масштабов и ракурсов их рассмотрения исходит не из гомогенной геометрической перспективы, а из их сущности, из их взаимной важности. Да, и определенная деталь выдвигается на, пример, на передний план независимо от абстрактного как бы, реализма прямой перспективы, что позволяет выявить конструктивный принцип вещи. Шкловский вообще в целом постоянно прибегает к, в этой книге к образным тематизациям переворачивания перспективы, которую он предъявляет как способ обновить восприятие предмета и обнажить его конструкцию. Тут и пример Серовского портрета Ермоловой, который разбирает Эйнштейн в монтаже, да, и который вслед за ним разбирает, повторяет Шкловский. Пример Левитана, который переворачивает, переворачивает свои пейзажи, чтобы убедиться в верности цветовой композиции в отрыве от как бы, реалистического миметизма. Или экспликация собственного аналитического приема. Шкловский говорит о том, что он задействует это переворачивание бинокля, позволяющего посмотреть на прошлое из перспективы настоящей, скажем так. Предлагаю анализ сказки, исходя не из законов архаики, а из законов современного искусства. Вот это как бы выдвинутая деталь, ну, как бы один из примеров, на который хотел бы я обратить внимание, это деталь с, ну, условно, деталь с пеплом. Значит, Шкловский неоднократно и в, и в «Жили-были», и в «Сентиментальном путешествии», и в «Тетиве» вспоминает, ну, особенно применительно к Ихенбауму, иногда применительно к себе, про, про эти печки, которые они топили книгами. Да, и вот этот пепел, у которого они грелись, перерабатывая, перерабатывая чужие книги в собственные, в собственные тексты, да, порождая новые из этой, значит, из, ну, как бы, да, отрицания. Здесь тоже несколько раз встречается этот образ с сжиганием и, и пеплом, и есть, если вы помните, есть тоже довольно развернуто на несколько страниц постоянно обращение к этому главе «Человек не на своем месте», тоже к такой тематизации пепла как мусора огня, пепла как знака унижения и пепла как знак, отсылающего к этим неподающим надежды ну, лузерам, да, вот к этим младшим сыновьям, дуракам, значит, да, сиротам, золушкам, к этим зачастую плешивым героям. Ну, я думаю, что тут да, вполне прозрачные, как бы, да, Я не всегда не Или меня смотрит. А, вот. А я, я смотрю на Сергея, и Сергей смотрит правильно. Да, вот такая как раз тоже сложная оптическая конструкция. Я оглянулся посмотреть. Да. Вот. Значит, вот эти вот. Люди не на своем месте, вот, да, эти плешивцы, паршивцы, сироты, золушки, гадкие э, утята, э, как, вот эти люди не на своем месте, которые, э, собственно, э, вот это их да, неудача э, и делает их да, принадлежащими истории, литературе. Да-да-да, кстати, это те самые субалтерные, я не знаю, будешь ли ты, Кирилл, как бы, да, вот, обращаться к плешивцам, паршивцам в своем 
докладе, но в принципе, да, это вот все, значит, периферийные субалтерны, которые и, значит, ну и в сказке, и в литературной теории Апояза, собственно, и несут в себе эволюционный потенциал истории, искусства, политики, чего угодно. Кстати, в этом смысле я бы немного поспорил с интерпретацией этого, этой сцены с Икенбаумом, его смерти во время, точнее, после выступления на вечере Марингофа, мне это как раз не кажется, что, что Шловский уничтожает и Кенбаум или уничтожает и Нянова. То есть вот это вот их, ну, в некотором смысле, незадачливость, неудачливость, несвоевременность, нелепость да, какая-то определенная, собственно, и делает их вот носителями этого эволюционного потенциала. Но вот... Ихенбаум, у которого, значит, вначале умирает ну, вот один ребенок, потом другой гибнет под Сталинградом, Шковский, у которого сын гибнет под Калининградом, ну, Кенигсбергом, да, значит, а, а, Мариенгов, а, который а, у Шковского, да, значит, превращается в хорошего поэта, который начал писать скетчи, собственно, ну, вот как бы на этом действительно критика Мариенгова, и а, заканчивается Мариенгов которого, да, казалось бы, с одной стороны, уничтожает Шковский вот этим безымянным э, перефразом, да, хороший поэт, э, начавший э, писать э, скетчи. Маринбов, у которого тоже, значит, да, в 40 году самоубивается э, сын, да, который там, да, всеми признается очень талантливым, там, начинающим поэтом э, и так далее. Маринбов, который, кстати говоря, тоже к вопросу о конформизме, э, а мне кажется, что ну, Шловский никогда не пугал конформизм. Это можно ему, конечно, обращать в вину, но конформизм, э, в том смысле, оборотная сторона деформации. Да? Деформация э, – фундаментальный принцип э, э, апоязовской как бы, поэтики, апоязовской э, теории. В этом смысле э, конформизм, конформность, да, как бы деформация, возникающая в результате ну, как бы напряженных отношений человека с соседним там историко-политическим рядом, это да, это может быть этическая проблема для либеральной интеллигенции, присутствующей, вероятно, и в этом зале тоже. Но вот, я, я, собственно, ну вот, но, но как конструктивный, да, ну я опять же, я не к тому, что мы, так сказать, выбрасываем нравственность корабля современности, вот, но к тому, как, что как конструктивный принцип, да, Шкловский, безусловно, не, как бы, ну, не застенчив в отношении конформизма, как то, что нужно стыдливо скрывать. И, кстати говоря, Марингов, да, значит, что тут может иметь Марингов, в 1948 году пишет пьесу, посвященную борьбе с космополитизмом. И, и как бы еще и неудача в том, что прогиб не, не был зачтен, пьесу не приняли к постановке. То есть это как бы такая как бы, двойная неудача, которая при этом не, ну, как бы не делает Мурингофа, вот, не выключает его из ряда людей не на своем месте. В этом смысле оставляет его в истории литературы. Вот. И как бы вечер одного но ну, условно неудачника, на котором неудачно выступает э, другой, ну, как бы, ладно, ради красного слова, другой неудачник, да, э, после чего, ну, да, ну, конечно, неудачник, но вы понимаете, о чем я говорю, да, вот, э, на самом деле, э, собственно, и, э, э, да, как бы, и делает их э, теми, о ком, ну, как бы, стоит писать, с кем вообще, о ком можно разговаривать. Значит, вот эта вот деформация, о которой я сказал в связи с да, вот этой выдвинутой тоже деформирующей деталью с пеплом, которая коррелирует да, между географической деталью в случае с Ахинбаумом, Памутыняновым и теоретическим как бы, мотивом, связанным с описанием там, различных нарративных конструкций через который Шкловский показывает да, вот этот, как бы, динамизм, эту, этот, его, да, потенциал несовпадения энергии, без которого не может существовать ни история, ни литература. Все это, конечно, чрезвычайно характерно для той оптической деформации, которая специфична для иконописной обратной перспективы. 
обращаюсь к Флоренскому, уже как бы к самой его работе «Обратная перспектива», значит, где он пишет, что при нормальности луча зрения к фасаду изображаемых зданий у них бывают показаны совместно обе боковые стены. Да? У Евангелия видны сразу три или даже четыре обреза. Лицо изображается семенем, висками и ушами, отвернутыми вперед и как бы распластанными, распластанными на плоскости иконы, с повернутыми к зрителю плоскостями носа и других частей лица, которые не должны были бы быть э, показаны. Довольно, кстати, похоже на то, каким образом Ранний Шкловский описывает поэтику футуризма с этими как бы разломанными словами, разломанными, э, расплющенными э, образами и лицами. Значит, чем это определено в иконописной перспективе? Это определено тем, что, э, э, цитирую Флоренского, опять же, как ближайшее распространение приемов обратной перспективы следует отметить разноцентренность в изображении. То есть сумок строится так, как если бы на разные части его глаз смотрел, меняя свое место. И э, Флоренский, э, задаваясь вопросом, э, Задается вопросом о том, что, как бы, возможно, иконная перспектива э, может быть как бы, своей как он пишет, транскрипцией более связан с существом дела, да, вот с, этой, как бы, с этой остраняющей э, попыткой проникнуть в э, ну, какую-то сущностную конструкцию э, изображаемого. И дальше пишет. Во всяком случае, так, что нарушение этой... Э, Значит, перспективы, имеется в виду прямой, хотя бы столь же мало мешает художественной силе изображений, как грамматические ошибки в письме святого человека, жизненной правде, излагаемого им опыта. Последнее, что я хочу сделать, это отождествить Шкловского с святым человеком, но все мы тоже хорошо помним его рефлексию об остранении как результате грамматической ошибки значит неграмотного студента, который пропустил лишнее, лишнее N. То есть не лишнее, просто необходимое. Да, нужное N. Да, так что тоже, значит, вот. Мне уже сворачивает. Ну, хорошо, тут есть еще о чем говорить, но перейду к, ну, да, к завершению. Собственно, как бы тоже для Флоренского это различие и противопоставление между прямой и обратной перспективой, ну да, как символическими формами, за которыми стоят разные как бы, типы культур. Есть тоже попытка, что подвергнуть критике вот ту как вы прямо пишут, да, буржуазную цивилизацию второй половины XIX века, которая основывалась на этом кантовском, значит, индивиде, на этом кантовском трансцендентальном субъекте с, с теми как бы, экономическими формами жизни, с этой экономической рациональностью, которая исходит из этой калькулируемости, математичности, абстрактности, нейтральности, пространства и прозрачности там, субъекта для него самого. Разумеется, Шкловский в то же самое время, ну там Флоренский 19 Шкловский там на пару лет раньше, из, обращается к критике той же самой как бы, кантовской буржуазной субъектности, разумеется, с другой несколько перспективы, чем, чем Флоренский, хотя тоже ну, вот этот как бы, консервативный элемент революционности Шкловского тоже не стоит ну, сбрасывать со счетов. Значит, и в заключение, вот тот тип перспективы, который практикует Шкловский, совмещая и смещая различные точки зрения, переписывая чужие позиции, создает особое пространство, которое, тут тоже я реагирую на то, что мы обсуждали сегодня, создает особое пространство, которое как бы сверхкомпенсирует то, что утрачено в смысле линейной временной хронологии помещая вот это утраченное с точки зрения как бы, времени да, в такое пространство, которое не предполагает конца. А время, превращенное в пространство, оказывается нелинейно и в этом смысле бесконечно. Да, мертвые умирают не сразу, пишет он в 70-м году. Через 10 лет, когда выходит 81-го энергия заблуждения, 
Через лет Шкловский еще более оптимистичен, еще более радикальный, говоря о том, что ничего не умирает вообще. Да? То есть у него уже как бы, как бы ну, все настолько серьезно, что у него уже нет, ему уже некуда отступать. Да? То есть вот мертвые умирают не сразу, это уже не позиция Шкловского 80-го. 80-го это еще можно было допустить, в 81-м уже нет. Значит, а, а, камень долговечен, да, действительно. То есть образ, возникший в раннем манифесте, повторяется в поздней книге, Создавая ну, как такую систему зеркал, которые отражение прошлого и настоящего умножаются. Причем, в отличие от эхо, не затухают, но создают такую бесконечную оптическую реверберацию. И в отсутствии прямой центральной перспективы конца действительно не будет. И не может быть, поскольку в такой оптической системе нет точки схода, то есть конца. Вот как раз к тому, что ты сказал про точку схода, как бы, мне кажется, возвращаясь к тому, с чего ты начал, про узнавание. Мне кажется, что как раз в этой книге он несколько меняет понимание узнавания, поскольку вот на 127 странице и далее он пишет об узнавании как мифе о возможности счастья, с одной стороны, то, что, что конечно, задает временную перспективу, на мой взгляд. Да? И, с одной стороны, это перспектива в будущее, но, с другой стороны, конечно, он показывает это как, как так сказать, самый древний троп, да, который повторяется во всех сказать, античных текстах, но, но потом возвращается в пьесе по новелле Сервантеса, которая ш- недавно шла у нас в цыганском театре Ромен. Да, ну, то, есть, как бы, то, то, что становится самым банальным. Но, но все равно это перспектива. Mm-hmm. Вот, то есть, и, и действительно с ней спорить, спорить, но не как с пространственным понятием, как с временным, так сказать, теорологическим понятием. Mm-hmm. Да. Я понимаю, что кто про что вшиво про баню, но... но э, да, в данном случае вот именно в этом абзаце, там, в, этой, в этом фрагменте, э, как бы как противопоставление узнаванию появляется фигура Плута, он говорит сначала про Апулея, и Апулея – это человек на своем месте, а потом неожиданно, он, ну неожиданно, логично, переходит к Жильблазу, и про него он пишет следующее, я читал много раз, он только вот сейчас как-то понял, что, что он пишет, он меняет тысячу мест и, наконец, становится мужем чужой любовницы, про Жильблазу можно сказать много вещей, и это как бы наименьшее, что можно о нем сказать. До этого он проходит все круги, являясь свидетелем преступления, но все время остается Плутон, не участвуя в преступлении. Пока в жизни Плутон становится как бы отдыхом, вроде присутствия при карточной игре, читательский интерес переходит не к счастливой, но условной развязке, а к показу обычной и бесчеловечной жизни. Вот, ну, во-первых, вот это вот как бы эта фигура Плута, как ни странно, это не человек не на своем месте, а человек, у которого вообще нет места, и с другой стороны, все места его. Да, в том числе и э, муж чужой любовницы, что, собственно, э, Петер Борисович, женившись на Серфиме Густавовне, так сказать, подтвердил с блеском. А, вот. а с, с другой стороны, вот здесь отказ от узнавания – это показ обычной бесчеловечной жизни. Вот это условие как бы, внимания к <coughs> настоящему и прошлому, как обычной бесчеловечной жизни, мне кажется, это что-то новое, чего, чего не было в других его э, вещах. Да, очень интересно. Ну, э, тоже, как, и, как, ага. и последнее, что не участие в преступлении. Вот это алиби. Угу. Это очень важное алиби. Ну да. Э, тоже, поскольку это ну, не, не вопрос, то я как, ну, такой да. пинкод. Ну, да. да. э, э, что это не ответ. Это не трубка. Значит, по поводу начнем с узнавания. Да. Тут любопытный э, момент, я о нем не думал, но вот э, по сути э, то узнавание, о котором пишет э, Шкловский в э, Титиве, это даже не амоним того узнавания, о котором он пишет в искусстве как прием, а я бы сказал антоним. Значит, но то узнавание было основано на вот этом как бы автоматизированном, э, схематичном, вот этом рациональном опознании как бы место на том привычном месте, вещи на том привычном месте, на котором она и должна была находиться. 
Здесь узнавание связано с как раз преодолением препятствий, преодолением трудностей, ну как там, с Одиссеем, ну и со всеми теми многочисленными примерами, которые он приводит. То есть здесь узнавание как раз работает как то, что у раннего школьства было предъявлено как видение, ну то есть как, как остранение, да, да. как... как как не сходство сходного, да, как вот это вот э, различие между э, э, значит, привычным и, э, и, и странным. Да? Вот. То есть здесь как раз узнавание э, требует усилия, а не связано с экономией. Он. Ну, то есть mm. узнавание доступно не любому. Да? То есть узнавание э, связано с способностью увидеть как раз некую метанимическую деталь, да, по которой это узнавание, ну, вот это там одежка, слова, там, документы, ну, вот это все эти многочисленные примеры, которые он а, приводит. Что касается вот действительно этой а, типологии, которая не позволяет ну, как бы одну кучу свалить а, фигуру человека не на, одну, не на своем месте и фигуру там, условно жильблаза, плута, трикстера. Я тут а, согласен. А, возможно, что а, ну, это просто так вот да, продолжая реагировать на твой комментарий, безусловно, ну, в том смысле, да, ну, апологетизирую эту фигуру человека не на своем месте и, и себя тоже, в общем, ставит в этот ряд. Шкловский над ним надстраивает еще одну как бы, возможную метапозицию, которую он резервирует, действительно, уже в отличие от всех остальных людей не на своем месте, Тунянова, там, Кинбаума, которые исключены за собой. Да? А, и это фигура а, а, Плута. Да? Ну, то есть фигура а, человека, у которого действительно нет а, места и все места а, его. Такого, как бы, одновременно все присутствующего и, а, и отсутствующего. Я в то время как бы, тоже писал про этот а, но а, принцип а, ну, как бы, даже, даже жизненного успеха Шкловского, но принцип а, его ну, как бы не схватываем, ну, вот, да, его ускользание от, там, от, 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 от его алиби. Да, да, его алиби. Тем, что он просто, потому что его не нужно искать, потому что он все время, все время здесь, да, вот, как бы такая противоположная по отношению к Бахтину, например, позиция, вот, а вот ненаходимость, да, где Бахтин? Как бы? Саранский. Слушай, кто в Саранске, то там, значит, где-то под Рязани, то в Кустанае, то как бы, то есть это... А вот. ответственность с ним? А ответственность с ним, да. Ну вот. А, а тут, значит, тут другое. Тут шкловский везде. Ну, Мне интересно, что ты вернулся к названию «Архаистый инноватор». В каком-то смысле. Потому что и вернулся, не называя этого, поселив шкловского футуризма. А, и, но в другом смысле, чем а, которые вернули, вдруг перевернули эту стандартизированную линейную а, концепцию мира во всех областях, будь это строчка Гутенбердовского печатного текста, будь это понятие перспективы пространства, будь это понятие времени как точка прошлого и так далее, когда футуристы все это разрушили, пространство мозаично, кубистично, а время симультанно, а конца нет, мир с конца, все это мы переворачиваем, как хотим. Вот. И там поселяет Ишкловский, совершенно не подозревая, что в 1908 году вся эта история с архаичным сознанием, которое пространственно уже написано одним французским антропологом, который даже не отправился в Бразилию, чтобы изучать там все эти архаичные племена, но опубликовал это. И, и для меня интересно, что Ишкловский не знает этого, он все знает только орально. Сначала орально из других источников, например, из Эйзенштейна, которого очень много в этой книге Тетива, не только в примере с Ермоловой, но в очень многих других. Он цитирует Эйзенштейна неверно, он обрывает все концы и начала, эти цитаты неузнаваемы. Сначала я хотела на этом построить доклад, потом забыла, потому что это не так важно разбираться в этих цитатах и неправильно поднятых, но к чему я хочу э, привести э, свое, э, свое, свое э, длинное отступление к э, вопросу о метафоре и памяти. Э, ты берешь пепел как метафору 
памяти и возможности. Для меня очень сомнительно, потому что обычно метафоры памяти, вспоминаем Адорна, связанные с холодом, водой и льдом и снегом, теми как бы, материальными феноменами, которые растворяются, с одной стороны, ты не можешь писать на воде, ты не можешь писать на снеге, но они трансформируются постоянно. И в какой-то момент могут стать чем-то твердым, на котором угу. возможно что-то написать, и тут же это превратится. Но с пеплом это невозможно Слушайте, сделать. Оксан, нет, не совсем так. Для меня пепел встраивается не в, этот, не в эту метафорику памяти, то есть не вот не знаю, Дорну, ну, как бы, скорее, там, Агамбиновскую, Дередерианскую, как бы, да, э, э, для меня, ну, в смысле, как мне кажется, для Шкловского, да, это метафорика не памяти, а, ну, скажем, депривированности, да, как бы, пепел – это, ну, как бы, вот, не знаю, как пиво, хлеб для бедных, да, то есть, вот, э, Пепел это то, что доста... ну, то есть это то, что достается вот этим нищим, которые вот этой золушке, которая не может греться у огня, она залезает как бы в пепел, да? то есть то, что остается, то есть, вот для... то есть это можно сказать, сказать в каком смысле, что это память, но знаешь, в каком? Вот пепел как, как мусор, да? другая ваза, вот, ну, как то, что ну, у Шковского это там, пепел это мусор, и мусор в том смысле, в каком э, у них же, ну, у раннего школьского там, да, вот мусор, вот эта как бы, периферия, вот эти там младшие низкие э, жанры, э, как бы выкинутые вот на обочину, на помойку, да, э, вот этот компост, э, э, значит, оттуда как раз и рождается, ну, как бы новое, новый исторический, там, эволюционный э, литературно-поэтический потенциал, да, вот, в этом смысле, конечно, можно сказать, что, ну, мусор, пепел, это как бы отсылает к какой-то памяти, но именно в том смысле, что это память, ну, как бы не кристаллизованная, а превращенная в, ну, как бы как раз пере, пере, как бы перелопаченная, не знаю, перетасованная, ну, вот, утратившая свой вот этот конструктивный кристаллический каркас, как у снега, льда там, да, и так далее. Ну, вот, и концентрирующий в себе ну, вот, да, материал для будущей э, э, переработки. И вот э, в этом вот эти плешивцы и паршивцы, э, золушки, значит, из, измазанные в пепле, ну, вот, они-то и, э, собственно, являются субъектами истории, ну, вот, вот этими ну, как бы, да, неудачниками, вот эти Пенянов с прогрессирующим склерозом, да, который из-за этого не дописывает роман о Пушкине, который как бы и невозможно было бы дописать. То есть в этом смысле, а что бы, был, а что бы делал Пенянов, если бы у него не было прогрессирующего склероза? Тогда бы у него не было никаких отмазок, почему его роман о Пушкине так и оказался незавершен. Потому что, как пишет Шковский, ну, завершить роман о Пушкине как бы невозможно. Это вот, значит, как бы тотальность, не подлежащая объективации. Ну вот, поэтому... И, и смерти вот как бы тоже такая как бы и ранняя и такая как бы странная экзотическая болезнь тоже делает как раз вот Тынянова этой как бы образцовой фигурой там, не знаю, интеллектуала теоретика и поэта одновременно как не знаю неудачники Фильбекер которым занимается Тынянов то есть это, конечно, тоже переходит в эту проблематику традицию угнетенных ну как бы Бениаминовскую и как бы задачи и миссии дать им голос, как бы это миссия Тынянова по отношению к Пихельбекеру, это как бы миссия Шкловского по отношению к Тынянову, по отношению к себе, как будто Шкловский сам эту миссию будет Значит, мне кажется, что э, здесь важно продолжать, продолжать обсуждение этой метафоры. Э, мы можем вернуться, например, к стихотворению Бродского, только пепел знает, что значит гореть до тла, и э, обнаружить в этой, которая, очевидно, не была вызвана влиянием Шковского, на мой взгляд. Вот, но э, здесь важно использовать вот мысли э, и рассмотрение пепла, как не только символа памяти, но и символа значение памяти, обозначение свободы. Дрожь, это очень сильно на этом настаивает. Мне кажется, что вот это вот 
быть младшим и быть неудачником для Рожковского, конечно, имело тоже, конечно, в меньшей степени, чем для Бродского, но тоже имело оттенок быть свободным от, от, от разного рода исторического закономерия. Вот второе, значит, по поводу, собственно, той интерпретации смерти Эйчинбаума, по поводу которой ты не возразил, я э, позволю себе это прокомментировать. Значит, мне кажется, что для Шкловского... Э, вот я бы хотел как бы сказать, тут сосходить по поводу интерпретации пульфанизма и по поводу интерпретации собственной смерти Эйчинбаума тоже. Значит, безусловно, ты прав, когда ты говоришь, что значит, вот эта вот некоторая нелепость смерти Эйчинбаума и странной смерти Дынянова является косвенным доказательством от правоты. Но все-таки, конечно, действительно использовал тут сравнение для красного словца, Майенгов являлся человеком на своем месте в другом совершенно смысле, чем Эйхенбаум. Здесь это нужно аналитически развести. Ну, для меня, по крайней мере. Потому что, и я, собственно, сказал, Аркане, что Шкловский уничтожает Майенгов в гораздо, больше, как, в гораздо более сильном смысле слова, чем Эйхенбаум, и я объясню, в каком. Значит, дело в том, что значит, для Шкловского понятие конформизма было продуктивным, на мой взгляд, в его книгах 20-х годов, когда он объяснял, что нужно приспособиться к своему времени. Значит, после, вот насколько я могу судить, после все-таки сталинского времени возникает, когда все знали, кто что делал, ну, в этом кругу, возникает большая фигура умолчания. То есть для Шкловского все-таки было важно, что я думаю, что он об этом думал, и для него это было проблемой, которую он никогда бы не стал называть вслух, что он и с одной стороны, и Маренгов с той же стороны старались приспособиться, хотя у Маренгов это плохо получалось, в гораздо большей степени, чем Эхенбаум. И для Шкловского, я думаю, здесь было важно продумать для себя, на каких правах он может принять интеллектуальную эстафету у Дынянова и Эйхенбаума. И вот те интеллектуальные ходы, которые ты анализируешь, на мой взгляд, и были проработки вот этого вопроса. Ну, не будем углубляться, потому что я думаю, тут как бы, да, это здесь дискуссия бесконечна. Я бы только тут про 20-е годы внес бы коллектив, что тут все-таки не про Шловский, ну, там, например, третьи фаб... фабрики. Да, 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 конечно, я понимаю, да, что третьи фабрики, конечно, говорит не про не про приспособление к времени. Да? Вот это скрещивание с материалом – это не, при, не приспособление, это другая процедура. Да? Вот. А, вот то, что пришлось сделать, может, в 30-е, больше похоже на приспособление, чем то, на что… То есть скрещивание с материалом а, – а, это все-таки ну, процедура, где ну, как бы субъект сохранит свою субъектность. Да? А, Приспособ... да. Да. Приспособление – это все сложнее, хотя, на самом деле, если бы вот мы… Там, может быть, в будущем почитали бы его работу 30-х годов, вот какие-то такие, ну, которые считаются типа там отпетыми такими, да, вот, а, то, может быть, и там бы все оказалось, вот действительно, и в дневнике, и в поисках оптимизма, а, и в Паденщине все тоже оказывается на самом деле не так, как бы приспособленчески просто и сопряж... не, не так сопряжено с создачей позиции, так же, как и памятник научной ошибки, конечно, чрезвычайно как бы субверсивная вещь в своей основе, хотя уж казалось бы, куда дальше, просто как бы жанр вот этих как бы покаянных значит, выступлений и посыпаний головы пеплом, только уже в другом, в другом смысле. Вот. Я, конечно, я думаю, что Шковский не мог ну, как бы не думать обо всем вот этом, просто потому что его постоянно ну, в этом как бы многие обвиняли. Но я не вижу, честно, и про умолчание тоже мы понимаем, что, ну, а вообще, вообще какая без них, там, в том числе поздняя советская литература, может быть. Но все же я не вижу в его поздней прозе вот этой фигуры, ну, как бы оправдания, ну, в смысле, попытки оправдаться. Ну, вот, мне кажется, что, по крайней мере, вот публично, да, в своих текстах он выбирает какую-то другую другую стратегию. Вот. Но это как бы, отдельно. Это действительно бесконечный разговор, но нужно было обозначить вот и эту анфиладу. Анфиладу. Прямой перспективе. У меня вопрос, да, про перспективы и про оптику. Сдохни, превращающий ничего хорошего. Да, да. 
Нет, то есть я понимаю, то, что ты пытаешься делать, и то, что он делает, да, то есть это противопоставить прямой перспективу, перспективу обратную, и многие это делают, и это занятно. А мне кажется, что, что мне кажется, что можно сделать это более а, 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 радикально, что ли. В 25 году а, Лисицкий, который в свое время а, делал ножку для ЦОО, да, пишет статью там, «Геометрия искусства», где он говорит, mm -hmm. что где он вообще их совмещает. Обратно это как всего, это говорит, что это, в принципе, это такая функция особого, один и тот же случай. Просто мы можем mm -hmm. смотреть на это с разных сторон. Он говорит, что ну, мы пойдем, конечно, другим путем, мы пойдем более радикальным и а, четкотим, мы поставим аксонометрию. Да? Аксонометрия. Но фокус не только в том, чтобы поставить, понимаешь, да? Если он дальше идет и говорит, что, слушайте, он же все эти проводы все еще рисует, я говорю, что проблема не в том, чтобы, так сказать, поставить одну оптику, другую оптику и так далее, да? Проблема в том, чтобы совместить их в одном, в одной рамке и постоянно передвигать свою оптическую грамотность от одной перспективного взгляда на взгляд да. абсолютной перспективы. Okay. И на мой взгляд, вот то, что он делает в степени вето, оно как раз вот и совмещение и перспективы, и то, и другое. Но плюс аксонометрия. Почему проблема? Почему аксонометрия? Как в риторической примере, как способ вот, строения, это интересен. Он как раз предполагает отсутствие полного конца и начала, потому что аксонометрия двигается в любую сторону. В сторону, то, что нам лисицкий показывает, проблема даже не в этом. Проблема в том, что в аксонометрии ты помещаешь себя в обувь вот этого вот двигающегося, так сказать, потока, да, туда или сюда, и ты так сосматриваешь все изнутри, что называется, да. То есть ты уходишь от того, как ты, если ты в перспективе, то ты, значит, оказываешься в поле зрения, в обратной перспективе ты, собственно, становишься полем зрения, да, а в аксонометрии ты тот блуждающий зрачок. Да? И для Лисицкого это принципиально вот с его проунок, что, так сказать, постоянно, но там еще интересно, потому что это визуально, да? там идет постоянно тот шифт от, от, от двухмерного к трехмерному, от двухмерного к трехмерному, и ты не можешь, если ты хочешь понять картинку того, как работает проунок, проект установленного, ты не можешь просто остаться стабильным. Ну да. И, в принципе, мне кажется, в пяти лет это как раз вот в чем вот фокус и, и обескураживающий воздействие, тем, что мы не понимаем, когда происходит в двери от перспективы аксонометрии назад, да? А он нас вынуждает это делать, и это нас ставит и в тупик с одной стороны, и какое-то недоумение, да? То есть зачем он все это нам делает, не, не говоря при этом. Да, нет, спасибо, Сергей. Я э, с радостью э, подумаю вот, над этим. Э, угу. А можно вам тут... Нет, нет, но я... Э, но... Но то, как там Флоренский или Жегин потом вслед за ним там, за ними там Успенский описывают иконную там, обратную перспективу, есть вот это совмещение прямой обратной. То есть в этой как бы обратной есть как бы взаимодействие этих двух перспектив. На самом деле они не как бы не противостоят друг другу как тезис, а антитезис. В каком смысле иконная является, ну тоже, ну не синтезом, потому что слияние не происходит, да, как бы сохраняющего снятия не происходит. Но они там все существуют. Да? То есть, поэтому, когда я говорю про икону и множественных точек зрения, да, ну вот, это не, не то, что отменяет прямую перспективу. Они там действительно комбинируются в очень сложном образом, точно так же, как то, как то есть, Флоренский и Жегин описывают иконную перспективу, это именно тот случай, когда наблюдатель помещен внутрь того как бы, движения, которое он наблюдает и описывает, внутрь того там, как бы, временного там, повествования, которое он пытается схватить через этот тип там, символической формы и так далее. Так что тут тоже Лисицкий, скажем, предлагая ну, ну, как бы, не знаю, там, терминологический концептуальный апгрейд, в принципе, не то чтобы ну, делать что-то принципиально новое по отношению к... Я даже не поручусь, как не специалист по иконе, не по отношению к иконе, но по отношению к концептуализации иконы, у Флоренца Тарабукина можно э, вспомнить, э, значит, у того же Жегина. Вот, так что, э, так что, в принципе, это все равно все остается, ну, вот, в пределах, э, э, ну, то есть я с тобой согласен, да, я к чему э, это говорю, ну, вот, э, спасибо за вопрос, поскольку он э, позволяет, э, почему-то то, что, наверное, у меня 
как бы смелость, что вот это э, обратное, это не, э, ну, как бы не, как это, не контрарная позиция по отношению к прямой, не бинарная, да, да, не бинарная значит, позиция, да, а э, как бы система, которая включает э, да, две, две э, модели да, оптические. Оксана, ты говоришь? Я был вопрос к тебе, ага. но это совсем замечательно. Прелесть там этого права на резидку, конечно, в том, что телесно ты не можешь это понять. Если там присутствует тело, то это все. Чуть Только не глаз, не который не может... Не а аж плоский слишком тело. Даже камень – это тело. Да? Угу. Ты не можешь вот. абстрагироваться от глаза. Нет. И Нет. это, конечно... Эм... Ты про метафорику говоришь. Я говорю про то, как он монтажирует, как пишет эту книгу, когда он переходит вот от, 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 одной, от одного способа восприятия или рассказывает да. другое и так далее. То есть, мне кажется, вот это вот важно. И так как раз почему возникает вот это недоумение. Вообще, что это такое mm -hmm. с точки зрения жанра? Как, как оно возникает у Лисицкого? Мне очень непонятно, как, это, как, как я должен себя позиционировать, чтобы понять, как это работает. И выясняется, что нет вот этой стабильности, потому что на этом построен вот весь этот... Вот ты должен постоянно переходить из 2D в 3D, и да. они, не, они не совмещаются. Они просто не совмещаются. Ты должен отключать одну возможность и переходить в другую, оптическую. Да. Ну, что бы я еще хотел подчеркнуть, если можно, это то, что, ну вот, пробрасывая к предыдущим докладам и дискуссиям вокруг них, что как раз, как мне кажется, в этом ну, изначально характерном для как бы, фигуры мысли Паяза и Шковского, в частности, этот перевод разговора о времени и линейности в термины пространства и монтажа нелинейности, и есть, ну, как бы, секрет того, ну, не знаю, там, воскрешающего отрицания, там, да, значит, ну, как бы того удержания при отказе, вот, и того, не знаю, там, э, э, В общем, вот, вот этих всех э, парадоксальных э, конструкций, где, с одной стороны, как бы листья облетают и никуда не исчезают, и, и как бы даже не падают. Ну, то есть, вот это как вот с этим... Э, надо мной, чтобы вечно зеленее, но вот, вот чтобы этот дуб склонялся, склонялся, но так и не падал никогда, потому что это же тоже странно, как у Лермонтова модель, то есть он же вот склоняется, да, еще ну, склоняется, но он не падает, хотя, в общем-то, должен же рано или поздно упасть, если склоняется. Ну вот. Новая в ботанике. Да. Но, да, мне тоже кажется, что вот эта вот его фраза о том, что мы э, отрицаем то, что мы не отрекаемся от него, который за себя стоит в тупик. Я, я опять-таки пытаюсь понять модальность вот этого. То есть, что я должен, скажите на словах, что нужно делать, чтобы вот это вот, вот так вот осуществить, от, 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 отрицать, не отрекает. Да, мне кажется, она вот остается. Еще вопросы, uh, questions, comments. Uh... Я думаю, что отрицать не, от, не, не отрекается, означает усложнять, отрицать представление делать комплексным. То есть отказываться как раз, вот я прошу прощения, от этой либеральной анфилады. Илья. Что ж, больше, мне больно, но на самом деле отрицать в смысле философского negation, которое обогащает за счет отрицающих возможных, открытых по своему множеству толкований. Ну, но снятие это нет, и в этом фокус. Да? То есть а мы отрицаем не отрекаясь. Но потому что отрекаться это же все-таки этический акт. Да. Он предлагает снять вот эту доминанту этическую, посмотреть, что из этого да. получится. Вот это, пожалуй, единственный момент, где я с вами соглашусь по поводу вашей этой, э, меланхолии. Да? Да, то есть, когда отрица, отрицаем, но не отрекаясь. То есть, когда мы удерживаем вот эти следы, да, но при этом... Но, 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 но при этом мы понимаем, что мы отрицаем, но удерживаем. В меланхолии этого нет. Ты просто удерживаешь, потому что ты можешь не удержать. Отпустить не можешь. Но это, а может, как означать, раз... это может также означать, что мы отрицаем, отказываясь от этического, этического какого-то приказа чувствовать себя виноватыми. Ну, это, это уже, да, вот либеральный дискурс идет, то есть я понимаю, а, про и вину и анфилады, да, я, я это в книжке я этого не вижу. Да. Ну, мы вот. отказываемся от того, чтобы отрицать, мы отказываемся признавать себя виноватыми, а, и а тем не В том-то и дело. Поэтому нет алиби. Я тоже не вижу алиби в этом. А я не предполагаю, что там будет оправдание. 
Жалкий лес. На этой стороне стола. А я полагаю, что алиби есть все-таки, как раз тоже об этом и говорит. Но я думаю, там есть реабилитация, а не алиби. Нет, реабилитация предлагает вину, ты сама себе противоречишь. Реабилитация – это еще хабелис, это как способность. Непонятно, потому что Шков, я сейчас как делал, я сейчас поливанов с block of, uh, for thermal method and um and uh, there are letters um uh, about rehabilitation um so i found that his um uh, uh, yeah i didn't find his novel but i, I found his um, court case uh, rehabilitation and how he was um uh, questioned and everything like sort of in the 30s and one of the letters was Vashkovsky, uh mm -hmm. to rehabilitate supporting him yeah and he explains that well you know like yes sir, he was a drug user and that kind of stuff but like he was just genius and that kind of stuff and it's not, not the only letter it was the same for the curve and the hero like and that kind of stuff so yeah so yeah okay if there are no questions um uh, then we can proceed to lunch to lunch no. yeah, yeah. 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 Have we missing someone? That will be no. I think clearly. Everybody's here. Right? Okay. So let's start. Yes. Thank you. I want to start uh, by saying to all of you and Sirioja and Mark for the organization of the whole of this series because. Uh, whether we continue or we do not continue, I have already expected my post. <laughs> <laughs> and all of a sudden, completely unexpected for myself, uh, finish, uh, a book about something else uh, with an appendix about Kosky, which kind of uh, <laughs> put everything together. And this is just by way of promotion. So I have to think about, and there is a thank you to all of you, like en masse and individually. So. It's really, it has been great independent of. Uh, so speaking about the, then I, I should say, I, I probably, it must have been too long. So I don't know why uh, I was using uh, Shvotsky's translation into English instead of using Russian quotations. Obviously it's better. Jet lag. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so please forgive me because it's really, really, uh, Wrong translation, which I shouldn't be using. I simply forgot to my mind to speak with. Totally lost in you. Yeah, too long. It has been too long. So, uh, concerning Titiwa, the bowstring, I'm suggesting uh, to read it uh, as a book about repetition and return. And this is nothing new here. We have already done some reading. Uh, about revising, revisioning, rereading, restoration, reconstruction, and many, many other words with re, including revolution and reaction and respiration, uh, or the Russian prefix Peri, with which he actually starts uh, in his Zastavka, Perichitovit, Perilistovit, Perimchivi, Drost, he starts with these identities and differences, the game of identities and differences from the very beginning, and it's about returning and doing all over again. So examples are too many, you pay attention immediately that in Tso, so as early as Tso, he depicts himself scooping water with a felt hat. Uh, in Titiwa, it transforms into a hat made of plastic, but it's still sitting on the uh, shore of the sea, expecting for a miracle. Uh, a magic crayfish or a magic uh, little little devil that he is expecting to uh, appear and fetch back to him something that he has lost, some kind of a lost treasure, uh, a missed opportunity, a golden ring. And so the question uh, that returns again, again, and again, and again, and again, and he also repeats it uh, in a very nice formula in one of his letters to his grandson when he says, как повторять, не повторяясь. How to repeat without repeating yourself. And this is basically, I think, the main, uh, for me, for my reading, that's kind of uh, <laughs> until other, yeah? So how can we interpret this uh, obsession, this need to repeat and to return? Um, and not only to repeat and return to the place from where you started, but to repeat through a negation of repetition. 
to the question that we also asked today. So there is a biographic moment, of course, uh, which we are going to ignore um, following his um, postulates that biography is not for us. But there is, uh, still there is a biographic moment, the need to, to justify his own actions in the past, especially if we remember that it was not long since uh, Women Court had attacked him and this bad reputation around him uh, supported by uh, his closest friends. So he obviously must have felt a necessity to come back and reinterpret his own past uh, and in this sense, reputation becomes a means of political and moral rehabilitation. And I like this word rehabilitation because of this habilis, right? So we can discuss it and self-rehabilitation. Or again, as we already started speaking, it might be a treatise, the synecdoche about old age. So uh, old age, a manifesto of personal experience, uh, since it is from the point of view of the experience of old age that repetition only appears as repetition, and then he will uh, develop it many times about repetitions that are repetitions at the same time are not repetitions, yeah? Or maybe looking for a repetition that is not repetition in order to make an attempt at a theory of history. And I uh, should uh, not uh, remind you that approximately at the same time Foucault was inventing a theory of history, not a philosophy, but a theory. So uh, I have a thesis and a uh, counter thesis. I don't have a synthesis, but I'm trying to <laughs> just because I couldn't, uh, I didn't manage. Uh, so this thesis about theory of history and theory against history, this kind of, uh, uh, kind of <clears throat> counter relation, relation against each other. Uh, 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 by the way, uh, Galushkin, his uh, secretary who left his memoirs, uh, also reminds us that uh, obviously uh, the problems of, public, of publishing Shklovsky text, at least at the time when Galushkin was his secretary, and that was not at the time of Titiva, that was later, was connected with the fact that he was trying to sell uh, Shklovsky's writing to publishers as theory. And they said, no, this is not theory. So they already had some kind of an idea of theory. Uh, and obviously that was not the theory, at least how it was understood at that time of technical and scientific progress, uh, and the P and there, uh, when people suddenly stopped believing in Marxist-Leninist theory and were looking for an alternative in the positive truths of scientific theory and laboratory knowledge, um, according to which criteria theory must be objective, reproducible, verifiable, and have predictive power. And that means that uh, if you devise a theory based on some kind of laboratory experiment, uh, if you reproduce the same conditions and the same uh, instruments and procedures in some other uh, environment, laboratory environment, so it must be similar and similar and similar. If it's a correct theory, it has to give the same, uh, the same results. Very simple. Um, so in other words, uh, theory in this sense is a theory of total similarity and self-similarity. Everything must be similar to, to itself. Apart from personal dislikes, uh, which have been, and I'm sure we're going to uh, discuss them, it is in this light that Shklovsky uh, rejects, for instance, Jakobson's and Levi-Strauss structural analysis as they performed it in uh, the analysis of Baudelaire's poem, uh, The Cats. And precisely for these purposes, that was the idea, like uh, this analysis as some kind of um, laboratory attempt to uh, try and identify the regularity in the reproduction of the same formal patterns. So Shklovsky, I don't remember now what text it was, but he said, like, what's the point? What did they achieve? They didn't achieve anything. They didn't get anything out of it. Uh, uh, a pure case of playing tennis on a regular tennis court with regular rackets, nets, uniforms, rules, protocols, judge, but without a ball. Everything gets reproduced except for, except that there is no point. Uh, the idea of reproducibility and verifiability does not work uh, if we're dealing with attempts of theorizing a work of art. 
uh, at least not in the sense of verifiable predict predictability. So we can do something, some kind of theoretical statements can be made, but not in the sense of verifiable predictability. But then in what sense? Uh, to theories of reproducibility in terms of structural patterns, Shklovsky has nothing to uh, oppose except the experience of his old age. His knowledge gained by experience about the cyclic structure of human, that is historical time. In our experience, there always happens something that reminds us of something, uh, of something else, as if the past has returned into action. But in fact, it is only an appearance of similarity, a kakbu, it's only something that we are reminded of, but most of us are going to be uh, reassured that it's not it. So um, uh, an appearance of similarity, a kakbu, a difference that only pretends to be identity. So we have parody here again. It's not literature this time, but time itself moving on by producing parodies of itself or as he formulates in his critical discussion of Thomas Mann, which uh, I, I'm going to concentrate a little bit on, time propels through the pulsation of the ever-changing essence, and we cannot help noting that by definitions, essences do not change. Mm. Still, they don't change with a pulsate. Uh, thus the bowstring, not precisely repetition, but the similarity of repetition is what intrigues him and what he is experimenting with, as he indicates in the subtitle, by revising his early thesis of uh, uh, dissimilarity of the similar, so he turns it around in order to see what happens to its viability if it's read the other way around. But the similarity of the dissimilar becomes the dissimilarity of the similar and also about the same time, he was confess confessing also to his grandson that his main discovery uh, as he saw his life backwards was not that of Astranenia for which he had become more or less known, uh, more or less acknowledged both uh, in the Soviet Union and especially that was painful outside uh, of the USSR. So not exactly Astranenia that everybody knew, but rather the formula of the similarity of the dissimilar in the beginning, um, which in his eyes was his most important theoretical contribution and basically uh, the mechanism, the, the, the machine that drove forward this astranenia that everybody was so, mm -hmm. and still is so fond of. Uh, this reversal is a chiasmus and we also once spoke about it with endless, yeah, uh, horizontal eights. Uh, a rhetorical figure and a formula of infinity in which a, step, a statement is confronted with its own mirror reflection. And so you get an anabim, a movement back and forth without a closure. Uh, you can check whether the meaning of this initial formula changes from this reversal or remains the same. And maybe if you can see how it changes. Um, so it's ex actually repetition without repetition. Repetition is there, but something else occurs. Um, time evolving in the form of an ever broadening spiral, he says at one point, and this is an image apparently from the dialectical method, it should sound Soviet kind of correct image, the spiral, but um, as opposed to the dialectics of historical materialism, this is a strange dialectic, we also spoke about it without a synthesis, a history that does not culminate in any final totality, a history that doesn't have an end of history. So it's totally, um, it doesn't have its apocalypse. It's not expected to, to have an apocalypse. So again, the synecdoche, as I said, if you read Cicero, it's a very positive, a very positive story of being an old person. <laughs> no end of history. In this connection of interest to me, uh, there are many things of interest, but I just decided to stop at that. Is Klotsky's critique uh, in Titiva of Thomas Mann's Joseph and his brothers, uh, recently translated into Russian and tremendously popular at that time among the intelligentsia in the late 1960s. I remember how prestigious it was to be an owner of these two, two volumes. Uh, Shklovsky's strongly negative opinion can be explained quite simply by envy. 
uh, and he's not alone because obviously Tolstoy was also in this, uh, of not having written this story himself. Yeah. Um, but uh, also later, uh, we can compare to how he disapproved of another idol of the Soviet intelligentsia from the next decennium, and that was Garcia Marquez uh, with his 100 years of, uh, of uh, uh, solitude, yeah, which according to, again to <laughs> Galushkin, uh, uh, he reports there was a strange phrase of Shklotsky concerning Marquez, uh, explaining why he stopped reading 100 years of sol solitude even immediately. He said, Тут вы не пройдете. You will not find the passage for yourselves here. Uh, no comments. <laughs> <laughs> but I thought, uh, I mean, that was a nice, Тут вы не пройдете. But let's try and look for authentic and not biographical, some kind of authentic, quote unquote, authentic, not biographical explanations in Shklovsky's quest for those pulsations of the changing essences. The point is, there are repetitions, he says, that are mobile, and there are repetitions that are immobile. Man works with the uh, immobile, with the comma, no, letter, letter, with the letter, with the immobile, unmovable kind of repetitions, which are always there, reproduce each other in an in a, in a identical way. And he is using, if, as I explain it to myself, as structures of like this kind of skrepe, he fixes he, he fixes his narrative through these formal repetitions. Like one very beautiful example, indeed, is if you remember Joseph sitting on a uh, on the uh, on the on the wall of the well, uh, and this is the same well into which he's going to dethrone. And so, and so mm -hmm. uh, that that novel is really full of this kind of script. Uh Formally. Uh, his chapter on Joseph and his brothers uh, is a reflection on myths and history, so it's formulated quite theoretically, but more concretely again about the structure and effects of repetitions in the poetics of the myths and how these repetitions get different from those, are different from those that constitute the structural foundation when the mythic repetition is uh, reinterpreted and used by contemporary historicism and then also aestheticized in the 20th century European historical novel. So for him, Thomas Mann is kind of the key example. And of course, in repetition, immediately Tolstoy, who is actually the Lenin of Shklovsky, right? Tolstoy and Lenin. Uh, Tolstoy is immediately referred to as the greatest authority uh, uh, in that wonderful quotation from Tolstoy about the biblical tale of Joseph that needs to be protected from Babarikin or a writer uh, of the Bobarican uh, type, uh, uh, would he not ruin, Tolstoy is saying, uh, uh, would he not ruin everything with his technique and his awful descriptions? Quote, he said, raising his left leg while it was half, while it was half reclined, yeah. or the gray paint on the door was faintly illuminated by the small lamp. So this parody by Tolstoy of Bobarican's uh, psychologism and naturalism, uh, the tale of Joseph, uh, Tolstoy says, says in, my, in that horrible translation, I'm again, I'm so sorry, I, I don't know why I took <laughs> The tale of Joseph lives and will, and I spent so much time looking for them, uh, lives and will live for many centuries, while the Barikin's writing will only last a season. So Thomas Mann, in Shklovsky's eyes, is another Barikin. Why? Because he says, while working on the details of Joseph's tale and enriching it with archaeological facts, man is forced to throw out some lively passages and so on and so on. It's a very bad translation, it's much better than Russian. Uh, too much knowledge, too much positive fact, too much psychology, too much similarity, pathology. Uh, and then uh, what man as well as Bobarikin do not understand is that myths do not flow through the pipelines of history. Myth and Nitikut to produce story. I thought it was not a pipe, it was a pipeline. Uh, they change and splinter, they contrast and refute one another. The similar turns out to be dissimilar. So now we find where, in what context he uh, places this slogan. Myth is not repeated, sowing the same seed in the same soil. Myth nim nagrakratni pasi, nim nagrakratni pasi, adnavoy tavo zirna na adnoy toy zhipuchve. 
uh, uh, MIS does not replicate their ar ar archetype, but takes it back in order to for us to re reject it and so on. And then she says, art's illusionary movement is constituted of what appears to be repetitions, but they are merely appearances or illusions of repetition. Try and decipher. Try to imagine it. Иллюзорное движение искусства состоит как бы из повторений, но эти повторения кажущиеся. If you look at it, there is a hidden chiasmatic structure here too. And he concludes, it is pulsation of these changing essences as, dis uh, essences as distinct from the reproducibility according to one and the same pattern. Thomas Mann's achievement, he says, is an ironic heroic deed. He succeeds in completely immobilizing time in his narrative like Bobarikin, with details and archaeological data, because he imagines history as the same pattern happening again and again, uh, snowy, snowy. But I should say that uh, this is the point uh, in uh, Man, if you remember this long introductory chapter, it's written on behalf of those um, anonymous, faceless uh, angels some kind of petty bureaucrats in the celestial chancellery. So of course, the fact that they see history happening the same, identically the same and the same, uh, this is a very good detail, but um, he's not forgiven by Barkovsky. So as for Mann, he creates a world of repetitions that is immobile and therefore pessimistic. But the interesting thing, his novel is a great artwork. So what is, uh, what is it in this capacity of a great artwork as distinct from a short biblical tale? He says, at the Brish Budushe, a hole gaping into the future, not rather than a return, it is a farewell to the past. And then he says, a new street hammered through the old town. And I got hold of this metaphor of uh, reconstruction uh, of cities. Do you have still time? Because now, very soon comes my answer. Okay. Uh, and just paid attention a little bit at those metaphors he's using, metaphors of the inauthentic, which he is taking from the subject which is dear to my heart of archaeology and restoration. Uh, so this urban reconstruction, hammering, it's not the only one. Uh, for instance, he says, uh, Mann's smart novel is ironically constructed according to the laws of architecture, using the method of non-coinciding repetitions of the European novel. So that's think about the well uh, architecture here. The novel style is ironic. Its architectural design, it seems, is repeating the structure of myth. And again, Kagbu, to remontage your perception while passing through a familiar street. So this kind of archae archaeological stuff appears. Then he starts speaking about those Chiripki those the, the, the this chapter member yeah those fragments uh that you dig out if you are doing an archaeological dig uh and he says that <clears throat> these are material carriers of historical authenticity as opposed to archaeological objects in a museum display which are reconstructed by analogy or by some other data and restored by a restoration expert to a hypothetical totality so he says, "Kulturnych slajach, na katorych stajat garada i sielenia, abyśno smiena charaktera prasloiki cherepko. Cherepki krepci nowych sasudów, ani pachti ploski, pachti nie rozdawlewcy i nie biutsa, ani charakteryzuje slaji, pomaga śledzić za smianą kultur, nie przewracia pośledowitelność śledność. I'm not sure about this pośledowitelność śledność, but I think uh, what he is trying to say is that as long as they remain as fragments, they somehow." Uh, 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 preserve some kind of historicity, which completely disappears if you restore them to some kind of uh, um, hypothetical totality as representations of your own fantasy of historicity of this or that period of time. I think he means something like that, or maybe I want him to mean something like that. But anyway, so uh, these, uh, this just a membra, yeah, those fragments, those bits, the bits and pieces, they are truly historical and they allow us in the way they are arranged to see how history was really going as, a, as opposed to those representational 
uh, images of uh, restored hypothetical um, wholeness. But here comes my uh, antithesis because uh, an archaeology and restoration of the biblical story of Jesuit, Joseph by Thomas Mann and the petty secretaries and God's own offices in the highest spheres and the parallel or charismatic history as yet not fully written of Shklovsky cooperation with his associates, assistants, his secretaries, and especially during his late period, the time during which, according to Galushkin, Shklovsky was returning to himself. So that was the time Galushkin was there in the 1970s, 1980s. Uh, he's also referring to someone who was his predecessor, trying to say that he was no good, that he, uh, I don't remember his name, but you should know. Uh, anyway, so uh, so I didn't want to name her by name. I, I wanted to leave her anonymous. I just cannot. I cannot do it. So a quote from. Uh, um, uh, Okay, all right. <laughs> but she wrote it right now, so it's it's not a real uh, piece of evidence. But 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 look at the structures of imagination. Viktor Borisovich, she was told, Viktor Borisovich cannot write. He doesn't know how to write. And you need to say, he doesn't even have a handwriting. <laughs> like someone telling her, uh, yeah. Uh, all these years, he has been dis uh, di di dictating things to his wife. And then they started employing secretaries. And so she comes, she becomes his secretary. She is so young, she is that he's so old and it's so sweet. Blah, 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 blah. And so he dictates. Now, what happens after dictation? She says, I'm trying to decipher the record and cover in cold sweat. It was a page full of delirium. The birds, the hat, <laughs> stern. <laughs> Preparatory draft, Chernoviki. There is no connection between this whatsoever, <laughs> not on earth, and no paradoxes either, nor any of those nearnesses between concepts that delicavat is движение delicavat. If I didn't know how to translate it, uh, there is the distancing, but no nearness. I'm gazing at the page stupidly, ha have reread it a hundred of times, but in vain no comprehension, and then there comes sudden solution. Every, so she does something. Everything as it was, so nothing to change, yeah? yeah, everything as it was, except that every sentence starts with a new line. No columns, no ellipses, the graphics of a printed book uh, chapter uh, page, a typewriter page designed like a book page, magic. Here are all those Brzezhenia. Everything is now in its place. This is Shklovsky. So the miracle. This is Shklovsky. Here the memory of the memories plays a trick of parody. So this is Shklovsky. The secretary declares after she succeeds in the production of a fully recognizable similarity of Shklovsky, mm -hmm. including the instances in which he achieves the effect of vidinia and zbližaya delikavate panatia, that is, in principle, non-assimilable essences, those very. So she manages to simulate them. Yeah? The effect of assimilated unassimilability is even better than uh, whatever it was. Huh? Becomes fully recognizable. Everything is based on full recognition. Everything is totally recognizable. That's why it's Shklovsky. Yeah? Uh, as typical Shklovsky. Shklovsky appears collected from bits and pieces, assembled into a Shklovskian construction and attributed as authentic Shklovsky. And by the way, uh, approved by Shklovsky himself. Because the, the episode ends uh, with him saying to someone, oh, we have had such a good work day today. Yeah, uh, The naive memorist, because it's naive, reminisces how, as a naive girl, she naively falsified a fully authentic Shklovsky, the theory of reproducibility and verifiability in action. 
uh, earlier and probably most radically, Alexander Galushkin explained these actions. Again, it has nothing to do with Titriva. I don't know who was his secretary in 71. It might be an interesting thing to find out. Uh, it's him leaving. It's him leaving. Oh, thank you. Well, here's a new question. Yeah, we have to find out the secretaries. Levin. Levin. Yeah, Levin. probably. Simulin. Simulin. Okay. So, but but maybe. Maybe. Oh, he was. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yes, 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 he was. Very okay. So, uh, earlier and probably more radically, Alexander Galushkin explained these actions of archaeologically excavating and reconstructing the Sinil Chkovsky and completing his writing with his own restoration interventions as an asosnane neobhadimist. It's asosnane neobhadimist, the recognition of necessity, an act uh, of uh, recognized necessity given Shklovsky's senility and the demands of the publisher to deliver a piece of Shklovsky that would be recognizable as Shklovsky, but also appropriate. Uh, just to come back to uh, Arcus, uh, if you noticed, I mean, I just cannot uh, stop making these notes. Notes. Here. That was uh, no. I think he was theory of prosa. But well, 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 okay. okay. Sure. I I wanted to say a different thing. Uh, Arcus, being a naive memorist, actually, what she is doing there, she is. Uh, uh, describing these operations in three um, protocols uh, that can be compared to architect architecture uh, architectural uh, restoration, which are supposed to be the least, um, the most questionable in terms of the product, this authenticity. So she reconstructs by analogy. Uh, she uh, fills in the gaps without marking. Uh, the the missing so so she she smoothes over uh, and then uh, she still uh, recollects him uh, regathers him out of his own pieces for the most part the last thing is called anastylosis this is how the Parthenon uh, was restored and even in the thirties it was continued uh, considered to be like what not quite historical. Uh, analogy was the famous method of Soviet restorers, especially in terms of architecture, because they were always dealing with ruins, which were not even ruins, that was just dust, mm -hmm. like uh, uh, churches in, in, in Novgorod. Mm -hmm. So they were reconstructing by analogy, saying that we uh, attribute this church to such and such age, and we have different constructions, other constructions that can be dated to that age, and so on, the analogy with this, and so on. This is also very bad proof of authenticity. And then the third thing is, of course, also the favorite of Soviet restoration, precisely to try and conceal the sutures. Mm -hmm. The sutures shouldn't be seen, yeah? Uh, if you look at Tsarsky um, uh, Silo, the, the palaces, this is how they are reconstructed. Nothing, mere continuity, only continuity, nothing happened. Um, I'm almost finishing, sorry. Um, yeah, uh, so, um, so recognizable and approachable, uh, appropriate. So he must be uh, recognizable, appropriate, and he must be uh, authentic Chklovsky. And at the same time, there must be nothing that would contradict this recognizability because this is how we attribute him. That's about attribution. Poor old man, he becomes symbolic commodity, right? So, um, <clears throat> uh, yes, and Galushkin says, my attitude to Shklovsky's writing is harder. I correct and write over or rewrite. <laughs> Change places, he says it several times. Change places, carry out a remontage, cut and paste in a new way, finish up unfinished sentences and periods, certain postulates. This is rational textual work, not working with the text, not from the outside, but from the inside. Mm -hmm. So he, he identifies, he, he is trying to reproduce and produce authenticity by identifying, uh, which is also, by the way, one of the methods of Soviet uh, 
the architectural restoration. Uh, again, uh, dictated by the necessity of dealing with the heap of dust. What can we do? You have to, you have to identify. Uh, this, these quite determined, he continues, and sometimes simply cruel actions are acts of recognition of necessity dictated by Shklovsky's own current condition and that of his text. I do not believe that I'm doing something criminal or violent towards Viktor Shklovsky when I so ruthlessly edit and complete his writings. <laughs> So previous secretaries were not good enough, according to him. Uh, <laughs> cultivated in Shklovsky was not, they cultivated in Shklovsky, those previous guys, cultivated in Shklovsky was not the best side of Shklovsky himself. The plight <laughs> of thought, paliot mysli, which transferred into something senile. It would have been better, he says even, if those books did not exist at all. <laughs> Thus, Shklovsky himself turns into an object of experimentage and ironically into a victim of his own theory as a resource of authentic, authentically Shklovskian visions reconstructed and attributed as Shklovskian based on the analogy with his earlier writings. Instead, negating the past, a repetition negates Shklovsky, representing him as a commodity of vision, vidinia, manufactured out of 100% recognition that is Uznavanya. So the question of restoration always raises the next question in this restoration, in this product of restoration, what is it that remains? What is untouched and what is uncompromised? And can we count on there being anything untouched and uncompromised? And I'm really making a very undermining statement because we have been theorizing for such a long time and I'm making a suggestion that this is all falsification by, uh, by, um, by Arcos or someone else. So what is uh, what remains? I guess he's got nothing else to present apart from this pulsation of those changes, uh, changing uh, essences. And that means historical and personal experience which resist theorization and resist the possibility of being reproduced in, according to some kind of a model. So in this way, um, he is, <clears throat> he's not saying it directly, but he seems to be suggesting that history uh, and historical subjectivity are two very weak platforms to stand on resisting theory, which has this uh, huge possibility of trivializing history uh, in reproduction. Uh, and that's why uh, he starts by turning the original formula backwards and thus defamiliarized from this chiasmatic inversion, the revised formula allows him to make a critical position vis-a-vis -vis theory. He says, trying to refine, uh, and this is also bad translation, should have taken it in Russian, trying to refine their analysis. People search for examples of single layered works, uh, that search is futile, he says. So yeah, uh, in content and in, uh, in conflict. To counteract theories potentially trivializing and leveling effect, he seeks a critical rereading of his time from the vantage point of a historicized subjectivity. And here we come to that wonderful quotation, we were in love, we experienced death, we saw our children die, we saw our own history unfold. Thank you. Yes. Okay. Questions, comments, suggestions, readings, revisions, returns, rejections, rejections. Rejection. Rejection. Yeah. Uh -huh. Just a simple question. Um, I didn't quite catch when you when you think the inception of this. Um, you know, senile creativity. But when can we, how do we date? Um, you know, yeah, like, so, so are, are you saying that actually Titiba was composed by this, me this method that the secretary recounted of? I don't kind know. Of creating Shklovsky? I don't that know. After. I have no know. idea. Yeah. In this, it could be this and it could be that. Right. You kill our discussion. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> no. I'm not, uh, no, I'm not yeah, killing yeah. our discussion. So that's, <laughs> that's, 
But that's an interesting question. Do we trust this text? Mm -hmm. Where is but it probably? No, no, but okay. 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 What, what does it mean? I, I trust it completely. Yeah, yeah. but what does it mean to trust the text? And why, and why do we need yeah. to know what exactly happened to him? Like, is it like, imagine if there was no Shklovsky's name on the cover, would you recognize him? Well, that's exactly yeah, what Dylan yeah. was talking yeah. about. Absolutely. That's the problem. Yeah. <laughs> no, 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 but, it, no, but does it matter? Then? Does the intention matter? So, and given that we are, and he suggests, yeah, yeah exactly. So but what, 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 what are you suggesting? If if his whole point is that sort of you can you can break text down into fragments and still work, still work with fragments. No, we see that. Whatever Galushkin is doing doesn't really the matter. Point. The point is, if it is his point. Well, it's really you know. his yeah, it's not about the intention, it's about... <laughs> this is the question. Well, is it his point? You know, <laughs> it, it, <laughs> okay, it's, okay. Uh, yeah. or, uh, you know, and by whom? I don't know. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. No, it, it is the question for, for, for authentication. Okay, we can, we can uh, assume that there is an uh, co-author named X. So what? Well, but Shklovsky is one of co-authors. Can we live with this? I can. Okay. What if it's an artificial intelligence that's written Shklovsky? That would be an interesting experiment. A neural neural network. Yeah. Well, because if it's all pieces and fragments, right? You could you could feed it into a computer and it would produce a, a book of, of Shklovsky's writing. Yeah, yeah it's, it's, it's quite possible. Yeah. Yeah. But this is the problem, you know. I have I, I, I have been fighting with this problem of restoration yeah. all the time. When I'm looking at some kind of at the, at the, at the I don't know a jar in the archaeological museum, yeah, I know what I'm what I see because there is a label, yeah, and it tells me. But what I'm looking at, I have no idea, right. and it remains always there. So what see? I mean, this is also I mean, it's also a question of uh, editing and publishing and text production, which I actually think. For instance, in socialist realism, for instance, and Shklovsky is really a paragon. <laughs> it was much better done. They, they have discovered and made inventions much more in this work of text production out of other text production than in producing original, genuine things. They were much more, and, and Shklovsky, he was just number one. So this irony that he finally transformed into an object of these manipulations, <laughs> and obviously not without his uh, consent, because we remember this story that Chudakov was telling this anecdote about how Shklovsky was allowed to make uh, the first uh, three volume edition after a very, very long kind of, and he asked Chudakov to be the editor, and Chudakov said no, because I'm, I'm an honest person. <laughs> they are not including your best work from the 1920s, and they are publishing all those strange things like, uh, uh, yeah, Mr. Astarin, I don't understand, I cannot work with it. And so Shklovsky was really, really sad. And Chudakov says, he turns to Serafima and says, I feel there will be no publication. And Serafima is really angry because he needed this money. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. so uh, uh, I think what we are pointing to is a very weird uh, theoretical thinking of Shlovsky, which is transparent from, from what you are telling. It's an idea to separate a very strange stage in art production, which is a stage of material. He's always talking about material. Of course, it's a kind of invention. Because when you are working on art, uh, in, 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 in writing at least, you have no material and after it, there is a master who is coming and shaping it mm -hmm. or putting structure on it. Uh, in 1923, he's denying uh, the artistic side of film because film has no material mm -hmm. because it's already transformed by cinematic apparatus in terms of Bergson, it's no more, amorphous material that should be shaped, it's already shaped by the apparatus. So it's not enough. So every time you are talking about Shklovsky, Shklovsky is always inventing something which is amorphous. In his book, how, in this book, how we are writing, 
He is describing how he's put, putting all these kind of sheets of paper on the wall. He's going around in order to understand how to put this material together. The much, there is a special stage and there is always an expectation of somebody who will come himself yeah. or another person who will form the material. You are talking about restoration, but the strangest type of what you are describing that there is no work to restore. Uh, it's a pure type of material. Well, this is and it's super unrestorable because you cannot restore something that has no no Yeah, on the one hand. On the other hand, uh, there is uh, uh, there is this image uh, that allows you to uh, design the page in such a way that the heap of delirium all of a sudden becomes uh, authentic Tchaikovsky. So there is material. The problem is it's immaterial material. Now this is probably like in filter. It, 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 uh, the Shklovsky emerges as a kind of profane illumination when there is a strange structure which is given by typography. Yeah. When you have typography, suddenly there is an image becomes, of Shklovsky yeah. who is becoming visible. But I think what should be really deeply theorized, because I think it's not done until now, what is this strange invention of material which is reminding me of Aristotle, for instance. There is Hile, which is shaped by the idea or a kind of form, or it's platonic, but it's a very old story of something amorphous yeah. that is requiring form. And the idea that there is kind of work, which means we are taking something in form, and after this, you are trying to put it in a certain <laughs> way into form. I don't know. I, I, I have no idea who is working in this way, yeah. except Shklovsky. Maybe it's his personal pathology that he's theorizing, making this material as a special stage of work. And I think it's, 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 this is a very interesting question. Why he needs this amorphous stage in the way? What does it mean, basically? Why? I don't know. Yeah. 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 Uh, you know what? Uh, I was actually thinking sure. that. So... Yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> Could I maybe okay. try to ask a version of that question of like in your sort of Kokstelina Titiva? Were you seeing a different kind of authorship? Um, that is discontinuous with other forms of form, like thinking about authorial writing, or do you see this cobbling together as somehow um, just maybe justified by this text itself? I mean, because there seems to be quite a bit of material if you think about this general idea of the old or the style, somehow there's a basic principle of collision and putting it off to use. And I guess I'm sort of curious um, if you see that this the model of writing that's presented here as somehow distinctive in Shklovsky generally, or that this marks a sort of break? Because some of it feels prepared for if you if you think that in a way you can exempt some kind of authorial mm -hmm. so that it is constructed out of these different bits. I don't know. I didn't want to do this kind of. I, I'm really. I ha, I don't have patience. <laughs> I really get so bored. Uh, but uh, his presence to me is absolutely out of uh, like any doubt because you can see these phrases, you know, those arrows that he finally shoots from this train postman. So he trains something, uh, produces this. Uh, stress, 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 and then poof, and there is a phrase, and it gets exactly, and then you start looking at this phrase, and it's all internally conflictual, it's all kind of pulsating. So, yeah, but again, what am I doing? Am I also aestheticizing him and transforming him into a recognizable commodity? Because a recognizable commodity is the one that is sold. That they Actually, they were selling him. Or 86 cocks. <laughs> <laughs> Democratic. <laughs> but I think that's what, the point. I mean, I'm, I'm sorry. Um, um, is it a, a commodity in the end, right? Mm -hmm. So, and because the whole point of doing this workshop is precisely to come back to things that were neglected, rejected, 
misrecognized, despite the fact that they were trying to turn it into a product that could circulate and uh, they could benefit from it. So that sounds like it didn't quite work. Yeah, well. And we are recovering sort of things. And I, I, I want to go back to uh, uh, Mikhail's you know, question. Uh, you know the logic of commodity. Uh, you can commodify any negativity. You can yes. if, if there is a customer who is going to buy it, right? But if there isn't, like if nobody is buying it, and when we started this conference uh, like several years ago, I remember sort of like some friends of mine um, in Russia were saying like, "Oh, look, what, what are you going to do? We actually get you buy? Seriously, that kind of stuff, right?" And I thought, "Well, oh, man, we might." <laughs> Software we started, right? But the, sort of that's kind of the attitude. So like this commodity was not bought, was not bought. But sorry, but it, but, 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 no. so you know there was a term socialism. Yeah, yeah. It was a socialist. But going back to the amorphous of it, we, we had this nice discussion in the morning. Um, um when um you in order to be able to revisit it and like push close in order to be um uh, project from uh from the future, so to speak, um, um mistakes that, that have been made in the past, the material has to be amorphous enough. It has a lot, it has to allow. For possibility of yet another choice, and another to, to reward endless. Exactly yeah, right, yeah. but but you need to posit this amorphous. You need to um to to imagine that there is enough space to make this maneuver, and Yulia was going you know, can explain how it could be done. So in other words, like the error is not necessarily there. The error has to be discovered there, but in order to be to be in there, in order to find it there, so like it has to be stretched. It, it has to be plastic, and I think that's what he's doing. Yeah, but then uh, he says chiripki are yeah. always there. Right. They are always there, yeah. and they 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 keep the record. It's it's geological. Yeah, they keep the record. It's just the problem is that our historicism and our aesthetics and the aesthetics of a historical novel, like uh, Marcus or Mann, is such that we cannot uh, leave this nat oh, natural geological record of Chiripki. We have to produce a totality, an image, and so. The thing you you do get a thing like wish even in Shklovsky's meaning, but it's not a thing anymore. The wish at the произведение, произведение total, but it's it, it's an image of itself. It's a representation of itself, as opposed to these chiripki that have no shape and we don't know how to fit them to each other. Uh, and you remember Foucauldian archaeology; it's always about finding something that you don't know what it is. And then you have somehow to imagine what it could be and try to reconstruct it into some kind of wholeness. But Shklovsky says, Chiripki are there, and Chiripki remember. And in this sense, no theory can, you know, the, there's still some other evidence that is not theorizable and not commodifiable. Mm -hmm. And this is why he's such a horrible idealist. I mean, this is why he's so... Optimistic. You, you know what is Chiripki? Chiripki is analogous to Nietzsche and uh, um, a tight atom. Nietzsche yeah. is speculating about time and when you have to imagine tight atom. It's a kind of fragment of time that is not allowing the fusion of everything yeah. as a disappearing distinction. Yeah, because so they remember the screen. Able to yeah. put together a yeah. something to are preserving discontinuity and means time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And he's very Nietzsche, and we know that. Yeah. I mean, yeah. he's really, he's really very Nietzsche with these chiasmatic uh, aids. It's eternal return made easy. Eternal return made easy. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. What? You yeah. read what? <laughs> What is book is a book about, about the similarity of similar. It is, is a book about the no, uh, uh, eternal non-return. That's all about it again. That's pure belief. Нет, я я уже потерялась в наших черепках и аморфности, но но я согласна, не согласна с тобой, Миша, потому что Фильм Дашковского это идеальное, идеальный медиум. Он как раз состоит из вот этих материальных картинок, которые 
не имеет смысла, но они имеют материальности, которые можно поставить, это черепки, если вы хотите, которые можно поставить в любые соотношения. Из-за этого сложатся совершенно разные истории. С концом, без конца. И в этом смысле это довольно кинематографический метод писания и кинематографический метод интерпретации. Поэтому он так ненавидит фильм Антониони, который рассказывает нам именно эту историю. Тот он пишет, он пишет, что фундаментальный образ rescue film as an art, you have to inject uh, subject, сюжет, story, narration or something like that, because on a, on a kind of, on a kind of uh, primitive level, on base level, there is no material, so you have to, to do something mm. from about. No. 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 Это зеркало, это зеркало, так же как люди ненавидят свое изображение. Если фильм показывает ему его конструкцию, он не может ее признать, потому что ты не можешь слышать своего голоса, ты не любишь свои фотоизображения, ты не любишь своего зеркального двойника. В этом смысле это довольно э, просто. Слагается история, но не твоя. And uh, as Sergei said today, he rejects the wholeness. He, he says that the wholeness can be created on the level of chirip, fragment, fragment, right? Fragment can be whole. If there is a tension within the fragment, then it's whole. Then it's an right? Uh, and and uh, 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 what Oksana said, uh, I think that, and the dissent anecdote from Arcus, so, 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 and Ilya wrote about this, so that, that, that Shplovsky basically introduces montage in, in literature, that, that, that's not banal, uh, but uh, this, uh, beginning each phrase from the new uh, paragraph is the imitable way of montage that, 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 that uh, is said to Vyshklovsky. In this book, by the way, we don't have it like that. But, but each paragraph is almost, each paragraph is of the same length. They're, they're, they're comparable. They, they're built on the same principle. They're, they're built as, as, as the film. You're absolutely right. So, so, and and, and th that's why this sort of division into parallel pieces That, that have metaphorical, metonymical, any other relation between each other is the way to build, to build connections. May, and, and probably, probably in, if we buy this hypothesis, the ending of the phrase doesn't matter. What, what matters is sort of the, the image of the idea that is parallel to another idea or contrasting to another idea. And the juxtaposition is, 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 is what Shklovsky is. This is a machine that can be producing text from, from the material that he can recycle or he can use new material, but the machine works in the same, in the same way on the same speed, so to speak. That, that's his style. Uh, yeah, but so. the point is, it makes sense. This is exactly, because, because they connect, there is an aid. There, there. No, it doesn't just make connection, it makes sense. It, it works essentially. And this is why it's not the game of tennis without the ball. Not at all. Yeah. But and, and then, uh, I'm sitting next to two theorists of montage, so they will tell you about montage making sense. <laughs> Just one second back to Chirikki. <laughs> back to Chirikki. Uh, there is he is speaking not just about Chirikki, but about Kulturnus Loy. And Kulturnus Loy is not about uh, which which object these Chirikki are Chirikki of. It's about their synchronicity and about their contemporaneity. It's not about the identity of that thing that was smashed and transformed into Chirikki. It could be several things. That's why Foucault says you dig them out and then you start fitting them to each other to understand if it was the same object that broke into Chirikki or different object. They do not belong to each other, they do belong to each other. But what they do belong to is Kulturna Skulik. But th this method is not about Shklovsky because Shklovsky takes the piece of, I don't know, 1920s or whatever and places it in the biblical context right away. So it's built uh, on the immediate transformation of his own love story, uh, his own relations in, in, into the Bible. Klebnik is depicted as, yeah. as the Jesus Christ. Uh, and, and then here he, 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 he says uh, Gilgamesh more often than, than any other text in the world. So, so, so it's not about Kulturna Slo, it's about montage, it's about Yeah, but he says Correct. there still is Kulturna Sloy, and this is something that uh, questions montage. See? It's a kind of a... That's what you are saying. <laughs> 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 
just because it has a different order of uh, uh, tautologies and non tautologies It's but, a but, different but, kind but, of but, record, well, a yeah. different kind of record of the past. I, I get it. But for Kim, sort of the cultural order is, um, the, 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 there is a basic kind of definition for it, uh, namely, it's sort of the Muslims as or the way around, like sort of it's just the purely differential. Right, and that's the cultural slowly, you know, cultural, <laughs> cultural layer that he's concerned with. You need this difference, right? And then, like, of course, like you, you bring something else, right? You like to use Dresde. No, I mean, then for you, right? So, in other words, but ultimately, you deal with two sort of completely incompatible sort of uh, elements of this cultural layer. That's for him is the layer. You need an, you need within it, within it. You know, enough, enough difference, right? So that's why I think someone was editing it because they don't get it, it doesn't get together. Because I think when he starts with this archaeology and uh 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 it's precisely about this historical experience when he says uh, something like what he says about like we we were we saw our children die. Mm -hmm. You know, that's from that side. I don't know how it goes in him. I don't understand how it goes together with this dissimilarity uh, um, of similar, similar, dissimilar, yeah. and, and so on. But this is the thing that he uh, kind of chooses for himself to stand on against uh, this leveling and vulgarizing potential of theory, which can translate anything into the same. Mm -hmm reproducibility which is the point of this kind of theory which he Actually. also which he also accuses uh man yes. of because he says man is an algebraist your conversation i mean i think i was struggling with the thing that you brought up like with a similar how you can have a method that's both on the one hand comparative what he's doing and at the same time saying that there is no form that repeats right every time it's mm. always different yeah and so i won't give my whole presentation now i'm trying to figure out how that's possible but it seems to me that what at least as i understood what you're discussing now is that on the one hand he does try to retain and i, I saw this as well a sense of like particularity like you mm -hmm. can have like he says at some point it's important to have someone in their own time, right, particularly in the chapter on myth, and at the same time, he's sort of developing, it seemed to me like a, a new concept of us that would allow him to put these different, still very particular pieces, right, that aren't being re-semanticized or reinterpreted in terms of any kind of, mm -hmm. you know, meaningful sameness of any other piece. But he has a new abstract way of kind of at least bringing them together, which, you know, but his concept of what sameness is has, has no, has no meaning. I guess it's like entirely abstract. I don't know if this helps at all, but I think there is a place in what he's doing for like, yeah, like the, the very particularity of like a historical moment which would allow you to say that these pieces only have. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, I, I, I'm thinking about this um, opposition between uh, thing, uh, because I have that feeling, and again, I haven't done any textual analysis, just in, I cannot, but I have that feeling that this is his vocabulary from this late period, when uh, any talk about wish almost completely disappears, because for him, wish, uh, wish also my kind of Kind of very very preliminary calculation i think it belongs to his critical period uh, which is not his theoretical period his critical period in the 30s in the 50s or at least attempts to be critical and this is his most compromised period but it is exactly then that he actually defines thickness thinness as producedness doneness madeness and this is not произведение произведение is a great brush будущее. So it's a totally different vocabulary, and obviously he's dealing here with completely different uh, purposes, because um, he writes as a critic in Titiva, but he is already not the critic of uh, how things are made. 
it's already some other kind of, uh, uh, I would say, mo mobilization uh, of art. And this time against this theory, theory. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Against, against, and, and that's why he doesn't like Rotman. He doesn't trust him. And that's why he absolutely does not trust him. <laughs> yeah, he doesn't really well. He probably <laughs> likes something, but but he's got a point here because he is, and and I think it's important for us also because nowadays history is everywhere, and it's the same history, uh, theory, and it's the same theory about any historical uh, context. So I mean, the way we can unify and exterminate any difference is nowadays very very uh, you know, productive. And then I also thought maybe that might be a good discussion and a, a timely discussion uh, of Kofke, because Titiva is written in the period after infamy, right? Uh, the old age is the time when you are going to be canceled. And we are all <laughs> doing Russian culture and Russian literature and Kofke. We are all living under this threat. You don't. You don't. <laughs> But I, I, I thought this parallelism between our situation now, the situation of uh, basically disgrace, which we probably do not accept, but it's in the air. And old age, it's about being canceled. Let's continue this before yes. <laughs> <laughs> what? Um, I would like to continue, but uh, just a little bit to the 1970s. Uh, the, uh, uh, the year 1970 was the year of publication of the two texts. First of all, of, of finishing of the text. First of them is the ball stream. And the second is the text by Mikhail Bakhtin, Atletum of Across Redaction of the uh, Yes. He proposes the same. We all, uh, this is the only text I know where Bakhtin text, where Bakhtin respectively, for, um, respectively mentions very well. And this text uh, is full of name dropping of uh, very diverse um, academ uh, academics, um, some close to Martin, some very far from Martin. But uh, it has also the presence uh, we all made a, a culture in the big time. Mm -hmm. The time of great experience, yes, of course. But I also think it's some kind of a, that's the last thing I'm going to say. But I think this kind of imperialism that Russian culture and Soviet Russian culture is going to be canceled for partly is uh, rooted in precisely everybody's belief in the total uniqueness of this historical experience, which actually in Shklovsky is that very fundamental thing on which he positions the whole of his critical and theoretical theory. So we all share this idea of uh, uh, this experience of having seen our children die, being kind of collectively unique, and everybody else's experience is just being an experience of playing tennis without the ball. So I think he's kind of contributing to this, unfortunately, I'm afraid. And on this optimistic note. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so we need to move. Um, thank you. Um, yeah. Uh, really okay. Yeah. Yeah. We need to the, 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 uh, you know, <laughs> so then you here. Um, but you know, uh, I, hopefully, I'll be able to bring uh, something something new uh, as the tweet from the COVID. Uh, so I, I want to try to kind of put uh, Shlosi into conversation with a couple of very recent trends in thought that have come across my field of vision recently in the last year or so, one in specifically in literature and the other not. Um, and hopefully uh, these will uh, be part of a sort of imaginative uh, experiment um, to try to think of what uh, Shklovsky might be interested in uh, if we were around in, in 2022. Uh, sort of reviving Shklovsky in the way that he has revived uh, folks throughout this book. So hopefully the collision of ideas here that I've put together uh, will, will generate some interesting conversations. So I'll go uh, kind of backwards through my title here, who pulls the bowstring attention in post-fiction, and I'll start with, with post-fiction. So starting with the idea that uh, today we are living in an age of post-fiction. 
not the death yet again of the novel, but uh, the difficulty or even impossibility of the very conceits of fiction. So uh, W.G. Zebald, one of the progenitors of this post-fictional age, uh, said in an interview uh, not too long ago, that as a reader, he finds the quote, rules and laws of fiction to be tedious. Though he himself uses all the tools of fiction, his narrators always seem unable to fully embody fictionality. And one narrator in The Emigrants, for instance, begins to describe the suicide of his protagonist, Paul Berater, but immediately falters. He does it actually twice, uh, which is interesting uh, in, in relation to Shklovsky and his repeated narration of, uh, of Aichenbaum's death, which is also um, fictionalized as well. So he says, such endeavors to imagine his life and death did not, as I had to admit, bring me any closer to Paul, except at best for brief emotional moments of the kind that seemed pres presumptuous to me. It is in order to avoid this sort of wrongful trespass that I've written down what I know of Paul the writer. So the narrator rejects the uh, sort of fictionality itself as um, presumptuous, right, uh, as trespasses. Um, and uh, rejects omniscience entirely, doubts his own experience, and constantly turns to photographs, objects, facts, and stories of others, many of which are reproduced directly in the book. Um, but like all of Zebald's narrators, he finds that even these ballasts um, provide only the shakiest of ground for storytelling, ultimately providing nothing when, than what uh, James Wood terms scrupulous uncertainty. And there's not only narration that is beginning to feel impossible, character two uh, in the novelist Rachel Cusk's estimation has eroded, becoming little more than what she calls a dysfunction. She uh, has recently said, I'm not interested in character because I don't think character exists anymore. So uh, for the theorist Timothy Buse, um, such statements, and he collects quite a few of them in uh, the introduction to his book, Free and Direct, uh, the novel in a post-fictional age, point to a crisis not of the novel, though that too, but of fictionality itself. The premise of fiction, its existence as alternative reality, and its relationship to the real world has ruptured. For Buse, the contemporary novel has already been thinking that rupture and generating new themes, new forms to problematize it for decades, but it is yet to be theorized as a problem. And this is because the very premise of literary criticism depends on the kind of fiction that authors like Sewald and Cusk uh, and many others increasingly reject what uh, Buse calls the fiction of instantiation. For, view, for Buse, the instantiation relation is the premise not only of realism, but of the dominant mode of literary criticism as it is still practiced in the Anglophone world. This is one of the places where I think Shklovsky uh, can be useful as a non-Anglophone critic and someone who's always very sort of skeptical of traditional uh, uh, literary criticism uh, and his skepticism, I think, comes out a lot in this book. Um, he's less dependent on the types of thinking that, that Buse describes to literary criticism as such. So traditional fiction, according to Buse, instantiates a certain set of ideas in concrete form of imagined reality. And the critic's task is to understand the mechanisms of fiction, the interactions between characters, tones, narrators, and forms, all the elements of what Wayne C. Booth called the rhetoric of fiction, basically in order to tease out uh, the set of ideas that are instantiated. But what if, asks Buse, the instantiation relation is broken? What if some of the most interesting writers today find it difficult, if not impossible, to sustain this instantiation relation, or even fiction as such? What steps in? In Buse's estimation, the answer is twofold. The logic of disconnection, characterized by the inability to connect memory, experience, or fiction to the real. And the second is imminence, that is, images and invocation of the real itself. Thus, the presence of, of photographs uh, throughout Zebald's work, the autobiographical skeleton of Cusk's novels, and so on. In both instances, fiction and reality come under the same cover, but they do not blend into one another. They instead perform their incommensurability. This, for Buse, is the rise of post-fiction, the ways the novel is transforming at the edge of form. Though Buse's examples are almost exclusively Anglophone, I think international analogs are not difficult to come by. So Emmanuel Carrère, one of uh, France's foremost writers, cannot, by his own admission, admission uh, figure out how to write a novel. His most successful books are works of reported nonfiction shot through with autobiographical investigations. I think Shklovsky, we could frame as a, as a writer of, of post-fiction as well in other ways. We'll come back to that later. 
Um, but in Russia today, many of the most celebrated books of the last decades have also been not quite novels. Perhaps most obviously, Marie Stepanova's Pamiti Pamiti, which has often been con compared to Zebald, but also Svetlana Alexievich's uh, post-fictional works, Mikhail Shishkin's collage novels, Pauline Varskova's poetic essay, Living Pictures, and even, I would venture, the very fictional, but nevertheless post-novel, Teluria, which I think is uh, Sarokin's most innovative recent work. All of these works in different ways resist the conceits of fictionality, the instantiation relation in Guzzi's terms, in favor of some combination of imminence and disconnection. Even when there is a central narrating presence, it is a fragmented, distractible, decentered one, a wholeness scattered all over, as far as the mind could go, strands, loose ends, strange pieces that would need to be picked up and braided back together. So these last words come from uh, the Italian novelist Maria Verbena Volpi, describing her recurrent protagonist, Mar uh, Martin Bora. And Frederick Jameson takes up this description in a recent issue of the London Review of Books. What if Jameson asks, character were something like this, a black hole with which the reader is invited to identify, a phenomenological account of an empty or purely intentional consciousness, rather than what most novelists intent on the business of producing believable yet idiosyncratic characters would be willing to endorse. Jameson's insight, I think, can be easily stretched beyond um, uh, Martin Bora to include Zebald and Kusk, Stepanova and Shishkin. What used to be called the self uh, is a heterogeneity about which it is best to take the Stoics' advice, but the parts which are beset by pain allow them, if they can, to give their own opinion about it. And I would say we can reopen the melancholic uh, uh, debate here, but um, uh, we can leave that aside for a second. So, so far, most of what uh, Buse is interested in uh, here as characterizing as post-fiction seems relatively familiar, right? Disconnection and imminence, for instance, were essential to the avant-garde. The reliance on photographs and other objects of the world seem related to factography. The loss of a central self seems as much post-traumatic as post-fictional. So if Buse is putting his finger on something of our current moment with this idea of post-fiction, then what is it? Uh, I think his most productive insight actually might be one that he chooses for his title, Free and Direct. In post-fiction, Buse argues free and direct discourse is no longer an isolated phenomenon, no longer confined to moments of insight when the narration blends with the character's perspective as sort of traditional free and direct discourse is. Free and direct is now a pervasive mode of narrative. So this is kind of a long quote, but I think it's, it's interesting. Uh, writers of fiction in, in the present period, he writes, are addressing the problem of thought, which is to say the problem of point of view, by giving up any claim to the representation or the democratizing of perspectives. What we are seeing in contemporary writing is the appearance of what Bakhtin called a zone of maximally close contact between the represented object and contemporary reality in all its inconclusiveness. Literature, in other words, has reached the point of bringing into being of inventing a thought that cannot be inhabited subjectively. In this book, that's uh, uh, Buse's book, the term free indirect liberated from its use as a modifier of, in the technical concepts of free indirect style and free indirect discourse will give expression to a decentering and deauthorization of literary discourse to the possibility of a thought, a point of view no longer saddled by affiliation or even antipathy to the novelistic forms enumerated earlier or to the concepts on which the critical practices of commentary interpretation and theorization depend, voice and subject, character and type, story and world, fiction and reality. This idea of free and direct is a pervasive mode of ideas that cannot be identified with any individual subjectivity or end of subjectivities that cannot be stabilized is I think Buse's most uh, interesting contribution in this book. But I think it also points to his biggest oversight. So, now we move on to attention. Uh, though curiously, Buse never mentions it, and it must have taken a, a scrupulous effort on, on his part. Um, his notion of post-fiction, uh, he never mentions the word internet uh, and online comes up once in the footnotes. Um, but his notion of post-fiction cannot be separated from the internet age, I think. The obvious corollary of post-fiction is post-fact, which is an, an outgrowth of online and especially social media in which layers of intermediation make imminence all but impossible and facts elusive. The difficulty of fiction 
narrative character that Views points out, I think has everything to do with how we construct ourselves, others, the world um, online. What are our online presences after all, if not fictional persona that sometimes coincide with, sometimes diverge from our own lived reality? The pervasive sense of free and direct discourse that Views takes as the title of his book, I think is especially characteristic of the endless stream of online discourse in which it is difficult to pin down from whom any utterance originates and whom it might be ventriloquizing. Online, it can be difficult to know whether we are communicating in earnest, whether what we say will be misinterpreted and what other, whether others mean what they say. So for the, uh, so I think this is actually really interesting to come after Irina's presentation when uh, we're kind of questioning the, the authorship of this book. Um, and I, I do wanna come back to that, uh, I think a little bit later, but um, for the philosopher, Justin E.H. Smith, uh, this possibility of determining, or this impossibility, sorry, of determining who is speaking and how is one of the characteristics of the internet. Because of the intermediation of digital avatars and algorithmic tools, he writes, we cannot fully know whether we are communicating with another eye, the performance of another eye by a real person or indeed a bot, right? The AI version of Sklowski again coming up here. Uh, for Smith, this situation deeply disturbs our experience of self and others, of reality and fiction. Furthermore, the difficulty of this second person encounter, as he calls it, is exasperated by other, by the other defining characteristic of the internet, the fleeting but incessant demands on our attention. Attention is, is especially important for Smith because he sees it as not only a perceptual, but an ethical category. Not only because uh, the imperative to quote, pay attention to something going on in the world often carries an ethical weight in the online discourse as if as in, uh, if you're not paying attention to this, you're, or if you're not angry about this, you're not paying attention, well-worn stamp. But more important because attention, as opposed to adjacent categories uh, like focus or Csikszent Mikhail's uh, uh, flow, uh, implies a second person encounter. So attention opens up the attender to the object so that it may, as it were, go to work on the individual, bringing that person into a changed state and thus exercising a power we ordinarily restrict to others of a second person stamp. While books and features of the natural world invite and even cultivate sustained attention, the internet, by contrast, seems to be structured so as to positively forbid such cultivation. The clear and perceptible effects of the internet on our faculties of attention have produced a flurry of scholarship in, in recent years, detailing the history of the so-called attention economy, ways to find freedom within it, as well as several philosophical investigations into the nature and meaning of attention itself. Among the best of this last category is, I think, uh, Carolyn Dicey Jennings' The Attending Mind, in which she goes one step further than Smith. For Dicey Jennings, Attention is not only essential for the cultivation of second person encounters, it is the best evidence, quote, for the existence of a subject as a source of causal power. Attention, she writes, involves a directing of the mind. Directing one's own mind uh, through attention is often the first step to changing one's behavior. When we make an effort to change our behavior, we start by directing or redirecting our attention. When we want others to make an effort to change their behavior, we ask them to pay attention. We speak of attention deficit when uh, someone seems unable to change their behavior in this way. Since the ability to change one's behavior through effort is the calling card of the subject, and attention is a key component of such change, attention is a natural place to look for the role of the subject. I promise close to you will we'll be here sometime. No, uh, so Dicey Jennings actually also provides uh, an enticing bit of etymology in her investigation of attention. Attention, she writes, traces its roots through the Latin word attend, for attend, attendo, to tendo, which, quote, has to do with stretching or aiming, as with a bow and arrow. This connection can still be felt in the English uh, term tension. Of course, etymological argument should be approached with a kind of post-structuralist -post skepticism, uh, and they rarely work across languages. This one I think is worth mentioning, not only because it leads back to Shklovsky, but also because Dicey Jennings develops it into a broader metaphor. She writes, I find this to be a good starting point for thinking about attention. 
Attention stretches the mind just as one might pull a bow while aiming at a target. In my view, the subject is that which pulls the bow. So finally, we got there, right? We got there. Um, so in Chlosky's account of his title image, weirdly, no one pulls the bow. It's, it's kind of odd, right? Palka trost jedinstva, eta adna palka, truna vila titiva, et jedinstva. Sognata eti pivoi, palka et luk, et nova jedinstva. Garmonia luka, eta sognata palka, sognata eti pivoi. Garmonia luka jedinstva i protiverečja. Eta kinetička energija, katera je gotova stati dinamička. So that's weird, right? The potential energy in this model as the work of art remains potential. If this image, as Shklovsky said, says provides the initial model for a work of art, then its potential energy needs someone or something to pull the bow. For Shklovsky, I would argue, attention plays almost as important a role as it does for Dicey Jennings. In many ways, his theory of prose might be thought of as a theory of narrative forms of attention. And I'll return to this in a second, but for a while, let's, let's stay with bowstring. Um, so in bowstring, he constantly talks about uh, zenimatinus, right, in the section on plot construction. And earlier, right after, in, in the same section where he uh, first brings up the titiba, although it's, it's still not stretched in any way, um, the, the sort of subsection that is called Shom Asobinist Iskustva Ishtotakle Yidinsto Kaisuginia, he writes, you know, not only that the beginning, middle, and end in Aristotle's mind, uh, you know, in Aristotle's model are not necessary, but in fact, a trivist, a trivistus. And when the bow is finally stretched and an arrow even flies, this is uh, uh, when he's discussing uh, the Joseph story in the biblical uh, version of the Joseph story, but, but not in man's version. Um, it is a uh, slowed perception, right? Tarmagenia, zamidenia. Uh, right? All of these things, uh, the difficulty of recognition that finally pulls the bow. And here I would agree with uh, Ilya's point that, that recognition here, Uznavania, actually plays a role that sounds a lot more like Astranienia from, from earlier uh, on. Um, and I think this brings us back, this is one of those uh, sort of uh, echoes that brings us back uh, to, um, to his most famous work, right? Um, on defamiliarization which I think can also be seen very much as a meditation on attention. Dershkovsky, of course, frames the central problem of Iskuswa Kakriyom as perception. He's really interested in the active role of the subject, uh, what Dicey Jennings frames as attention, which is opposed in, in her vision to perception. So, you know, to, to return to the famous example of, uh, from Tolstoy's diary with which he sort of introduces his thesis, um, so he writes, если бы кто сознательно видел, то можно было бы восстановить. Если же никто не видал или видел, но бессознательно, если целая жизнь многих проходит бессознательно, то эта жизнь как бы не была. Though not discussed in these terms, Tolstoy's phrase, watched consciously, right, видел uh, сознательно, uh, uh, might be thought of as paid attention. Without attention, then, uh, life becomes nothing and disappears, right? right? Uh, automatization eats away at things, clothes, furniture, your wife, the fear of war. And so this thing we call art exists in order to restore the sensation of life, in order to make us feel things, in order to make the stone stony. In other words, in order to make us pay attention. So, if, as we've seen, the, the look, the, the bow, uh, is the initial model of the work of art, then this thing we call art, we might say, uh, it gives us the bow that activates our subjectivity. So returning to post-fiction, we might say that the refusal of familiar uh, fictional patterns, defamiliarization, I'm sorry, uh, refusal of familiar fictional patterns defamiliarizes fiction itself. As defamiliarization does for things of the world, post-fiction sort of slows our perception of fictionality, troubling the relationships between fiction and the real. As it does so, it focuses readerly attention, pulls the bowstring, so to speak, in the direction of fictionality itself. It asks what role fiction has to play in our contemporary world. 
what is the relationship between fiction and self-formation, between the forms of the novel and forms of thought, and ultimately between the reality we live and the stories we tell about it. Writing on Zebold's uh, Ausstrugitz, uh, James Wood says that by the end of the novel, and I think we could uh, apply this also to Kutiva, quote, a life has been filled in for us, but not a self. But that very la lack of a self at the center is defamiliarizing. It draws the reader in, focusing attention. Quote, what is so delicate is how Zebald makes Austerlitz's story a broken, recessed enigma whose meaning the reader must impossibly re rescue. The impossibility of that rescue pulls the bowstring in the direction of the lost and broken self. But what about the two parts of the Nove Yedinstva, of the work of art, the tension between the old and the new uh, that are among the, the sort of major focuses of this book? And a major aspect, I think, of Shklovsky's image of the bowstring. So, as Shklovsky writes, Sujeti uh, esposio pretibrechi epoch, kladbai v nich patom nove pretibrechi, no esposio stare strukture. Mu živjom sasustovanje raznih primjon, nastajaše je prijadivajati prošle, sjedajati prošle karkrije. I see something similar happening here with post-fiction, right? These novels are using contradictions of the time, the tension between fact and fiction, born of, I would argue, internet communication and the ways it inhabits both, inhibits both attention and second-person encounters, but they are nonetheless writing novels. In this way, post-fiction pre-adelivayet or overcomes uh, fiction, consuming it. But I'd like to pause on, on the word siedai here, right? Uh, the present consumes the old, overcoming it, but this last phrase, karkhyeb, suggests that as the present overtakes the old, consuming it, it also derives important nutrients. And he gives similar images elsewhere, uh, as we've seen, right? Dostoevsky shital sibye novom realistom, uničtožajašim starejo predstavljenje nov toža vreme in pitajošim, right? And also, paetika uh, Aristotelia, uh, in merla, astalas kliebom. So the old is the sustenance of the new in all of these ideals here. But if we read Shklovsky diachronically, which I think he's asking us to do, um, uh, and per perhaps it's against the grain, perhaps not, we notice, of course, that Siedaya uh, is also what automatization does to things this world, right? Um, the objects, people, and feelings that the work of art through defamiliarization should be able to revive. So seen in this way, uh, the post-fiction that is the subject of uses and Jameson's and Wood's critical writing might be seen as at once a new form consuming and deriving nutrients from the old forms of the novel, while at the same time defamiliarizing those old forms, reviving them within the new. The new, in other words, uh, provides the bow, but it is the old within the new that provides the means to pull it, directing our attention to everything old, that, uh, uh that um, old forms have provided and that is being devoured, consumed, eaten away at, or more optimistically, overcome by the new. All right, I'll leave you there. Thank you. Okay. Questions, comments? Misha? Oh, no, no, <laughs> not yet, not yet. Mark. Mark. Thank you, Brenda, thanks so much. And the, the, the parallelism with post-fiction is, is provocative, but I, I think that there is a decisive difference because in post-fiction, the, 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 actually the, the borderline between fiction and non-fiction is blurred, right? While in Shklovsky, it's not blurred. And while fiction is, is exactly what it is, right? So as we, he may surround it with lots of, we, we may argue whether he is non-fictional uh, in his supposedly non-fictional parts, right? Whether he is fantasizing or, or correcting whatever happened. But uh, when he treats fiction, he treats fiction as fiction. And he speaks about the laws of making the fiction, you know, effective, real, et cetera, et cetera. But, but this distinction is, is, is quite formative for him. And uh, this book is uh, an emblematic example, right? We have this lengthy, retellings of fictional texts as if nobody read them. So, uh, he, he definitely enjoys sort of reproducing this effect of fiction. So how do you deal with this? 
Yeah, yeah, I, I, th I think that's that's absolutely right. For, for him, these two categories are, are separate. Um, what I was kind of trying to, what I was interested in here is, is trying to think of uh, what he might do with or how he might treat this uh, idea of post-fiction, which is not something he obviously encounters in, in real life, but sort of uh, thinking through uh, Shklovsky's possible approach to this idea of, uh, you know, post-fiction being something like the old and the new, like the uh, a, a sort of um, a new form emerging in, in, a, in a way that he sort of discusses in the, the new genre section, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so what would that do if, if this new genre absolutely does trouble those distinctions that he maintains, not only in this book, but, but, but throughout most of his writing, right? Um, and is that, would, would this, would sort of post-fiction trouble the, the theoretical categories that he's working with? Or would the theoretical categories that, that he's interested in still be operative in some way? But but then 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 I have a counter argument. Uh -huh. Indeed, he treated something that that looks very much like post fiction, Rosanov, mm. and he built the entire theory of the novel around Rosanov. Mm. Mm -hmm. And to add to this, mm -hmm. uh, think about his um, debate with um, Gerke. Mm. Right, who was saying, well, yeah, if it's not fiction that I'm doing, right, it's like life path and words, you know, all kind of stuff. Like, well, he doesn't use this word, but he says it basically, no, it's post fiction. And so, yeah. it's sort of like it's a constructive mm -hmm. kind of a representation of reality. Mm -hmm. You're just not aware of this, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. To me, like when what you're talking about, I reminded, um, I don't remember whether it's in this book or elsewhere, he talks about the distinction of differences between film and circus. Mm. Right, and he says, like, well, in circus, actually, you know, all these heavy things that you have to lift are real. <laughs> That's the whole point, right? So, like, you need to be able to demonstrate that actually, you know, you know how to handle it. In film, you can montage. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter. That could be just anything, right? Because it's all about the effects. So, in that sense, kind of distinction makes sense for me, like this film mm -hmm. supposed to. So, I, I was curious why why you need the internet when you already have cinematic kind of versions. Of this, but my question is about something else. Uh, <laughs> I, I'm not familiar with the post fiction mm -hmm. literature, really. But when I was listening uh, to you, I felt like you know, this guy, like the train direct mm -hmm. uh, person, it's basically a rip off, if not to, um, to say appropriation of what the post colonial scholars have been saying throughout the 90s namely, that the post colonial subject you might be free, but rarely direct. In your forms of expression because you borrow the imperial structures to express whatever it is that you have to express right so now we have again like um, white like guys mm -hmm. who are appropriating mm -hmm. sort of the logic of the post-colonial subject mm -hmm. right so i wonder if that sort of kind of mm -hmm. part of um, your equation and then um of course um i was thinking about your attention so how do you rhyme attention and your interest in atten attention with um which seems to me very very similar uh, um, the formalist um, uh, concept of ustanovka, mm. and like again, like you get the same ustanovka material. It could be the, the target could be different. It could be ustanovka material, could be ustanovka material, and so on and so forth, right? But it works kind of. It's again, like, sort of the ideas can can be built more connections with the formalist thing. Yeah. And the last one, um, um, again, sort of post fiction. I was thinking, oh, right, but didn't we have already sort of a version of that called literatura? Yeah, and of course, uh, yeah, and uh, you know, that's been part of that prosa also, of course, like there, there are all these, all these categories. So I think that that actually um, goes back to the, the first question about the, the film um, and why do you need the internet here? Uh, and that, this is why I think uh, without, without the internet, there's, there's very little that we can kind of think of as this new or, or at all sort of of the current moment in, in the post-fictional. Uh, analysis because all of this has happened before in different right. ages. Um, but what I think is is uh, sort of interesting about about the uh, the internet aspect of it and why I kind of tried to clash it with this attention and economy stuff um, is because uh, the internet does something to um, subjectivity uh, and uh, sort of second person encounters that I think film doesn't or at least doesn't doesn't do in quite the same way. Um, and so I think I think that's seems to be an oversight in, in, in views, at least in my reading of, of views. Um, but I think that if you think that there is something going on with, with sort of post-fiction in the last 20 years or so, then it has to be related in some way to our technological moment. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and so I think uh, it's interesting because, uh, yeah, we, we talked about the first thing in a second, but I think this also goes to the Ustanovka, right? So attention for these uh, theorists of attention that, that I've been reading has a lot to do with this, this sense of um, subjectivity, if not uh, a, a sort of internal, at least subjective sense of, of free will. So it's, it's a moment when you can feel yourself making an effort to, to change your behavior, right? Um, and this is, uh, Ustanovka I think is a little bit different because this is the Ustanovka of, of something that is made by somebody else or, or something that is, is um, a created object, right? Um, whereas attention is the, the focus um, that uh, it's a sort of internal uh, effort that, that the subject is making on a, on a regular basis. And the uh, experience of online existence um, is having that sort of your your ideal form of directing that attention uh, diverted at all moments, right? Um, and so that that sense of sort of a, a constant draining away of subjectivity, draining away of your your feeling of your own free will, this sort of subjective experience of your own free will, I think is 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 at least one of the things that is the difference here. Um, and I, yeah, I mean, I think I think one of the things that that's really it caught my attention here is this the sense of that I think we've been talking about in these other presentations um, of uh, you know Shklovsky's sort of distractibility throughout this throughout this work um, and the inability to kind of pin down both um, his sort of the constant constancy of, of his own sort of narrating presence or, or the directing presence right there's there doesn't seem to be a uh, yeah, exactly, right, right, uh, and um, and that makes it hard for a reader also to to sort of identify with the commitment. And to me, that to to go to Mark's question, of course, this is not a sort of work of postfiction. He's not treating postfiction directly, but I think that this uh, the difficulty of pinning down or or sort of a, the non constancy of a, of a narrating presence here uh, resonated with that in in some way. So that's that's kind of what I was trying to bring up. Yeah. Ilya and um, yeah. um, am I right uh, in understanding you that, that one of the main features of the uh, of post fiction is problematization of narrator's self? Uh, for me, this is a um, very difficult point uh, in regarding the theory uh, because in the uh, self. Uh, narrator in Kloskis, uh, the whole thing for me is not problematized. It is very thoroughly and intentionally constructed as it was uh, uh, demonstrated in previous um, talks to, to, today. But uh, it's constructed, but it's not problematized. This is a very, uh, uh, how to say, in, uh, highly integrated image. Uh, very thoroughly constructed, but integrated, not problematized, not broken. Yeah. Emily? Yeah, Emily. Yeah. And, and, yeah. and then you're yeah. okay. It seems that that, and then you're that, uh, that idea of post-fiction goes well with the earlier works of Shkolsky, like Sue, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. 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 As Sergei was saying, I was going to say something similar. It's hard to kind of um, see what's new in post fiction if you think about that moment of the crisis of the novel and you know everything. The novel has fallen apart, but let's 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 point to the interstices, right? Mm -hmm. And um, but in Kitsi Walsh, he actually says, "Well, I I always joke that you know I wrote Zoo by the formal method, but really, and it wasn't about love, but of course it was about love, and really it was about me, and you know." So he's kind of reclaiming the self. At this later moment, in some way, um, I, I was I, I really enjoyed your talk, and you know because these some of this uh, like all of this work on attention was new to me, and the idea of post fiction is newer to me than the idea of auto fiction. So I I wondered there seems to be a lot of overlap. I wonder if you can kind of tease out the differences between auto fiction and post fiction. Um, and the other comment I was going to make is just kind of a um, to, to remind us of a funny moment in the text, it's about attention and eating and, and bread, <laughs> where Shkosky says, you know, we were hungry and we were cold, and there was a moment when there was like hay in the bread, and you could only eat it if you were 
meanwhile right. occupied with something yeah. else. <laughs> so I don't know, just to think about distraction and, and eating, and I don't know if there's anything you can do with that, but you know, with torch lights, yeah, yeah, that, uh, you know, or what is it, the present is the past or the present? Yeah. <laughs> the present, the present. The present. It's nourishment. Nourishment. The present nourishes on the past. Nour right. Nourishes. It's, he remembers hunger. Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah. 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 Right. Yeah. So I mean, it's it's the part of a um time is you know auto fiction or post fiction. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, so to solve the post fiction. <laughs> <laughs> to 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 think about that uh, uh -huh. that that question. I mean, obviously, this is these are not uh, categories, sort of mutually exclusive categories or binary uh, uh, mm -hmm. distinctions in any way. Um, but I think that the, the uh, characteristic of post-fiction that, that at least views would would uh, point to is a um, uh, a sort of overwhelming skepticism or suspicion of of the self as a as a wholeness or as as something that can be recovered or defined. Um, and so I think uh, autofiction is not as wouldn't be as uh, uh, skeptical or or uh, suspicious of its own experiences its own sort of memories and and uh the ways that those are recoverable and the the idea at least by uh in, in a lot of this post fiction or a lot of the talk about the post fiction that i've that i've you know been able to read it's relatively mm -hmm. new for me as well um is this sort of uh the the inability to to formulate a narrative right which i know is, is definitely part of a lot of auto fiction as well and there's a lot of struggling with that but the ultimate, uh, the ultimate um, end to it sort of seems to be uh, almost always a, a failure to construct um, something entire, right? Um, and so maybe, maybe that that would be the distinction. There is is primacy, primacy. You know, wh where does that fit in? Uh, I'm I'm not exactly sure. I mean, I think uh, it would be probably you know if if Buse knew that work he'd probably try to put it under under his post-fictional sort of rubric um i'm not sure if that uh if that would you know illuminate anything new about that particular book rather than than you know thinking about it as auto fiction now um but there does seem to be sort of a, 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 this scrupulous <laughs> uncertainty right is is this sort of um guiding principle throughout that book right like not even be able not even being able to trust um you know the people who are there. Uh, this sort of discussion, um, uh, Stefanova's discussion with her her father about his role in the book, and then his rejection of that role, um, and then that rejection finds its way into the book as well, right? Like that that sort of um, uh, uh, distrust of one's own experience, and then going out to somebody else's experience, distrusting that, and all of those sort of moments of distrust making their way into the book and being part of the fabric of the book. I think is a lot of a lot of what um, uh, views is, is is interested in. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you. I don't know much about post fiction. I loved your very Shklovskian ending about how what's uh, exciting about the new stuff is the old stuff, mm -hmm. right? And I really kind of sort of foreshadowing my, my talk tomorrow. I'm really kind of kind of wondering about the actual break with between the avant-garde formalist language and the language of realism, like Shklovsky, early Shklovsky starts with saying that, okay, so realism is just out, right? And for me, Titiwa is an attempt to walk all of it back. So it's a book about realism. So when you talk about the subject that uh, is uh, should fall apart, that's what Shklovsky in, in, in Titiwa uses, if I'm, not, if I'm not confusing things, he uses a quote from Pushkin to illustrate, to make that point. Pushkin's comparison between Moliere and Shakespeare about how in Shakespeare characters actually are not about one feature, but there's like assemblage of different aspects. And that's what makes Shakespeare's great, right? So you have that. And then you also have the actual theory of the realist novel that is sort of, okay, that's what we are getting past. Uh, like for a century now or something, but when you look into the theory of the novel, uh, something like Chernyshevsky, Philosophy of Nashenia, Skustro, Distinctness, that's what you see, right? Art shows us what we cannot, what we, the routine that we are failing to, to recognize in usual life, that's what we need art, and that is representation. So something that early Shklovsky sort of turned his back on, allegedly, right? And then it came back to it in, in Tsitsiva, and yes, the second, the next question is, what do we do with that? Uh, why do we need to to see the routine, uh, to see the routinized things? 
And of course, it is in uh, 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 Fortunashevsky, it's of course to change things, right? It's a way to towards political agency and a collective one, not an individual one. It's not like a matter of individual contemplation, but a matter of uh, social cognition. And that is also central for, for TTY, right? Let's kind of, uh, uh, emphasizes the social cognition, right? As, as, uh, as a, 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 a consequence, as a product of, of this uh, work of art that he is, he is theorizing. So the question is kind of what is where, uh, kind of again, going back to this kind of relationship between old, uh, the old and the new, right? The tension of kind of how this is sort of going back to the same uh, challenges. Mr. Grimaud, you, you look. Um, yes. It, I just talked, it, it doesn't need to respond to what was said. <laughs> no, it's okay. Oh, it's okay? Okay. <laughs> so, um, Bradley, I really enjoyed your talk, and I also kind of liked thinking as an experiment of what Shkowski would say in response to post-fiction and attention, and I agree, I think, with the guy and, and, and Emily that, um, that it seems to me that this kind of uncertainty, and I don't even know if Shklovsky really creates uncertainty, but rather this kind of self-conflict, that it is staged and it actually can um, build the subject as opposed to remove his subjectivity, right? And it's, it's because in Shklovsky, I see all, I just see litos, right? It's all the understatements through which actually he establishes his subjectivity. Right, so um, that's number the first thing I want to say. But I also was interested in, in how in your theorists of attention and um, how they theorize attention that has nothing to do actually with ethics at all. Even though attention usually presupposes that you're being attentive to someone or something, right? It's not just that you're building yourself, but you are. Right, that there is some kind of relationship you're attentive to something. And I feel like in, in Shklovsky, and I know that we like to talk about how, you know, how he had problematic um, ethics, but actually, I think that his defamiliarization is an ethical concept, not just aesthetic, right? Because humanization devours, it's because it's, it's a bad thing when humanization, uh, when habitualization devours your wife and the fear of war in the middle of war, right? So I'm curious to, I don't know, like how would you respond to that, right? Because it seems to me that Shklovsky wouldn't necessarily like those theories of attention that don't have anything at all to do with ethics, that it's just about self-development as opposed to, as opposed to relationship with whatever it is that you need to um, be attentive to. Yeah, I think uh, this is this is great, and actually, I think this this relates to Kirill's question about sort of where does this leave us on a on a um, uh, social, ethical, political uh, level? Um, uh, because so I completely agree that Aspidanian is an ethical category, um, but I I would say that also these theories of attention are deeply interested in, in the ethics of attention as well. Um, so the uh, Justin E. H. Smith, the the first the, the internet guy that I was talking about, he is really interested in. Uh, attention as this um, sort of, you know, this mode of, and this is why it's different from focus for him. So focus is a sort of um, an, an instrumental relationship to the thing that you're focusing on. And so like he's, he's talking about obviously internet world, but focus is something coders are big into, right? And they, they get into like a focus zone and they're, they're doing the coding, right? And it's not, they're, they're not sort of giving attention to something that might unfold or open up to them in interesting ways. Attention, though, is a more uh, sort of receptive mode of, uh, of sort of focusing the mind, right? Um, and so what he's really interested in is the, the way that attention is giving yourself, sort of opening yourself up to over, giving yourself over to something else, someone else who might open themselves up in a, in a new, different, interesting way. So obviously this has like echoes of, of Martin Buber and, and Levinas and, and Bakhtin as well, right? So this sort of second person encounter is a big part of what Justin H. Smith is about. Um, and, and I think that, that that really is an ethical category uh, for, for, for him. And this is one of the things that makes this sort of internet's uh, suck on our ability to pay attention and our ability to, to cultivate sustained attention 
a real sort of philosophical ethical problem and not just something that, that bothers uh, you know, us getting goals, you know, getting our work done on, on a regular basis. Um, so I, I do think that, that that connection, the ethical connection is, is absolutely there. Dicey Jennings is interested in this as well, but she's interested in this. Uh, so Wayne Wu, who's the other, I, I put up his, his book that's just called Attention on there. Um, he is interested in attention as a sort of necessary category for action. You have to direct your attention before you can take action. Um, but Dicey Jennings is actually um, arguing against that. And she thinks that, uh, that attention is, uh, is a uh, category of perception that moves the, the sort of foregrounds to subject, but is not necessarily attached to action. And for her, that that's an ethical aspect of it as well. So, so it's a it's an opening up of the self to something that will act upon the self, not necessarily because you have to do something with that thing. Um, and so, I think that this is actually all really would actually interest Shklovsky and and uh, comes close to his idea of of Astrenyenia, in which um, the sort of uh, the uh, slowed perception uh, that is caused by the work of art. Uh, renews a sort of uh, perceptibility of, of the world, right? And renews these sort of ethical categories that have been eaten away by automat automatization. And the sort of effort of giving yourself, giving your attention to something that might open you up in that way, I think is, is, is similar um, to me. And this, this also, I think, uh, to Khalil's question um, about the old and the new, I mean, I do think that the, what, you know, Shkoski of Tetiva is, is interested in is how the old within the new is actually what draws our attention, right? Is, is we, we uh, because we can kind of see the old forms poking through the new or in tension with the new, uh, we, we are sucked in, we're drawn in, we're paying attention in a way to the old. Uh, and that, um, that allows kind of the, the uh, it redirects subjectivity, it redirects our kind of thinking uh, towards those categories that he obviously values in, in this book, right? It's those old categories that are kind of through um, And I don't know if that fully answers your question, but I think that's related to, to uh, Julia's question kind of brings us around to something similar. Mm -hmm. Julia's question, so I'm, I'm being in Michael. For me? Oh, yeah. You too. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> and Brad, uh, Brad, I think there are uh, many more points of uh, contact with Shklovsky here. And uh, um, maybe, um, uh, well, for instance, uh, the stuff uh, that he was writing during the times around the first Congress of Writers, uh, when he was addressing Razgavor's uh, Druziani. Uh, and his speech uh, at the first Congress is very interesting because he is postulating a total change of the canon of culture uh, in this new uh, um, framework and approach to culture based on, uh, on his uh, uh, postulate about the uh, arrival of a totally new subject of perception who has a totally different, uh, well, he speaks about sensibility, but basically it could be a more cognitive kind of term like attention. And since uh, um, the question for them at the beginning of the 30s is, is very much uh, not about how to um, make a, wor a work of art, but how to make people perceive and respond. And so the problem of the public, of the audience becomes very important. And maybe um, uh, when you read uh, his speech at the first Congress, you will see a very, very mm, nice way of depoliticizing the question of sensibilities, collective sensibilities and attention, naturalizing them by saying it's just a new generation that came. A new generation that they don't feel, they don't know what we know, what for us is just cliches and uh, totally recognizable for them. It's excitingly new, they don't know anything. So they perceive the world in a different way and we have to respond somehow. So it might be some kind of comparative context uh, on the one hand. On the other hand, as I understand, there's an interesting parallel here, I think, I don't know much, uh, but uh, from what you are, uh, how you describe post fiction, you say uh, fact and fiction, yeah, I, was, I, I would say maybe a combination, some kind of a balance between artistic imagination and research. 
because whatever your uh, text where you were quoting is very much based on research. And we know that writing schools nowadays, they teach research for writing as part of fiction, uh, fiction making. And so in this sense, it reminds me very much the structure uh, of artistic research, uh, which is also, it's not art in the sense that uh, students who um, receive their degrees in artistic research, they do not receive their uh, degrees in art. It's not art. It's artistic research, but it's this mixture of artistic intention on the one hand and art uh, ability to draw attention and make things interesting, just like um, Jameson's text about Bora, because he is discussing there, I just read it very, very uh, briefly, but I understood for him this combination of research, historical research about uh, um, the history of the war, right? And this uh, fictional uh, character, this Bora, who seems to be, uh, it's also connected with this uh, economy of attention, which is implied in the structure of a serial. Mm -hmm. So you also have, apart from the internet, where you just have to like, and the amount of likes counts. Here you have to hold the attention for a long time, and that means you have to be, you know, so I thought it might be also interesting and comparable to artistic research because artistic research is supposed to be producing interesting, original, genuine, unusual, and very, very useful and very attractive innovations so that they would be easily commodifiable and that the sense in the same way contain a grain of useful work in research. Mm -hmm. yeah. So there might be a- No, that's very, that's very useful. Thank you. Just two things. One is that I think I remember reading that Zabald was a very distracted driver. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but the second, I was, I had a different, I was thinking about uh, Eugenia's paper, and I was curious about uh, one thing that I, from what I'm still trying to get my head around, is that it is encouraging us to be skeptical about a memoir for various reasons. And some of the way you're describing attention or your sources are is really, it's almost axiomatically good, but I'm wondering what are the problems about this model of attention for which maybe Shkovsky could be sort of a way to balance against the economy of attention that you, you know, that we might see at the present moment? And one reason I'm asking that is, like, what do you do with all of those kind of fake memoirs, so uh, James, whatever, and his broken pieces? I don't even know the title, but, but those hold you completely enraptured and then I haven't read it, so I've, I've heard it in raptures. Um, but like, what do you do with that kind of attentiveness in which it turns out to be a total lie and all of the scandals, like you're open to it and yet it is a completely manufactured, well, it's a fiction. And so I'm kind of curious, what do you do with the memoir as lie and all of those sorts of celebrated cases recently about, about those? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the, the, these are uh, yeah, great, yeah. these are yeah these are great, uh, really interesting questions. Um, I think that uh, so these are again related, or at least I can I can see them as, as being related to these two questions. At least the part that uh, Irina's question was about artistic imagination and research. So uh, Zebov, the distracted driver, is a very distracted narrator as well, right? And he is uh, the the sort of um, and this is true with Pamiti Pamiti as well, that the narrative of, of most of his works and, and, and Stepanovus as well is the act of research. So it's not just about, it's not just that there is research sort of involved in it, but the act of doing the research um, is, is a big part of that. Zebald's narrators, if, if anybody uh, wants to bring it down to this level, they sound a lot like uh, true, true uh, crime podcasters, right? They're like going through a, a mountain of evidence and chasing down every single lead and talking to you the whole time about why they're doubting every single moment, right? Uh, and so if you listen to the first season of, of, of Serial and then you read as, as evolved narrative, you're, you're doing very similar things. So I think that those, those like the process of research and the process of scrupulous uncertainty during the research is becomes the narrative itself. Um, and this this is an interesting thing where this sort of, um, uh, even when it's fictional, right, it, it becomes uh, the, the sort of um, the, the non-fictional skeleton of what will eventually or could eventually create a narrative is actually becoming the narrative itself. Um, 
but let's see. Uh, there's what was the second part of, of what you said, Michael? Because I was in the false, false memoirs. Oh, the false memoirs. Yeah. So, so I think this is this is actually like a big part of it. The false memoirs um, go to me at least uh, back to this difficulty of pinning down who who is speaking, um, and you know, it it uh, a lot of sort of um, uh, the the internet uh, discourse that I was thinking about has this difficulty of, of who is the subjectivity, what is the subjectivity behind it? Is it a, per, is it a performed persona? Is it real? Um, and the uh, I, I learned this recently through one of these attention books, but uh, an early um, version, uh, early bloggers called themselves uh, escribitionists. Um, and so this, this idea of, of um, Sort of revealing the self through graphomania, basically, is um, is an is an early iteration of the the internet. This is obviously a, an English language term, um, but you can see similar things on on JJ in in, in uh, the Russian uh, blogosphere as well. Um, and this notion of revealing the self through constant writing quickly slides into inhabiting a persona through constant writing. Um, and this, uh, I think that this is often what, what happens in these false memoirs, right? You get, you get. Uh, there was obviously a lot of blogs in, in the early uh, internet era that were sort of factually based on somebody's life, but then people also created personae. And when you're re when you're a sort of reader on the internet, what, how do you how do you separate those things? And this is a similar thing to you know James Frey's memoir or or anything like that, where you can't really decide. Uh, what is what? Are you sucked in? Are you? Is your attention sort of drawn in because you believe in the wholeness of the subjectivity that is taking you through there? Um, obviously, that that you know played into that scandal because once once that you know once that was revealed to be a lie, once that's a fictional persona, then, then it doesn't work in the same way. Um, and I think we get like those those are moments in as in, in a Latin way, right? Scandals are these moments that kind of tell us. Uh, where the border, where the borders are, or, or where they're being transgressed, um, and there's there's a there's an argument that's often made when these things come out. It's like if it was a compelling reading experience, why shouldn't it be if it's fiction, right? But but there's obviously a uh, a set of um, assumptions uh, and and sort of demands that the reader brings into those um, that that get totally shattered. And I think that, that those, those moments um, are, are what a lot of these post-fictional writers are kind of playing with, right? Um, what, what, can, can they tease out those differences, right? And, and can you make that thing that was a scandal in James Frey's case into an, uh, an aesthetic experiment um, that, that can do something actually interesting for, for the reader and the purposeful level? Bradley, but uh, the early internet you were talking about was largely anonymous. So when we think about the yeah. fact that all of these people were exhibitionists, but not actually revealing themselves, there's already also, you know, a level of fictionalization that is coming to the idea of subjectivity that's, you know, are at the birth of the internet also. Yeah, this is this is a really interesting thing I think about the the early internet, uh, and this goes back even before the blogs to sort of AOL chat rooms, right, where everybody was kind of putting on a persona to chat with each other, and oftentimes it was heavily sexualized. And in order for it to work for both parties, you have to sort of suspend disbelief, right? Both people know that they're lying to each other about who they are, but in order for the sort of like chat sex to work, both people have to kind of buy into the fact that like. You know they're talking to somebody else, and and this this uh, sort of negotiated suspension of disbelief, this negotiated mutual fictionality, is a huge part of I think early internet, and it goes into blogs. It goes into you know I mean we have this this sense even even with some of the more advanced social media, which sometimes requires some sort of real reality check, um, but that that I think is inseparable from the idea that you know fiction itself and these these categories of subjectivity are being questioned. So I, I don't know, for, for me, the, the, um, the sort of uh, lines between fact and fiction being transgressed in the, in the sort of fiction of the last 10, 15 years is, is pretty hard to imagine if you don't think about uh, these, these technological experiences that we've all gone through. So. Yeah, on this note, um, we have to stop here um, and we have um, a break for 20 minutes and we'll yeah. start for 30. Thank you. Yeah. Thank <laughs> you.
attention. Uh, we have Lydia Kripikonia uh, with the presentation How to be an author, Sklovskis versus Bookstab. Yeah. Okay. So, hello, everyone. Thank you for um, having me. Uh, first of all, I should say that my presentation is not, of course, like as we can see from the title, it's not just on Sklovskis, but rather I was using Sklovskis as a, was trying to use Sklovskis as a kind of a device to like permeate the material that they have from Bushkab, because uh, in the case of Bushkab, there's a lot of material, but one doesn't necessarily know how to talk about it. So the first part is going to be on Shkolsky and Tiva, and the second part tries to relate that, or at least, uh, or or uh, rather contrast it with, uh, with the Boris Yakovic Um um So I think, I don't know, like, to what extent I was trying to follow the suggestion of Shkolsky, I don't know to what extent I have a Tiva, and even if I do have a Tiva in my hands, I don't know to what extent it is not yet there. Um, but anyway, I'm, I'm trying. Um, so let's start with, and also like I also need to say that I sent my presentation to um, through email to this computer, and for whatever reason, it messed up a lot of features of the script. So if you see something weird, like like <laughs> that, thua, it shouldn't be like that. Uh, it it became like that for whatever for whatever reason in the passage. Um, but anyway, so I think. Yeah, go to the news. Um, I would like to start with this quotation. So how we interpret what seems to be one of the central tenets of Shkolsky's Tituva, namely that there is no real repetition in art, that nothing ever comes back exactly the same, and that hence we must push against the meaning of Shtarienia, that scholars must be tempted to trace from work to work? Should we conclude that the mere extraction of a given utterance from a particular context and its relocation to a new one is indeed to have to endow the utterance in question with a new force? Should we interpret them, Shklovsky, in the reading key and say that there is, in fact, no context that is determined or indeed determinable enough to contrast the breaking forth the force of the written sign. Should we say that hence there is no real continuity between the author of the text that he or she has left to posterity, and that the intentions of the authors, no matter how great they were, matter not, and that accordingly we should care more about the purpose of a text for the present day. Similarly, if we accept that the repetition is in art is by default illusory, then should we consider that the divide between literary reception and literary production or literary creation is also bridged, that reception itself becomes a creative moment, one where the reader does not decipher, but rather reconstructs the meaning of the book starting from and in accordance with his or her own interests and views. If so, we could be tempted to reach it to our alongside contemporaneous work by, for instance, Yaus and other representatives of the constant school, and to draw an ever closer parallel between Shkotsky and the Rizzuzzi's aesthetic, which has been done so far. And so much like in France criticisms of contemporaneous to Shkotsky, the notion of the author would lose much of its aura and much of, it, much of its centrality. This is, of course, I suppose, one of the possible readings of Shkotsky's text. There is, however, another side to Titiara that I find clashing with the conclusion we have just reached about the importance and centrality of the notion of the author that's creating a tension that reverberates throughout the whole book. I would say. In Titiara, the author, in fact, is often represented as the alpha and omega of the creative process. The literary text is a module of the world as the author perceives it. Сюжет строения, которое сжимает время, вылечивая время или представляя время, в результате создает некоторые явления, ощутимые, проживаемые так, как этого хочет автор. And of course, here again, you can see like model mira, that model mira, that is a term that uh, Shklovsky borrows from um, uh, from scholars like Lotman and others who had been influenced by um, cybernetics. Or again, то, что создается, отбирается художником из окружающего мира для построения своей, своей модели действительности. Автор создает новую модель мира. In constructing the model, the author makes use of the structures and conventions that have been handed down to him or her by tradition. However, the model itself needs to challenge accepted by Tanshangen, and its source ultimately appears to be the will of the author himself. For reading and correctly interpreting the signals, again, another um, semiotically charged term that Shkolsky likes to employ in Tetiva, that the author has encoded in his model, the reader thus submits the will of the author. And here is when he talks about Sirov and the uh, painting. Мы принимаем эту условность, подчиняя с логике и воле художника, построившего изображение, воле Сирова, дашего нам веку и пути рассмотрения. Просто та композиция волевая. There is another uh, passage that I'm not including in my presentation where Shkovsky says something along the lines of um, uh, so like again, to which the reader 
uh, can uh, submit or must submit. Readers who argue Shkolsky multiple times in the book will have to submit to the will of the author and develop a set of skills to become attuned to the way the author models the world in his works. The author does his construct the model of the world by an actor is her own will and operates on conventions in order to up the chances that his work would be understood by the public. And he says, Convencia is a slow and examined nation of culture, который автор невольно заключает между собой темы, кому он делает сообщение, иногда трагическую установку. Only he or she as an author seems to be saying Shklovsky at times in this book, by an act who by an act of her will is able to articulate a new model of the world by making directed and conscious use of materials, conventions, and structures that have been handed down by previous generation and thereby, which is key, radically changing the function that these elements had in the past. There is an intentionality and directedness, and I'm not necessarily sure to whether this term is good in English, to Shklovsky's description of what the author does that does not really sit well with any full structure or structural declaration that lost significance or indeed of the death of the author. On the contrary, it often feels as if Shklovsky is talking to of authors with a capital A. Indeed, very often he refers to the greatest history personalities, Dante, Shakespeare, Cervantes, Pushkin, Tolstoy, Rabelais. One does not find many Matei Kamarovs or many Opsi Putinkovsky in the pages of Tituva. All of these authors, according to Shklovsky, were able to create a new model of the world by tapping into the contradiction present in previous works of art. And he says, Великое искусство противоречит своему времени, стоя впереди, вернее, уходя вперед. Для Шекспира дело не в том, что здесь демона полюбила Мавра. Он является другому. Почему Мав не поверил в любви с демоном? Почему он оказался доверчивым к словам, к словам об убате Яго, к спеке, к зонам миллиона света и спеки? Не поверил в свою любовь? At times, Shklovsky even, even uses the word creator when referring to others. For instance, in this passage, Again, like this model of the world. I do not have time to analyze the significance of the term in a context where quotation from the Bible and other religious terms are found. We could call Shklovsky's concept of the author romantic were not for the fact that he substituted divine inspiration, the well-oiled technique of the expert writer. Indeed, this almost titanic conception of the author is close to the conception of the creative act that the futurist following the simplest had, as I think uh, Jessica Mayle put uh, very well in this book. There is something, there is something of radical novelty that has to be achieved. There is, there is no necessarily no deterministic, no deterministic link between the history, like the tradition, and the utterance of someone at any given point in time. And in fact, I do agree with uh, what Oksana said before, like in the first panel, I think that Shklovsky is too aggressive uh, in a sense. There's something like for Bilbao Brezh to be um, melancho melancholic. Further, sure. and in keep with his style and the style of Russian formalism, Shklovsky does not distinguish between authors of literature and simply there's no clear like, you know, like divide between two, and authors of literary scholarship. For instance, when he talks about Thomas Mann uh, in, and when he's writing his novel, Josef und seine Bruder, uh, he says that Thomas Mann was performing an analysis of the world and the previous literary text, which is not dissimilar from what literary scholars do. Uh, accordingly, I think that Ichimbaum and Tignanov behaved like authors when they contributed to a radical revision in the reception of literary figures like Ethel Becker, Lermont, and even Tolstoy. Biakapson is not behaving like one when he writes the grammar of poetry and poetry of grammar. I never remember which one comes first, poetry or grammar. And anyway. And Ian Bastin is criticized for his alleged inability to engage with the functional changes happening in literature and for his over reliance on her historical concept and two broad generalizations. Even if it is not a manifesto, I think there is something programmatic about Tissiva. Now that books and ideas that were silenced in the past are coming to a more to the foreground, Shklovsky fears that he will lose the opportunity to engage meaningfully with them. If we, don't know, if we do not move past mere repetition of what has already been discussed. In short, whether we are talking of literature or literary theory, being an author in Titiva means taking a definite stance toward contradiction that we see in past discourses and reworking past materials to propose a new model of the world, a new discourse. Uh, I don't want to discuss whether or to what extent Shklovsky practices what he preaches. Instead, as I said before, I'm going to use Shklovsky as a sort of negative contrast medium to speak of another way of being an author. In an essay on literary theory in the 1960s and 1970s, uh, I found uh, this quotation from William Hill's Todd. I mean, this is not a self-standing um, uh, book, it's, a, it's, a, it's an article. Uh, and he writes that 
the prestige system of the Soviet intellectual life paid pay far greater respect to empirical work than did Western literary intelligence during this time, especially those developing the construction and other versions of narrative hermeneutics, archival discoveries, biographical information, and scholarly edition of major texts carried considerable prestige because, by and large, they permitted scholars who conducted this work to meet objective scholarly standards. In the Soviet Union, such empirical work was not only a virtue, it was a necessity for young literary scholars. Many of them were employed as research specialists at academic, academic institutes, and they were required to take part in collective projects of planned economy, in addition to major writers and so on and so forth. Uh, now, however important is after the literary work um, was in the Soviet Union, in a chapter, uh, we don't find any further characterization of this. And in fact, in general, where studies on the Tartu Moscow uh, school and on Bakhtin abound, the workers of many empiricists, if we can call them like this, has not elicited the same amount of scholarly interest. Uh, speaking of the author, the painstaking research work in archives and libraries, the addition of classics of Russian literature, and the writing of commentary, would suggest a conception of the author scholar that is in contrast with, with that presented by Schloss. Indeed, the author in question does not produce an autonomous text, but rather complete, comments, and even clarifies or even parasitizes an existing one. And if we need, like to put it very bluntly and simply, as Lotman writes in introduction of his own commentary to Hini it is not an independent text. Uh, but rather must be read in conjunction with Ayubin and Yegi. And I think that this to an extent is true. However, we maybe can look at it uh, a little bit more and maybe there might be more to it. Now, the Mlada Farmalis Barich Bustab is a very good example of a bibliographer and a scholar who devoted the great majority of his career to empirical research. Now, some, uh, some um, information about his bibliography, because uh, biography, because I don't know, um, whereas everyone is, is acquainted with uh, what he did. So he was born in 1904 in St. Petersburg and died in 1985. Uh, in 1922, he transferred from the University of Stavropol to uh, Petrograd University and he enrolled there. Three years later in 1924, he concluded his study in the ethnolinguistic department of the Faculty of Social Sciences, where he became acquainted with Paris Hembaum, who took him on as a student. So together with Lilia Ginsburg, Gustav became one of the so-called young formalists as soon as 1925, one year after completing his degree, Echimbal invited Jan Gustav to be part of the Research Institute for the Comparative Study of Languages at the University of Leningrad. And in the same year, Gustav, who from 1923 had also been attending classes in library sciences, so Biblioteca Giedzinia, applied for a post at the prestigious public library, the Publishnia Biblioteca in Leningrad. Um, the application was successful and in 1926. Uh, just after finishing his education in Biblioteca Viedinia, Buchstab began working in the consultation bibliographical department of the public library, a post he held until 1942 when he was evacuated because of the war. And what he concretely did uh, at that point was working on the incredibly rich literary material headed at the public library in order to either catalog it or prepare publication. Um, and as surprisingly, as we learned from his correspondence with Ida Ginsburg, for instance, his position at the library was a godsend for many of his friends would not hesitate to ask him to scout for research material on a specific topic in the rich meanders of the tradition. Now, upon his return to Leningrad of the war in 1944, Buchstab dressed his work at the public library until 1946, where he abandoned it once and for all in order to devote his time to his doctoral dissertation on the satirical works of Satyko Shigurin, which, however, was never really completed. He did obtain the Stephen Doctor, uh, like uh, Dr. Filovich Nauk, but that was on the basis of some other work. At the same time, and until his death, he started working at the Yeninga State Institute for Librarian Studies, uh, where he, he taught mostly. And in the 1950s and in the 1960s, he authored a number of handbooks for students, like Pasobia, for students of library sciences, of Biblioteca Viedinia, and continued edited and curated several important editions of Russian classics, especially Nikras of uh, Fet and Saltiko Shudrin. Uh, now, without a doubt, the bulk of Bukhstab's work is the bibli bibliographical and paratextual in nature. Alongside his pastoral for students in bibliography, he also contributed, as I said, to the publication under, of a number of bibliographies for Pazatili, edited a variety of literary texts. Now, in 1966, that is four years before Shkolsky published Itiva, Buchstab published a collection of what, of what I could define articles or like short pieces, um, curiously entitled Bibliographies for Scania, for Ruska Literature, Dibunatstava. We are going to have the edition here. The articles there, some of which are no longer the two small pages, all are related to some type of textual conundrum that needs to be solved. For instance, questions of authorship are solved on the basis of bibliographical and archival material, 
addressees at specific points are established, and so on. Buxab choice of title, Rezaskani, is interesting. The word Rezaskani, in fact, more than to a scholarly genre, signifies rather a type of preparatory work carried out by bibli bibliographers and resulted not in an autonomous collection of articles, but more often in a bibliographical fazati, in a series of bibliographical historiography that would later serve literature did, or in the edition of a particular text. In other words, the term refers to work ending in a bibliographical tool, like an ordinary tool, something which is twice subordinated to other texts. In the first in the first instance, it is subordinated to the text it classifies and that in the text that it should help, uh, like as a sketch, and so in second in second order to the text that it will help produce. I mean, the, the literature which is yeah, like research type of text that it will help produce. Um, notably, the article in Bookstab's collection, all had been already published as a standalone piece as well before 1966. Um, I think the first one was a piece which was uh, published in 1933. However, they either appeared in specific bibliographical collections were positioned in a peculiar manner. For instance, there is a piece on piece in Nikrasov that was originally published in 1951 in Nikrasov's Sbornik, um, which is the, the Sbornik itself is divided into two parts. One is devoted to, for instance, problem with what's for Nikrasov, and the other is to what is called Sabshen, uh, which is similar to some, what sometimes it's called material some sort of news or like new information regarding the biography or the work of uh, Nikrasov that not, does not necessarily, do not necessarily like, are not necessarily like regarded as um, like works of like on the poetics or on the work of Nikrasov or like on history of, of literature. Um, so this, and, 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 and his uh, work uh, in particular was uh, placed within the sub -shen. Now, the significance of the scope of bibliographical work carried out on literary sources and its relationship with the visit of literature Viedini were actually being frequently discussed among actors of Biblioteca Viedini in those years. For instance, in 1960, the Bibliography Pierkov published a monograph entitled Bibliografiska e Vristica, Ktiori e Mitodiki Bibliografiska Krasakhstani. In 1965, a colleague of Bustak, Bustak, the bibliographer, uh, Yusei Izakovich Riskin's uh, Oshirk in Metodi Literaturni Bibliography also saw the light. In the opening article, Bibliography Literatura Viedini, Riskin called for a more well rounded understanding of the role of bibliography working special in literary sources. Though conceding that the function of the scientific bibliography, Naushne Bibliographia, should be the publication of a text as opposed to the publication of a book or a monograph, Riskin consistently burst the boundaries between bibliography and Literatura Viedini. The expert bibliographer, the bibliographer, he says, conducts a work that is at the boundaries between the two disciplines, he is the author of important discoveries. I mean, so this is like a quotation from him, 1965, so just one year before Bookshop. So the 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 bibliography то она лишь предварительный этап, необходимое, но особенное средство, условия для работы исследователя. Библиография в ряде случаев сама выполняет определенные исследовательские задачи. Библиографические историко-литературные исследования и открытия часто приобретаются, иногда их трудно разделить. In 1966, in the preface which accompanies the collection, Bookstab extensively quoted from Riskin and repeated his work about the essential business of the work of the bibliographer and the work of the literature of the Pololov. Prošen, he writes, bibliografiški razaskanje v oblasti historije literatury tvoriti v obi sferi, i bibliografiju, i v historiji literatury. Bibliografiške metodi v podobnih razaskanjah suštajca i pripetajca s filologičskim i možu biti, če tudi bi pravili nazvati knjigo, bibliografiške i filologičske razaskanje. By blurring the boundaries between these two spheres, Buhstab, as it were, defended the right of a certain type of bibliographical work to appear independently for any further literary work and also independently of the text whose authorship or this is clarified. In 1982, uh, he went a little bit further. That here he published a volume of literature an expanded version, a slightly different version, meaning that he some of the works that he published in 1966 like were also in the collection in 1982, and some of them changed, but essentially they are pretty similar. Um, with the publishing house, uh, whereas um, 
1966, the publishing house of the Dolgiva. And he writes in the preface, the Dolgi Gord literaturgistic работы у меня накопилось group of статей, которые можно назвать разысканиями, расследованиями и научными детективами. И таких статей состоит в предлагании сборных. Каждый из них посвящен какому-либо произведению русской литературы XIX века. В каждом из этих произведений есть что-либо неясное, порой даже загадочное. Кто подлинный автор произведения, на кого направлено, по какому поводу, поводу написано произведение, явно эпиграмматического характера, подлинный текст произведения мы имеем или помешан другим. И нет, структура и разыскания расследования, however you want to call it, uh, do indeed take the form of short investigations, if you think about it. I don't, I've, I've tried to like look at on the um, Ruski Nazionalny Corpus for like this term Naushni Detective. I uh, couldn't really find much to be honest. So I'm not necessarily sure what he's getting at. Like, of course, it's very intuitive, but like he uses the, the word as if uh, it is, it has a long standing tradition. So I would be, um, I would be like interested like to know, to, um, to know your opinion about this. Um, uh, given an initial situation, but about like the, the, the structure of this, um, of this small text. Given an initial situation where information regarding a text is incomplete or absent, the author detective makes his way through a variety of clues, some of them misleading, as it's, uh, and solves the mystery. A standalone publication, because usually the text that they are, you know, that they they write from, um, is is absent. We don't have access to it. The focus is not necessarily on the original text the investigation starts from, but rather on the process whereby the detective himself, like the author detective himself, solves the initial riddle by drawing on a variety of different materials. In other words, literary text, or better yet, literary printed page, becomes a starting point where the author is acted to scout for an initial set of clues that will, in turn, lead him or her to investigate a new set of documents, either published or unpublished. Further, the practical set of endeavor is an autonomous text, which does not criticize any more an original text, and that will not necessarily serve as a starting point for further research, but is available to any reader wishing to amuse themselves with scientific detective stories, now which needs to be as which that writes. So to conclude and to try to I mean, I'll bring together this um, rather amorphous mass of material. Shklovsky's text for authors is arduous. Through conscious play and analysis of past texts, they need to produce a completely autonomous text that will put forward a new model of the world. There is no truth place for dependence on past models. The type of novelty that Shklovsky speaks of is quite radical. Of course, there is no, as we, someone was saying before, there is no like complete rejection of the past, but there is a sort of, you know, like contrasting with previous models. Buxab's case is quite different. As a bibliograph, his texts have been dependent on a set of original documents that he had been called to comment on, describe, and publish. However, a standalone publication of his Vasiskania Resledovania suggests a process of autonomization of these genres that acquire their own life beyond regional texts that they originally grew out of. The author of bibliography is now responsible for solving a mystery where the focus on a series of documents and clues to reach um, a solution that is important for this literature of Vietnam as a whole. And that's so, <laughs> questions yeah yeah thank you for this this is wonderful so i i got my degree in russia so this was how i was educated and of course it, it's like considered by completely absolute now right so great to uh hear that that this tradition is is of interest but also in the way is of course obsolete but it lives within mm -hmm. kind of some of our presence so really really interesting and i'm thinking about now which the detective actually would read the russian phrase in a way that would say i can call it that so it's like the metaphor in tradition an original metaphor rather than an established term right more mm -hmm. than as what mm -hmm. so yeah and i'm thinking of course of what there is who did build a career around doing that as an entertaining genre. So the early, the representative of an early generation would be Arakli Andronikov, who was a Lermontov mm -hmm. expert and like a, a public speaker. And the later generation is Natana Delman, who kind of his series books of on Pushkin and the Decemberists are a specific, uh, store. And he was very good at finding archival stuff. So he did a lot of launch research, but there is a lot of talk in his book about how he the the trajectories that his uh, research takes and they're actually in terms of style very much connected to H. Klovsky. so you could see how this is how he learns his narrative techniques from Sklovsky so uh thank you very interesting uh I also have a point about the Shklovsky's definition of authorship 
uh, which is an interesting case. We talked a, a bit about, and we touched on this topic of how Shklovsky uh, Tetiva specifically connects to the Soviet canon. And this is one point where, and this is like, this is a very complex topic, but this is one point, the definition that he quoted of authorship is one point where you can see kind of this as a glimpse of uh, sort of, uh, official adjacent, I don't want to discredit it by saying it, but just to state the facts, like official adjacent Hegelian uh, Marxist language of realism, like the canon mm -hmm. description of realism, which mm -hmm. we really understand as being the opposite of formalism, but Shklovsky integrates bits and pieces of it in Titiva. Mm -hmm. And why it is, what, why it matters is because this to, in this Hegelian tradition, there is a definition of author which is different from the formalist idea of techniques, but also different from a romantic author. So, and you actually started saying some of those things, but it's just kind of interesting to, since it is in the Chichiwa to just articulate it, that the author is somebody who is like, yeah, there is this unique figure, this unique uh, construction, but the whole point uh, of, of having this author is that it reflects a particular kind of reality, that it focuses reality in a particular kind of way. And you have famous, uh, Engels's and Marx's definition of Balzac, who captured the essence of his era, despite the fact that he had wrong political convictions. Yes. So uh, it, this is the kind of authorship. It, it's about capturing, right? Capturing stuff and not about the like, romantic idea, I'm going to derive everything from what's within me, right? So there is like the third option here. And this is, I think, for understanding Shlovsky's book and the kind of debates that, that are within it is also an interesting, interesting aspect. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much for this comment. As a matter of fact, I've been struggling to, um, I know a little bit of Iraqi and Johnny Kupring, but I'm not necessarily, like, of course, I'm not an expert. I mean, you could say maybe he's a Mlada Fermalist, but then again, if I, I guess that, like, everyone is a Mlada Fermalist, if you look, <laughs> I don't know, like, uh, <laughs> close enough. Um, yeah, I was trying to, like, um, understand whether there are things that look like this. I mean, of course, there are a lot of things that look like this in that a standalone publication, I mean, bibliographical, like, sub or something like that, but I've never seen, like, a collection of, like, this, you know, little pieces, little investigation, like put together. So thank you very much for like giving me new ideas and where to look. Um, and uh, I don't know if should I, um, and about the author, um, I think, I think it's uh, because I was interested in this, like as precise as it is, I mean, what I perceive that as a contradiction <laughs> and then that, you know, on the one hand, he like, he talks about Skaska, so it's like no authorship to speak of, but then it does seem that sometimes he has this like strong, conception of author whereby I mean this person who basically like it's not I mean in Tichy as you say like it's not completely like uh broken down. I mean it's not understood where this will comes from, where it is completely like inside of the, or, or like it's it's socially implemented, like socially determinable. But um um but I thought you know it's it's one of the biggest contradictions that I found in Shlosky's uh and yes I, I see like your point very very much. So thank you thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Um First of all, speaking on this specific uh, journal of uh, collection of the Scania, uh, I could uh, add to this uh, book of Bani uh, For example, a uh, later book by book uh, by Vadim Vartura, mm -hmm. uh, several books about like, uh, uh, containing several uh, his other Scania for history of Russian literature that was a very, yes, you're right, very prestigious and honorable journal. And the very book, uh, Novi Bizdelki, uh, the first three to, to speak with uh, the uh, birthday of Vadim Vazuli is also the collection of such as Scania, but written by diverse uh, forms. Mm -hmm. uh, and second, uh, if uh, taking into account early stage of uh, Buchstab's biography, uh, you, um, I think that it's important to mention that uh, he um, began, that he started from the uh, more or less theoretical articles. For example, uh, I could uh, remember his article of 1928 uh, about Mandelstam, one of the best yes. articles on Mandelstam written ever. Uh, and it was not uh, bibliographical or uh, it was quite uh, theoretical. It was based on the, the idea of uh, you know, poetical grammar of Mandelstam and so on and so forth. And uh, the idea to seize this uh, kind of uh, explorations was, uh, I think, uh, intentional uh, decision of, of Buchstab in order to um, avoid 
any ideological uh, any idea, ideological um, charges and any uh, how to say uh, any uh, charges in wrong uh, theory but really that, that was also ideological charges but uh, he found his island of safety yeah I think that uh, if speaking about these two ways of uh, development of um, former formalists, uh, I think it's important to uh, that for uh, for Buchstab, it was a way of creative escaping. Yeah, I I understand. Um, yeah, I, I, and, and you're completely right that if you read Mandelstam, and I think that there was a kind of interesting story, interesting anecdote about the article on Mandelstam because. I think Mandelstam himself read it, right? And then he didn't like it or something like that. Uh, and it was published um, afterwards, if I'm not, no, the, or, there was a kind of, or, or maybe in like mistaking like this with um, with an article on, on Pisternak that Buchstab uh, wrote and then was published later on in the 1990s when there was a kind of a collection. The of, article of Mandelstam was also published in 1990. Right, in 1990, right. In that collection that came out of on, on Bayes Buchstab. Um, and I and I do see like your point as in like if you if you read uh, his other article that he published in Novaya in in the collection uh, edited by Tunyanov in 1927 uh, like Ruski Literatura or something like that alongside uh, Ginsburg and other uh, of his of their students um, on on Weltman I think that of course like that was more theoretically engaged um, but my problem was namely how to and I understand like the, the question of escapism. Um, it wasn't a question, it was a comment. Yeah, yeah, no, I mean, I no, no, like I understand the comment on escapism. I, I think that like the, the the reason why I why I tended to focus on his later works or like what he produced, you know, like from the 30s to the 1980s, is that because my question was like in a sense methodological, as in what do I do with them, right? How do I like that pricey British, right? How do you how do you make it so to 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 be able to like talk about that? Absolutely right. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think uh, I consider my uh, uh, my uh, what only as addition to uh, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. But, but, but do you really think that um, this type of genre that people like Bushtap and Paul Company and them developed could be reduced to the escapist kind of desire or safety? No, because I, I think. Uh, I speak more about genre. I'm speaking about uh, biographical strategy of books of personally. This genre is not, it cannot be reduced to uh, escapism. Uh, so, but, but that's the issue then. So what is it that determines or that transforms this really auxiliary and kind of, you know, applied knowledge into um, what Buchstab claims to be kind of an independent form of knowledge production or like to frame it differently. I don't know. What stops, say, Zalatanosa from writing a book right on Stalinist literature instead of producing volumes and volumes and volumes of commentaries on somebody else's text, right? So this, I, I this talked it, about uh, creative escapism, created from his own viewpoint. I, I don't know. I, I, I missed the discussion, <laughs> sorry. But, <laughs> but, 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 but uh, I think that there is an obvious parallelism between what Buchstab is doing and what Shklovsky is writing about, because first of all, it's litot. Mm -hmm. It's an obvious litot. So I, I'm not doing anything big. I'm just writing some, 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 some notes, mm -hmm. bibliographic notes. But uh, on the other hand, it is the same attempt to take the obviously fragmented piece of uh, cultural literary history, but but to stuff it as rich as possible with, with, with the information that that makes it sort of synecdoche oh, yeah. to, 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 to the larger view. Mm -hmm. So may, maybe what what Shklovsky describes as an artistic um, principle here is being transposed into the scholarly activity. Yeah, but uh, I see the the yeah I see the point. But then again, I would say that for Shklovsky. I mean, for books that in this, this is kind of and yet the point is all like to put everything back in their own place, in a sense. Whereas for Shkoski, there is this sense that you don't have to put everything back to its own place. There is no place. <laughs> it's true that in, in a sense, it, it becomes a little bit weird because, I mean, if you read them like this, I and mean, many of these texts are not necessarily like easy to 
to find it. Like you could, you don't have like, you know, like they, they're published like independently. You lose yourself a little bit in these clues. I mean, there's so much. He's a billion with Siri Allah and like you just like are like swimming together with Bushka. Mm -hmm. Of course, it might be the case that because I'm not an expert on 19th century, I just lose the thread. I'm like, Bože moje, kto je tako i ti ljudi? I kada no. Just to continue in Kirill's, this thing about Andronikov, I found out all his television uh, presentations are on YouTube. He was televised with his stories because he was a fantastic performer and uh, um, what do you call it? Uh, imitator. He could uh, impersonate her. He impersonated people that he was to, uh, speaking about. And it was extremely, extremely speaking about attention. It was so entertaining, I incredible. But then maybe, <clears throat> I don't back know. Then. Hmm? Back then. <laughs> 71. Well, even frightening. I remember that small television set, black and white uh, television program, and himself telling something about the something about Lermonton with so much abandon, so much passion. I couldn't sleep at night. I was afraid. <laughs> I was a child. I was afraid. It was a nightmare. <laughs> but then and another thing is that uh, it's very interesting that uh, in Ginsburg and Emily certainly knows better than me, every time there appears uh, a specter of Klovsky, there is always Bushtab somewhere behind her <laughs> back, mm -hmm. so, uh, you know, supporting mm -hmm. Ginsburg against this kind of negative example of Shklovsky, who is constantly provoking her with his cynicism and his too much health and his uh, sexuality and lots of money and children. <laughs> and so on. So Bushtab is always behind her back, like, so it's interesting that they always kind of figure together it could be an interesting thing just to have a look at this pattern, how he appears. How oh, he appears like, oh, mm -hmm. so support this mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Yeah, I just read his, uh, their correspondence, uh, but maybe I will go back to, like, and thank you very much because you're giving me a lot of materials to all think about. Uh, and this the, is all before of... bibliography, you know, when he was writing on Mandelstam and Wagner. Mm -hmm. And obviously there was a different kind of way in front of him, and then he goes deep into bibliography and starts mm -hmm. knowing things and people that no one cares about, basically. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Uh, две, два комментария, которые связаны и не связаны. С одной стороны, комментарий комментарий, потому что 66-й год, когда это издано, это просто начало нового, то есть, может быть, продолжение нового жанра, о чем говорил Илья, как эскапизм, я не, я не считаю это эскапизм, но вы помните, а, конечно, конечно, все эти филологические усилия и страницы, которые были а, направлены в сторону комментариев, Чудакова комментирует а, Тынянова издание, Тынянова, а, все, все остальное, это целый жанр, который развился и определял 70-е годы. Комментарии Лотмана. Вячеслав Иванов публикует якобы книгу «Очерки по истории Семеночки», но это комментарии к Эйзенштейну просто развернуты и так далее. С другой стороны, и тут я должна сделать большой комплимент организаторам конференции, которые выстроили нарацию, историю. Как бы, вы, вы все знаете, что такое «Крэйзи Волс». Да? Нет? Не 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 Crazy Walls. Не все. Нет, Скажи, все знают. Скажи, да нет, вы знаете, потому что вы видите напомню. в этом в каждом детективе. Все детективы создают а, такое. Я, я, я. И они туда Клинь. всякие клеят. Улики. А, улики. А, улики. То есть, ну, улики, Только материал не связан. Да, 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 это называется Crazy Walls. Сейчас и все art historians and art uh, scholars uh, uh, became crazy about crazy walls, потому что есть очень много исследований по поводу этих crazy walls. Но uh, uh, построение нашей конференции да, <laughs> напоминает мне, нет-нет, в каком-то смысле, потому что, с одной стороны, после, вот несколько докладов последних выстраивается в такую замечательную историю нарации, которые идут от, э, э, я говорю, это началось в комментарии э, Сергея по поводу 
что миметрическое, да, где тело исчезает, остается глаз, который потом мы переходим к Ирине, где уже Шкловский исчезает, остается непонятно, наоборот, как на то есть потом, и потом, а, потом Брэдли замечательно, замечательно как бы вдруг превращает это в другую историю, потому что что мы тут вообще, собственно, сосредоточились на каком-то теле и Шкловском, и авторе, когда в конце концов субъекта нет, ну, я считаю, это правильно, истории нет, здесь только crazy walls, то есть стереотипы, которые мы или понимаем материально, или понимаем просто как разбросанные нечто, entity виртуальное. И вдруг вы возвращаете нас, возвращаете нас к новой Crazy Walls, которой создается как бы история, которую мы все равно не можем, которую мы все равно не можем плыть. И вот в этом колебании между виртуальностью, размыванием телесности полной и созданием каких-то новых историй из этих комментариев, обрывков и так далее, состоит э, искусство нашей науки, если, если определять это как что-то. Искусство, наука. Да, искусство, да, научный да. детектив. Да. Да. Спасибо. Я, на самом деле, не знала, что это такое Crazy Walls, поэтому а, я потом... Нет, это вместо... Нет, поэтому это шлепки, это crazy walls, это не детектив. Это уже посчитали на глаз. Эмили. Before Ilya spoke, I had wanted I had wanted to ask you about you know where in in this like where is the Mlada Tarmadis of you know Buchstab? like where do you can you see I can bounds or Shosky's influence even at this stage? And then Ilya Spoke, I kind of realized in a way, you know, one reason why Buchstab was doing this, it was kind of a turn away from his earlier work as a Mlada Tarmadis in a sense. But you know the work, the earlier work on Mandelstam. But you know it's been much too long since I thought about Buchstab and Ginsburg, and I really appreciated you know your talk. And now I want to reread you know those letters and the all of the little portraits of Buchstab there are in Ginsburg. You know he appears like her as a new Dutchnik, but like of a different kind. And I need to reread how she talks about his personality. Um, you know analyzing their differences, Buchstab and mm -hmm. Ginsburg, even though they were great friends uh, through life. So, um, yeah, where does that, where does that, the Naushni the, Dintiksiv, um, I was actually, you know, when you think about um, uh, the context of today, drawn to think about Bradley's talk about Zebald, right, mm -hmm. and cereal, like this, you talked about the scrupulous uncertainty during the research creating the narrative, like, so, is Buchstab a kind of author in the set? You know, could you look at that work as a work of post fiction, <laughs> uh, <laughs> which I haven't read? You know, I haven't read Buchstab's book, but um, there was some weird similarity between this, you know, this turn towards Isledevania, um, you know, in the Kumitalne Prosa, you know, and the kind of research, the way Buchstab tried to create. A, detective mm -hmm. out of his research. So. Yeah, so I, I, you know, like about like whether you can still see something of the Mlada Parmaris in, mm -hmm. uh, in this 1966. Um, mm -hmm. oh, I mean, oh, on, as, sorry, so, can I, she, you, yeah. before you, if you can hold that thought, then I remember it. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, because when Shklovsky presents uh, himself and Pinyanov and others, he, he, he talks about how they went against Yankarov, right? And his Kartatsyaka. And his, you know, he had a bibliography, he had all the research, but he didn't have the plot, mm -hmm. right? So um, then you have Shklovsky who says, I came to prove that you don't need to exist, Yankarov, right? <laughs> That's, that was his kind of Zayevgenia that, that he becomes nostalgic mm -hmm. about. So anyway, there is this kind of weird return in Bookshop to the Yankarov model. Mm -hmm. but, yeah. Yeah, maybe so. But the Mlada um, yeah, I don't know whether, I mean, there is a clearly like kind of a, 
it is in a sense, uh, if you look at it from a Himbanda's perspective, it is in a sense genesis without evolution. It's like how does this or like how does this not necessarily like there is a kind of a attention to the material, like I mean to all of this archival documents. And of course they were it's extremely important for the formalists as well, for Kinyana, for Ikimbaum, for instance. And you get this almost maniacal attention to all of those details. Um, but there is no attempt, and maybe also because you know this when it appeared in this form, they were somewhat cut a little bit shorter just because it, there's worth many of them. Um, but I don't think though that in, in the original publication that are quite hard to come by, of course, because um, we, 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 we would find like kind of a sense of empathy. But what I'm getting at is there is really no attempt to go further than this like it's just you're walking from one material to the others like from one document to the others and if there's clues in one document i will say oh but maybe this is not true and so i'm going to go to this other document to this other letter which mentions this uh that in fact is like one of the it was author like a pair of couplets that ended up in uh one of kuzma uh, uh stories um so there is this attention to the Mahita's attention to the document, um, but there is no real attention, we say, to rooted in like why does this matter, right? We're like looking at the genesis to an extent, or like looking at the literature, like to the context, like to the approximate context where this was produced, but it doesn't, you know, there is this lacking, this lack of uh, of, of of part, right? I mean, that's that's why I think it kind of feels hard to read sometimes. Not just because, you know, I'm not acquainted as Gustav was or like the formalist were with 19th century material, but also because there seems to be a lack of, yeah, like in a sense it's like, and so what, mm -hmm. right? Um, sometimes, no, sometimes, sometimes it's really engaging. Uh, sometimes a little bit, a little bit less. Um, but yeah. so, so you don't think that he took like sort of the idea of the subject name probably seriously and that's what he's producing? It's not just only literature of fact, it's also like that's what how the subject name for the looks like. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, but then yeah, it's 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 funny because if the subject name prosa, but then there is a subject, and then there is in a sense a small one. It's, 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 it's the main text. Yeah, I mean it's it's, a, it's a, it it has a very you know, like there's a lot of oscillations and a lot of. Okay. Um, but maybe, maybe in a sense, and to 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 also go back to post post fiction, fiction. Uh, or sujet mm -hmm. prosa. I mean, I've never read post fiction. I it was the first time that I heard a term, so not necessarily sure what it looks like. I've probably I've, I've read the but like off the list. Um, it's like guilty. It was okay. <laughs> I've seen it and read. Okay. No. Um, Water. Yeah, in, in book stuff, it mm -hmm. seems to me that because of the volume, like the the lack of like uh, like the, the shortness um it it kind of feels just like this sort of really small detective story that, that mm -hmm. gets sold um then i don't i don't know might be might be wrong but alexievich is an excess of purpose and here uh, there is it seems like there is no purpose it's just genesis mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so just to confirm some of the things that uh, that Lydia said, yes, there was always the other side, and Shklovsky is just this uh, on the, an extreme figure. If you take somebody else, if you take Ginsburg, if you take Eichenbaum, they've done a lot of that kind of work, right? And Tanyanov was doing it. One of the things that we questioned question was what would happen to Tanyanov if he did not have sclerosis. I mean, he would have become that. He was on his way of becoming the Pushkin expert and his late work is very much in that direction. There are figures like Julian Oxman who was in the same seminar with them, who never was a formalist, never became a formalist, was always this scholar of uh, basically the historian of Russian revolutionary tradition, sorry. So uh, the, there is a purpose of, uh, there is a tradition if you go into the purpose, there's a particular tradition of how we need to remember history uh, as opposed to simple ideological overwritings. And this is one of the way of doing it, right? And what kind of history is it? It is the history of the kind of the canonical, the 19th century canon as a source of the revolution. That's where they came from, right? That's where, how they were canonized. That's why one of the first things the Soviet authorities do is they start producing complete works of the likes of Herzen, 
right? So you need to reconstruct that, and that is a, that is that goes up to Edelman, who works on the Decemberist and Herzen, right? We need to actually reconstruct the history of the Russian Revolution tradition as some kind of emancipatory tradition that can be then used as something different from the Soviet, from the ideological dogma. And then closer to the 80s, it actually turns into a, a, a reconstruction of Russian, uh, revival of Russian conservatism. When people start uh, excavating, re-excavating Slavophiles, and this is like already kind of going in the direction of Obshistov Pamit and that sort of thing. So there is, uh, I think there is an epistemology which is very much about uh, the history of political thought here. I mean, probably Bookstab is also marginal to that, but also the amount of others. Why is Nikrasov important? Because he is the, the poet, the one poet who actually is a part of a revolutionary canon. So that's, that there is uh, that. Yeah, I think there is also like another side of the formalist, which is not necessarily the first one that we think when we think about that, which is like textalogia, right? So like the publication, like preparation of materials, and like I mean, as far as like they say, like in the nineteen twenties, uh, the Marshevsky especially, like there was no like professional like textalogia like before the revolution, so we kind of have to like put together all of the principles. Um, but um, yeah, I think that though in the nineteen twenties, maybe they're. I mean, maybe, maybe as far as the Nyanov edition of Chlebnikov uh, in 1924 goes, I mean, they still were trying to, I don't know, like mix the cards a little bit, right? I mean, that's what he, he writes, I think, in the preface or like introduction to, to that edition of Chlebnikov. Like, I'm trying, I've tried to like place the material in such a way so as to, uh, so it wasn't so much in a restorative intent, but at least in the 1920s, so much as so, uh, again, like this kind of reshuffling intent. And then, of course, uh, there is this like restoration of, yeah. of the classic, of course. Um, quite obvious. Any, any other comments, suggestions, disagreements? Yeah. Oh, just one brief um, comment. I'm kind of struck by the fact that both uh, and and Shklovsky have not only sort of differing theories of authorship or different sort of imminent practices of, of authorship, but also they their work is centered around the methodological centrality of the detail, but they take it in entirely different ways. So Shklovsky approaches detail as this sort of qualitative, as something qualitative, you can take a detail and make a universe out of it. Whereas the sort of text of the bibliographical textological tradition is oriented towards detail as in a qualitative way. So it becomes this sort of accumulation of detail. And almost um, just the, the mention of, of, of Balzac remembers, reminds me a little bit of a, a Lukash uh, essay called to narrate or describe where he compares um, Emile Zola and Balzac in both in how they approach detail. And even though Balzac, again, is, is sort of like has the wrong politics, he says that Balzac is actually great because he, he focuses on, this, on single details that open up the entire social um, sort of battlefield that he's describing, whereas Zola just sort of adds up all of these different details into this kind of huge inventory. Um, but yeah, it's, it's interesting that not only is the author central to them, but I think sort of the a, a grand theory of the detail is. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Um, I was trying maybe to think of Bustav's uh, in terms of Carlo Ginsburg's um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, in, in English. The, the look. Yeah, the clues, uh, paradigma indiziario, like the, in the whatever, that's right. Right. you it's know, what I mean. um, because yeah, um, and, and so yeah, of course, um, I, I think I will need to um, maybe think a little bit more about this, like clues, details, little things that uh, kind of like make you make kind of like, and then you lose yourself in this like isobili of material. But yeah, I think that you are uh, you're completely you're completely right on, on this. I think course. somebody might have actually articulated the connection when they published the Russian translation of Ginsburg essay in the 2000s or late 90s and in the law. It was part of a book, so Sergei Kozlov was was involved in that, and maybe this connection that you are making between Gisberg and Bookstab was something that he articulated in one of his essays. I would look look it up. In the translation. Of so the, probably, uh, I mean, yes, the preface to that would be interesting if it even exists. But also, there could be a journal publication in like, Nova Literatura Bazrenia. There could be Kozlov was an editor there. There could be something like an editor's preface where kind of that sort of thing could be articulated. Yeah. I agree. I think just up here. So um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. One more. Um, yeah, I'll take one. Should we take a quick break?
Yeah. Shall, do you uh, want well, five minute break? Sure. Yeah, well, well, you can make the set up your face. Lily Kaganovsky filmed as though in slow motion and examined through the magnifying glass of time. Shklovsky between past, present, and future. Yes, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, and I am very aware of the fact that I'm going last on a very long day. And also, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm the thing standing between you and a glass of wine. Um, so <laughs> I will try to be um, quick and entertaining as possible. Um, I have a couple of sort of uh, pre things. One of them is, for some reason, at the top of my paper, I have I have a quote: "Cosmos можно отправить и кошку, и дрозофил." Но есть ли, но есть ли цель всех этих путешествий? Uh, I just had it there as, for some reason, as an inspirational quote. Um, and the second thing is I've sort of added a, yet a second, uh, um, uh, uh, what, uh, uh, subtitle to the work and um, remembering, repeating, and working through. Um, okay, да, начинаем. Старые телефонные книжки, имена людей, которым уже нельзя позвонить. So in some ways, this book is about talking to ghosts. It is also about muteness and stuttering, a failure of speech and a lack of articulation, but also at the same time, the desire and the need to look at everything closely in slow motion and as if through a magnifying glass. We might note that these all have something in common. Film cameras, telephones, and magnifying glasses are technologies meant to extend our sensory organs, allowing us to hear and see things at a distance to bring to bring closer to bring closer things that are far away. They speak to a failure or incompleteness in or of the body, maybe the old senile body, maybe not, that requires technical and technological support, a prosthesis to make good on lack. This book is also, of course, about reaching out into the world. It is about connection and disconnection, and ultimately about the impossibility of linking, linking the past with the present and the future. Telephones connect people, places, they cover long distances, but the threat of a lost connection of a dropped call is always there. The telephone exists, the telephone book exists, the names in it are organized alphabetically, the phone numbers are written down next to the names, the call can be made, the te telephone will ring, but the people on the other end of the line are gone. The telephone rings in a void, or worse, the call is picked up by someone else. For Proust, as in for Sklovsky, I think, the telephone by crossing the distance and bringing the voice of the loved one to you evokes the possibility of death. So here I also have a grandmother, but not the same one. This is Marcel's reaction the first time he, speak, he speaks to his grandmother on the telephone. Granny, I cried to her granny and I longed to kiss her, but I had beside me only the voice, a phantom as, as, as impalatable as the one that would perhaps come back to visit me when my grandmother was dead. Speak to me. But then suddenly I ceased to hear the voice and was left even more alone. My grandmother could no longer hear me. She was no longer in communication with me. We had ceased to be close to each other, to be audible to each other. I continued to call her, groping in the empty darkness, feeling that calls from her must also be going astray. I quivered with the same anguish which I had felt once before in the distant past when as a little child I had lost her in a crowd, an anguish due less to my not finding her than to the thought that she must be searching for me, must be saying to herself that I was searching for her, an anguish not unlike that which I was later to feel on the day when we speak to those who can no longer reply, and when we long for them at least to hear all the things that we never said to them and our assurance that we are not unhappy. It seemed to me as though it was already a beloved ghost that I had allowed to lose her, that I had that I had allowed to lose herself in the ghostly world. And standing alone before the instrument, I went on vainly repeating, "Granny, Granny," as Orpheus, left alone, repeats the name of his dead wife. When does the telephone become what it is? Wonders Avital Renault. It presupposes the existence of another telephone somewhere. Though it's a totality as apparatus, its singularity is what we think when we say telephone. To be what it is, it has to be pluralized, multiplied, engaged by another line, high strung and heading for you. Alexander Graham Bell wasn't inventing the telephone. He was trying to reach the dead, trying to communicate with his brother who had passed away. Quote, maintaining and joining, the telephone line holds together what it separates, says Renault. 
For Sklovsky, the telephone book holds the names of people he can no longer call, like the power lines evoked throughout the text. And here I, I, was, I was curious about the fact that the, the toke, cat, and thok for electrification were sounding similar to me to my ear. Um, or the metaphor of the bowstring. There's a high wire tension to this work, which attempts to think back, think together, speak to, reread, and rethink the past in order to connect it to the present and imagine it as a future. But it is clear, it seems to me, that this desire for futurity has come full circle. The avant-garde has become the arrière-garde, as, as Michael Epstein once put it, and the future imagined by the past is no longer connected to the present. Quote, a partial archivization of the names of the living, the telephone book finds the living and the dead in an unarticulated thematics of destination. That's also from Ronell. It's the last one. Был я неизвестно кем, не то солдат, не то футурист. This is also a book written by a subject out of place, not quite a soldier, not quite a futurist, as Shushan Avagian's English translation not quite accurately renders it. And I did want to show you the translation just because compared to... <laughs> Anyways. It's the paper. Yeah, it's the paper. Okay. So not quite a soldier, not quite a futurist. And it is precisely in that like toadies, uh, this understatement that we note Shklovsky's lack of place. His friends are dead, but he remains. Futurism is over, but the not quite futurist is still not quite gone. Like the Decembrists to whom the sex returns again and again, a repetition compulsion marking a moment of unprocessed trauma, the revolution, and here we can substitute any revolution, 1825, 1905, 1917, February, October, in art, in language, has failed. Shklovsky has been left behind as a kind of awkward remainder, a reminder of a time before the dreamt of a time after. It is no wonder that he has such a hard time speaking. It is no wonder that the first letter of the telephone book is a stutter. Akaki Akakievich, ime sedershe the telephone book is organized, arbitrarily or not, by the alphabet. Baris Eichenbaum comes before Yuri Tinyama, though not before Mikhail Bakhtin. And we might say that Shklovsky's recollection starts with the letter A, or even a double A, a stutter, or maybe a battery. What attracts Shklovsky to Eichenbaum's analysis of Gogol's overcoat is the hero's stammer, his muteness, his inability to communicate, which spreads from the protagonist to the entire text. Gogol говорил о герое словами своего героя. Он говорил не только не матой героя, но и оттеняя морфологию не маты авторскую речь. Слова Акаки Акакиевича невнятны. Мир Акаки Акакиевича сужен не странной недоговоренностью мысли. Речь Акаки Акакиевича почти мимична. Как будто еще не родилась человеческая речь, или она умирает на затоптанных ступенях петербургских лестниц. And here we have that strange, or not so strange, не странный, incompleteness, an imperfective tense. Human speech has not yet been born, or it has already died away, perishing on the steps of St. Petersburg, now Leningrad. Akaki Akakiewicz's speech is caught between birth and death, between the past and the future, skipping over the present. Akaki Akakievich's speech is almost mimetic, which is to say imitative, unoriginal, a copy of a copy of a copy. He is, after all, a copyist. And yet mimetic is a strange, or not so strange, word here. And it refers also to the monopoetic, that is to say to language imitating the sound of the world, such as buzz or hiss. In other words, to poetic language. Poetic language is a stutter. The stutter, writes Craig Dworkin, structures language in two opposing directions, both blocking certain speech and impeding the facile consumption of language, while at the very same time permitting or producing literary compositions based on its formal characteristics. It is an act of defamiliarization, astranienia, with one or two ends, estrangement, but maybe even more so. There is a tactil tactility to the process that Irina Sandamirska, in a different context, calls haptic sonority or audio factura, quote, the perceptible difference between phonation and articulation, 
the line that demarcates sense from nonsense and language from noise. For Gilles Deleuze, it's a difference between the character who stutters in speech, such as Herman Melville's Billy Budd, and the writer who becomes a stutterer in language, such as Franz, Franz Kafka. Coming back to his discussion of minor literature, Deleuze notes that even though Kafka is a Czech writing in German and Beckett is an Irishman writing in French, they do not mix languages together, not even a minor language and a major language. Rather, quote, they invent a minor use of a major language within which they express themselves entirely. They minorize this language, much as in music, where the minor mode refers to dynamic combinations in perpetual disequilibrium. They are great writers by virtue of this minorization. They make the language take flight. They send it racing along a witch's line, ceaselessly placing it in a state of disequilibrium, making it bifurcate and vary in each of its terms, following an incessant modulation. For Deleuze, this usage exceeds the possibilities of speech, and I'm assuming he means papo, and attains the power of language, language. It means, writes Deleuze, that a great writer is always like a foreigner in the language in which they express themselves, even if it's their native tongue, carving out a non pre existent foreign language within their own language and making the language itself scream, stutter, stammer, or murmur. It, it certainly works well for Gogol for whom Russian was and wasn't his, native, his mother tongue. But it works for Eichenbaum and Shklovsky as well. But mimicry is also camouflage. So recall um, that мир аа сужен не странной недоговоренностью мысли. Речь Акаки Акакиевича почти мимична. So mimicry, um, and here I'm quoting from a scientific paper on the mim mimetic wing pattern of, of butterflies. <laughs> <laughs> um, so mimicry but is the means by which mimetic species trick predators by resembling another species, a widespread su survival strategy used by many animals and has long been studied in various academic fields, it says. To avoid predation, non-toxic palatable species often evolve to resemble a distantly related unpalatable model species in shape, color patterns, or behavior, a phenomenon called Batesian mimicry. So Akaki Akakiyuchi's speech is also a form of hiding in plain sight. It is a way of imitating his surroundings so he can make himself invisible, unnoticed, and erased. No wonder the new overcoat breaks him so much trouble, it makes him visible, exposes him to the world. In some sense, this is what Shklovsky is doing as well. By rereading, rewriting, by channeling the language of others, he is hiding in plain sight. Писатель идет к себе через чужие литературные произведения, которые на слуху его времени. Он занимается контаминацией. Not quite a soldier, not quite a futurist, or maybe a soldier, maybe a futurist. Shklovsky is out of place, out of his time, but he's camouflaged. His speech is mimetic. It too stammers and mutters, is contaminated by the language of others. It refuses clarity or completeness. Статья, как сделана шинель, чем-то связана с моей статьей, как сделан Дон Кихот. Связь обнаруживается в слове сделано. В этом слове, полагаю, ошибка в том, что произведение не шьется, как шинет. Я тогда говорил, что мы не развенчиваем литературу, а развенчиваем. Развенч... Развенчивать. So take apart, unscrew to make loose. But развенчивать is also to break apart, right? So you've got this, this he sets up this, this binary opposite, right? But they're sort of the same. Sorry. as in marriage, uh, to, right? So, so Razvenchiva to dethrone, debunk, remove from a powerful position, but it's also to remove the crown or the wreath that binds something together, right? Razvenchet. Literature, literary language is broken apart into its component parts, producing decomposition, demontage, dissolution, disjointed stuttering speech. Here we might recall the strangeness and foreignness, defamiliarization, astranienia, of the well-known line from Hamlet as rendered and heard by Shklovsky. 
time is out of joint with its emphasis on dislocation, displacement, and also some kind of disability, right? And, uh, and here, Yulia earlier had which I think also goes with this. In Shklovsky's Russian translation of the well-known phrase, the phrase becomes embodied and physical. writes Shklovsky, pressing on with the metaphor. Хромая. And a bit later on, Мы все знаем слова Гамлета, слова о том, слова о том, что распалась связь вре время, распалась связь времен. Тут есть образ, но только переводной. Похоже, что раз разрывалась, что разорвалась, разорвалась какая-то цепь или бусы. Но дословный перевод дал А Аникс в послесловии к песне Гамлет принц датский. Дословно сказано. Время вывихнуло сустав. И дальше Гамлет говорит, что ему суждено бы править этот сустав. Он лечит время, пересоздает его. Распалась which is which as a paraphrase renders the image of a breaking chain or string of beads but in the literal sense according to annex afterwards of his russian translation of the play the original text says the time is out of joint <laughs> act one scene five after which hamlet states that he has to set it right he is healing time reinventing it here i think the linkage the linkage between the two texts the original and translate in the translation of hamlet but also of bowstring has come apart the two languages pull in different directions. In English, the line is a cliche, a well worn, as well worn as, as Akaki Akakiewicz's overcoat, where we can no longer sense the materiality of the phrase, let alone of the body hidden beneath it, but only its metaphorical non meaning. In Russian, however, this is a moment of pause, of stutter, or better still, of stumble. The roughening of perception, the stone made stony. Time is out of joint like a bad knee or hip, speaking of old age. It has become dislocated, displaced. It's come out of its socket, come loose, come apart. To set it right, it needs to be put back in its place, private to stuff. Needs to be reinvented, reformed, reforged. I take this to be Shlovsky's task too, to reforge time, to set it right, to heal the broken joint. Yet for Shlovsky, time is not a chain or a string of beads to which each passing year or each passing thought is merely an addition. Time moves forward and back, it skips generations. It produces immeasurable rifts. The Decemberist uprising, the 1917 revolution, the Leningrad blockade, that can never be healed, that cannot be linked together, but that throws the whole system out of alignment. Tinyana writes Shklovsky, generally argued that the literary genre dislocates itself. It evolves in a broken line. Тиньянов вообще отмечал, что жанр смещается, его эволюция ломаная линия, а не прямая. But maybe there's a through line, a warp in the weave that holds together the material of, of time of this book and binds it together. I think Shklovsky is imagining that, that his book is that warp, bringing together the different segments of the past to link them into something coherent, something that will hold the desperate strands in place despite all the forces working to break it apart. Quote, warp here, apparently, this is the, I'm doing, I'm giving you the English first, now I'll give you the Russian. Warp here apparently means that which is thrown across or placed in tension, like yarns on a loom before the weaving begins. The English here is so clear, so concise. The Russian is a bit more tangled and complex in its etymological sense, as in plated, as in a weave. Snuyutsa здесь очевидно значит вступает взаимоотношения. Something is moving quickly past, like Yulia's Minavait. Shklovsky is uncertain he has understood this correctly. But something has entered into relations, has been placed in tension. But is he missing something here? Don't we need a third term or object to make the two parts fit together? Sticking to the metaphor of weaving, there is the warp, but also the weft, right? The flying shuttle, the Katsky Chilnok. The tool designed to neatly and compactly uh, right, to throw back and forth 
through the shed between the yarns of the warp in order to weave um, in the weft, right? Um, so Rabochi organ Katskova Stanka, Prakladovishu Utichnu, Paperichnu Nit, Mesto Niti Miasnovi, Rivirabat Kanya. So here's my aside the missing shuttle, like the missing ball in the tennis game. It is interesting that Nishkovsky's metaphor of the bowstring and the bow, there's no arrow. And for Bradley, of course, there's also no one pulling the string. Um, Jessica earlier mentioned um, biography and theory and tension with each other. These two pieces in tension, right, seems to be what, what, what Shlovsky keeps coming back to. But what about the third? Um, isn't that what he's really interested in? I think of all the thirds in his, in his work, right? Creatia Fabrica, the third way. It is not perhaps unlike Eisenstein's notion of montage as conflict, of joining together two pieces of film that do not follow logically or chronologically, but that are in tension with one another, moving past each other, snavatsa, but always already, but always ready to come apart at the seams. So this is less Pushkin's forest, right? That unity of trees and mushrooms and grass, um, and more what, what Eisenstein imagined for sound film, with sound and the word contradicting the imagery, or in any case, existing in a complex relationship with it as a kind of third term. Zvuk, tam chisli e slova, dolžen kak bi pretivarišči izobraženju. Vo vsekam slučaju, slovo dolžen nakaditi s tem složnem odnošenju. This is the vertical montage segment. In sound film, the word enters into a relationship with the image, but that relationship is not straightforward. It requires negotiation. Vyesnjenja, odnošenje. Early sound film engineers used to speak of a marriage of sound to image, but Eisenstein and maybe Shklovsky are more on the side of Razvinchenia. Okay, but let's get back to Akaki Akakievich. В немом кино сделанном говорящими людьми увидали судьбу героя. Silent cinema made by talking people was mute. Perhaps it was also a bit deaf. Akaki Akakievich is but slipavat. Jean Pen Pen Penlev wrote that, quote, the cinema has always been sound cinema. Jean Mitri specified, on the other hand, that, quote, early, the early cinema was not mute, but quiet. To which Adorno and Eisler replied in advance, quote, the talking picture too is mute. Indeed, corrects Brisson, there never was a mute cinema. Besides, André Bazin noted, but not all silent films want to be such, and so on. Quote, I throw out these few citations out of context to be sure, writes Michelle Shion, to stir the waters of pat for formulas. To this, I'll toss in another stone of my own in stating that the silent cinema could really be called deaf cinema. This is Shion from Voice and Cinema. Or we might go to Eisenstein. Quote, how obvious it becomes that the material of the sound film is not dialogue. The true material of the sound film is, of course, the monologue. This is him uh, after a meeting with James Joyce in Paris. So a little like speaking on the telephone, especially if there's no one on the other end of the line. Ever since the invention of sound recording technology, writes Yoko Tawada in her essay, The Art of Being Non-Synchronous, it's, it's been just as easy to preserve the human voice as a manuscript. Not only can a voice be recorded and played back as often as desired, it can be copied out, cut, and edited as well. The voice is no longer something that must be produced on the spot from a living body. It's now become commonplace, one can say, for the owner of the voice not to be physically present when the voice is heard. Every voice from the outside resonates within our head, not before our eyes, she said. What is appealing about art is not achieving good synchronization. It is precisely through visible discrepancies that the voice gains its poetic independence. Shklovsky opens his book by trying to speak with ghosts, and he ends it by calling for the return of a non-existent ball, for trying to make good on the disappearance of a body that only art was able to capture and, and preserve for posterity. This is Antonioni's blow-up, translated as uvilichenia, but Shklovsky suggests a better title would be Krugnik One, which gets us back to the slow motion and magnifying glass with which we started. For Shklovsky, the telephone book ends with the same letter it had begun with. Indeed, we have not gone very far, alphabetically speaking. 
with A, but now the singular A of Antonioni. It is interesting that Antonioni's films are the endpoint of Swapsky's investigation of what I take to be all of world literature, all the way back to Gilgamesh. But perhaps it is precisely their stuttering, laconic, muttering inexpressibility that ties them back to Gogol's Akaki Akakievich and the, quote, the dark treasure trove between language and the audible, as Tawada has called it. In her essay on sound poetry and, musical, and the musical avant-garde, Nancy uh, Perloff concludes with Pievnikov and Kruchona. And Deleuze, at the end of his essay on stuttering, similarly abandons Melville and Kafka and Artaud in favor of Pievnikov, Biela, and Mandelstam. In other words, they all somehow get back to the Russian avant-garde. What he terms, quote, a Russian trinity thrice the stutterer and thrice crucified. Don't ask me, I have no, absolutely no idea what that means. <laughs> and he ends his essay, as I will also do here, with a quote from Andrei Biela's Poetik Litaev. Quote, the only thing the reader will see marching past him are inadequate means, fragments, illusions, strivings, investigations. Do not try to find a well-polished sentence or a perfectly coherent image in it. What is printed on the pages is an embarrassed word, a stuttering. Okay, but maybe after all, we should give Shlovsky the last word. Let's take it from his chapter titled, Darogov Budushe i Proshle, Neaponchine Raskas. Quote, I have lived a long life I have seen crowds, been on many roads, and I know what a wet overcoat smells like. Zhvodolga vidal tolpe darogi is now zapach na Thank you. All right, thank you. Thank you, Lilia. Please, Bradley. Uh, yeah, thank, thanks so much for this, Lydia. This was great. Um, I, I was curious about uh, this, the, the last chapter with Antonioni, as, as, as yeah. you're pointing to, and the, he calls that chapter, Nieskog Slova, uh, Anti Romania. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm wondering what you make of that. Obviously, that uh, had some uh, resonance with what I was thinking about for this. Um, but what, what you make of this, both ending on the idea of an Anti Raman, which he, he starts mm -hmm. with with Kafka. And that's actually the only thing he identifies in that section as an anti Raman. The rest are, uh, I mean, but then he spends most of the time on Antonioni, who he doesn't specifically call uh, an anti novelist or, or anything like this. But I'm, I'm wondering why, how, how you see the connection between uh, Antonioni and what he's doing there with him and this concept of anti Raman, yeah. you know, in this, in this book, like, which, as you say, is this sort of meditation on all of. Uh, narrative literature since Gilgamesh, uh, <laughs> and so uh, yeah, Western, I guess mostly. But yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So anyway, I, yeah. this Anti yeah. Raman and, and how that fits into what what you're thinking of um, with with Antonioni and and and, uh, and Akaki Akakievich as well. I think maybe. Yeah, I mean, literally, the only way I could make sense of sort of what the Antonioni is doing there, um, um, other other than historically that they must have just been showing Antonioni right in in in, in Russia um, in this in the right because I think that's what I mean Aksana will know but you know that it comes kind of in the late sixties um, uh, is is this 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 sort of absence that's in Antonioni right this this sort of that because he because Klovsky mentions specifically a couple of the films right in blow up but but before that he also talks about um, he talks about uh, which one. Yeah, um, the the one where where the last scene is is the, the lovers are supposed to meet but neither one comes and the camera um, just spends all of its time looking that at the empty that, that mean yeah 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 like please say right um uh right just looking for this kind of looking for nothing um or looking at nothing right like the the, the human beings are sort of absent um so there's so. I mean, what I keep thinking about this book is again, is this, there's a sort of missing piece, right? They're all, all, all or there are all these, they're, they're missing people, there's missing history, there's missing all these incomplete works. Um, and I think, it, and so I think Antonio is working sort of kind of, it's it's a similar affect. Um, for the Kafka, he also, Shklovsky also mentions before the law, right? That's for this is one of the specific examples that he uses, which is of course, again, about waiting and then having the door closed on you that was only open for you, but you never walked through. 
Um, so again, there's this, 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 and I think this gets, gets us back to the melancholy and the trauma that I think actually really part of this book, but clearly others don't agree, um, right? That there's this sort of, there's this, 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 this feeling of the loss of something, but it can't even articulate what that loss is. And yet you can't, right? And yet it's preventing clear and articulate speech. Um, and it leads to delirium and senility and yeah. So that's that's my so my feeling so, so that it's affect that right that what Antonio provides is this moment of of sort of uh, the, the the correct kind of affect for for the project. Yes, but then Antonio yeah. is the reason a dead body. Mm -hmm. It's just there is uh, a dead there body. actually exists a dead body. Sure, just that we cannot see it. But only art can see it, right? Only the only the photograph, only the, the photographer's but camera there. can can yeah. can capture it. Yeah. It doesn't matter. Yeah. I mean, that's, yeah, that's his whole point. Yeah. I think, like, um, I, I think he's playing like in in, in this chapter uh, section uh, with two terms, развязка и конец, which are not synonymous, right? And like, well, his discussion is precisely that. Well, look, there is no развязка, so we have things and they are combined together and they put together no in linear, but like, sort of, they don't amplify each other. Or they, they, don't, they don't take us anywhere. So that's one point, right? So in other words, like, sort of, there is no resolution period. Get comfortable. And sunny would it? No, but then to that, he adds also there is no ending. Mm -hmm. It's not only sort of the story is not culminating. Nothing's happening, <laughs> despite of that body, so the, the bird is eaten or whatever, why I wrote all, all those things. But that's sort of, I'm not going to finish it either. He starts, it's interesting, so the, the, the not, not the stuff, but the uh, um, epigraph. He jumped down the On the very scene. Спасибо тебе за все. Идем дальше, конца не будет. Just this kind of sort of constant again, constant, and that's why I sort of I think what Lydia was doing on Bookshop is so interesting because he has kind of this complete sort of confidence that you can't take it further precisely because Razvyaski can see uh, meaningless. Uh, yes, but in Bookshop, as far as I remember, I don't remember well, uh, Lydia should tell me that Piripisko was Ginsburg. Mm -hmm. That transition of Buchstab from formalism in Petrograd, Leningrad to Gachen and uh, Hegelianism, and how he starts adapting formalist uh, teaching mm -hmm. to uh, uh, to this idea of uh, yeah, there should be an end, there should be some kind of. This is very visible that he is, as far as I remember, that was so long I was read ago I was reading. I've How, also like read it some somewhat long ago. Um, I remember though that there are more letters from Ginsburg mm. to Buchstab than from Buchstab to Ginsburg. If I'm not but mistaken. there was a text in which I don't remember now. I can have a look. I just don't have. Yeah, yeah. yeah my, my my big thing is in your computer. There is nothing in it. Uh, but uh, um, <laughs> there, there was a text, there was a text in which you felt how he was kind of. Groping for a yeah. new language. Yeah, it was yeah. so. Yeah, groping for new language. Yeah. Like, like mm -hmm. yeah. uh, I, I'm sorry, I cannot say. I, no, I'm no, just I recollecting like, some kind of uh, yeah. foggy yeah. thing, but I, I think it was the there in that Piripiska. Mm -hmm. but, but he did the same in his. Um, I, I know him because of his work on children's literature and children's poetry. So he wrote on Mayakovsky and some others, like sort of like extensively, again, like demonstrating how basically you. Genre emerges like in the, in the 20s, right? And then Mayakovsky wasn't popular at all, like it failed actually. Mm -hmm. But yeah, but he is a book supplement that is like was trying to kind of, you know, put it together actually. He, he, I think he had it from the very beginning, sort of this attempt kind of, you know, to structure, to create a system. Sort of like Shakovsky, I think the interesting part about him is like there is a system within the system within the system, you know, like with Chinese balls, you know, mm -hmm. right? And for Bookstab, like it's not, no, it's, it's a map. Mm -hmm. And we can produce it or create it at least. In a nice way and kind of you know intelligible way. Intelligible. Mm -hmm. school, it's not the point. Mm -hmm. But all the generation, everybody who survived, they were all trying to put it together one way or another. Just uh, I think this is what Ilya meant when he said, uh, what, what was the term about this case? Yeah. yeah. That's trying to put things together, those things that all kind of spiral out. Trying to, you know. Well, but they did that after the First World War. Like, remember, I think, like this whole point about Siplenia. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. Siplenia. Yeah. Just, yeah. Just. Uh, I was going to throw out there 
you know, I constantly feel like all these talks, I'm like, this is exactly what I was trying to puzzle through and um, <laughs> like we're all groping for something. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, but um, one thing that I, so this idea that he's sort of putting two things together, but there's no kind of third. Yeah. This is something that I also kind yeah. of mm-hmm. latched onto as a, a theme. But I was wondering in terms of, this may be unconnected. To me, it's connected, but she may just have to have it. Um, I noticed, like, in terms of trying to find new language, he cites a number of times um, Albert Einstein's mm, yeah. diary, um, yeah. his diary notes, sort of notes from various places where he makes use a number of times of the statement that um, the thought may be, or he thinks thought is sort of unconnected to language, right? Or mm-hmm. trees coming out of it in some sense of the monkey thought that maybe there's some like that sort of seems yeah. like kind of thematically maybe connected to what you're talking about some sort of yeah I think so I I, I I didn't I didn't puzzle through the the like the the Einstein didn't quite make sense to me and I didn't then I didn't pop you know pause long enough to figure it out um but yeah but but I do think there there is something I mean this is why this, so, so so I went to montage right because that's that's language I know well better right but but this idea that sound adds this vertical montage, and then um, Yulia had been talking about echo, and the idea mm-hmm. of kind of echolocation and depth, and again you're adding sound. Now it's going into depth rather than right. We somehow imagine sound. We somehow have vertical going up, but why not going down, right? So but but it adds this third dimension, right? To mm-hmm. to to every so so again you've got these two things that seem to be coming, you know, kind of. On, you know on a blow space right uh, you know they're kind of together but you need a you need a third to go through them mm-hmm. in some other direction um yeah. that's i think how, how my brain was thinking of it yeah um yes later in the day my life has to be even more fragmented but um yeah i mean she mostly talks about threes in this book right in, yeah in folk tales you need three you need three you yeah need three and right. so where is the third right um <laughs> yeah so i don't know but i since nobody's talked about it yet i wonder if you could talk about the, the zakuchenya and the new images he gives us there yeah he gives us the um crest of the Leningrad, which i had never known had like these two anchors one of which has three uh, little hooks at the bottom, and one of which just has two. Mm-hmm. So there is a three there, right? Um, <laughs> you know, uh, yeah. did you? Uh, did you okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, for me, it's page 305, but uh-huh. I have the other page that I don't uh-huh. know. But it's the very, very end. Um, uh-huh. <laughs> but I'm more just wondering posing to anyone like what do we make of this symbol he, he says I wish I could have been printed in this old uh, Alda um mm-hmm. you know this like yeah. ancient press because I mm-hmm. really like that image well first of all because he had these books which swam away and books to him like ports or like libraries and he makes he develops all of these interesting metaphors at the end and then he talks about how he likes the symbol of the anchor around which there's a dolphin mm-hmm. so there you have the spiral that's that you know, was talking about mm-hmm. and he says mm-hmm. symbol krepusti nadezhdi i astanovki delfinne dzvizhenye vistyovas pristrata so you know i did look up that mm-hmm. the symbol on you know googling the image of that pre- press and you have this dolphin mm-hmm. you know wound around a, mm-hmm. an anchor um and the anchor of course looked yeah. like the titiva you know in shape Mm-hmm. So, but then right. instead of the string, you have the dolphin run around. So, uh-huh. I don't know what can they do this. Um, but more connected to your talk, I also mm-hmm. would, I just really want, I want to say I love the opening about the telephone and how you connected, you know, connected to Proust and, yeah. you know, death, but then also to electricity and talk and talk, mm-hmm. you know, it was just, it was brilliant. Um, and then when you got to Akakia Kakievich, Hiding in plain sight and Shkolsky hiding in plain sight. Um, I did wonder, I, th- I think it makes a lot of sense. But on the other hand, and you said the new overcoat makes him visible. Is there really a self to Akaki Akakievich, Akaki Akakievich that could become visible before the overcoat? You know, doesn't the overcoat make him somehow into this person with a will, with desire, which is dangerous, but before, like, 
he's imitating things he's stuttering yeah. he can't say things right but does he actually have something to express or is he just you know, right right so well, I wondered if that worked. Yeah. Well, if, if he says it's unstructured enough. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Right. 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 That's funny. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, and then there's that. So, and there's that, that that moment also where they ask him to copy something where he has to change the um the I think it's the the, the third person to the first person, yeah. right? He can't do it, right? Yeah. He can't. He can't actually make the substitution. Like they all almost promote. We're going to promote him, but then he yeah. can't. Let me go back to copying. Yeah. Um. Yeah. No. I mean, I I think I was trying. I, again slightly right out of time but i was trying to find that moment in the at least my memory of of, of shenan is that there's a moment where, where he puts on the overcoat right and suddenly and so, the new overcoat right and, so, and suddenly everyone is paying attention to him right and suddenly like all of the things you know so not only does he not pay attention to the world but the world also doesn't pay attention to him until he gets the, the new overcoat and then suddenly he right he gets invited to a party he mm -hmm. right he's you know everybody's looking it runs to the hallway to look at the new overcoat right and then of course you know then he's Anyway, mm -hmm. um, and then he becomes the ghost. Um, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, is there a self in there? I don't, I don't know. Hard to say. Yeah. Um, uh, but you know, because he's all absence, right? He's 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 he's, a, he's constantly described in all the 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 you know, right? Um, uh, he's 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 never he's never quite there. But but something right, but but but. But but something may, puts him in the in the field of visibility, um, and then uh, yeah. I have a Maybe talk prepared for that, but it's for tomorrow. Yeah, but it's for tomorrow. <laughs> right. so we, 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 won't, we won't go we won't go too far in it. But I like the yuck and video mention, and and I would say of course we can all we can probably also play around with this notion of the. Um, not only the, the not only the Schlossy want you know back to the present, past, and future, right? He wants to be published by a press that stopped publishing five hundred years ago. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. But probably also the idea of an anchor itself, right? And anchoring something um, that, that so that you don't, right? It's, it's anti movement. It's anti movement. Yeah. yeah. He says, see, yeah. the yakarya, yeah. not yet, yeah. but like I never yeah. associated folk with yeah. anchors. With so anchors. So, yeah. so, so this is. Said, it it so, down. so this yeah. is uh, yeah. kind of an old school inter intertextual person would say this is a quote from Baratinsky's poem Karaskaf, which is a poem about how he travels to Italy. Um, uh, uh, kind of wants to see it, and then when he comes to Italy, then he actually dies. So this is about meeting death. And one of the things, a beautiful poem. One of the things that that it says is, "Много мятежных решил я вопросов, прежде чем руки марсельских матросов подняли якорь надежды символ." And this is an emblematic. There is an emblematic tradition behind it, but there is this like this this classic poem, which is about Italy, right? Going to Italy, which is where Shklovsky is going with this. A fantasy about about a, a publishing house and all, and of course, so this there is this a very similar setup. But I think also he was yep. in Italy, close to himself. Yeah, um, uh, in those in those years that he had been around the wedding in the seventies. Yeah, yeah. Universe, universe. So tired. I'm sorry. Um. On the inter intertextual note, if we're doing like we're boring all intertextual, <laughs> this is Stare Telephonic Nishki Manaludi Katur Mujani Zapazavani. Does yeah. that remind you of Mandel? Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 Yep. And but there's a, but I was also, uh, yeah. 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 I, 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 I was also exactly. thinking of Schwartz and his Telephonic mm -hmm. Nida. Yeah. Yeah. Which, but, something, yeah. but his. Yeah. Yeah. Not, no. yeah. No. And yes, when poem was, was, was not publishable for the most for the most in terms, yeah. of, in terms of kind of yeah. death and yeah. and trauma, if you really want mm -hmm. to talk about trauma, yeah. then yeah. You know, yeah. the fact yeah. that it reminds yeah. you of Mandush. Yeah. Yeah. But what I wanted to say is bringing us back to my talk. I'm sorry. Yeah. 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 Like what I wanted to say is, <laughs> can't we accept the fact that yes Akaki Akakovich does not have subjectivity and doesn't have there there but this is where Shklovsky begins right so he begins with I'm old and I'm stuttering and I'm dying and then he moves but there is some kind of move that occurs right where I'm old is said in a different way it's already this I'm old as a light out which mm -hmm. is an understatement and my stuttering is 
purposeful and is and there is a function there right so it seems to me that something occurs there right within the book where he moves he makes this kind of move of turning a minus into a plus mm -hmm. you, you know what, you know what i mean like somehow he turns this minus of being old into a plus which is what i try to do with this impotentiality yeah. right by yeah. saying like i cannot not wear hats yeah i can not wear you know hats. Right. this it suddenly turns into a positive and that and that's when it already becomes a kind of like assertion of one's subjecthood mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. yeah in, in 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 connection with this so 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 the lack of the word silence uh he clearly in the very finale right uh, says that the, the not saying is the form of amplification. Yes. Right. Yeah, says, yeah, что время yeah, тогда yeah, я говорил, yeah, будто искусство yeah. не имеет никакого содержания, что оно не эмоционально, а сам писал такие кровоточащие книги, <laughs> как сентиментальное путешествие отца. Книга отца потому и названа письмами не о любви, что была книга о любви. Любовь не выражена самыми различными досказаниями и так далее. Yeah, yeah. So, so the lack of the word is not necessarily the, yeah. the, the, the lack of, of the statement, so to speak. Yeah, I, I mean, I, it, it, and I was also trying to do something with this. With the, this, He's got a metaphor of the projector as well, a uh, projector which illuminates something, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but again, not everything can be said all at once. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, that whole thing about all of those erotic riddles, too. Right? Yeah. The ending, if you don't say it, the real ending. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. Yeah. And he grabbed her by the right. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah then. Yeah, exactly. Well, tell me, do I read too much into that? I'm thinking about this um, um, anchors with two and three. Um, let's see, what's the yeah. word in English? I don't see, know. Whatever it is. Right. But in the book, there are only two persons who are named by. Their names, um, um chapters, uh, Yuri Tanyanov, the um, a yeah. second bomb, all the others are in conjunction with something or not. So, like those two, Zubtsi, not Bazubtsa, yeah. he's the third one, right? right? Yeah. And so, in Jakobson, he is kind of you know, spectacularly <laughs> loops, loops in the, in this translation. Not that we believe this translation, but right, loops, yeah. that's what I got for you. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, so this uh, yeah. anchor is that kind of sustained him, right? And yeah, yeah, together, together in way, one way or another, so right. The two sums so three sums. Yeah. Looks. Looks. Well, yeah, and, and I and, and another another thing I was well, let's talk about all the things that could be that I didn't put in the paper and I didn't think through, but um, but only Anna, but the Anna is not there, and then and then he starts off talking about Plato and 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 the fact that there are no women in the text, and then immediately goes to a woman. Mm -hmm. Um, the, the the as always the gender stuff in Shlovsky is super weird. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so the the two sums, three sums, and the dolphin and the I this is senility. Yeah. Huh? Yes, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> proud that he was just mentally disabled to his whole life. So that, that's what I <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Any other questions or frivolous comments? <laughs> <laughs> if you don't have any, so let's stop it here today and head to the restaurant. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you.